Section one of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Preface The present work, though written upon strictly vegetarian principles, is by no means addressed to vegetarians only on the contrary we hope that the following pages of recipes will be read by that enormous class throughout the country who during the last few years have been gradually changing their mode of living by eating far less meat and taking vegetables and farinaceous food as a substitute where there are thousands who are vegetarians from choice there are tens of thousands who are virtually vegetarians from necessity again there is another large class who from time to time adopt a vegetarian course of diet on the ground of health and as a means of escaping from the pains attendant on gout liver complaint or dyspepsia the class we most wish to reach however is that one increasing we fear whose whole life is one continual struggle not merely to live but to live decently it may seem a strong statement but we believe it to be a true one that only those who have tried a strictly vegetarian course of diet know what real economy means should the present work be the means of enabling even one family to become not only better in health but richer in pocket it will not have been written in vain a g Payne. end of section one Section 2 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Introduction. We wish it to be distinctly understood at starting that the present work is purely a cookery book written on the principles generally adopted by vegetarians and as until quite recently there seemed to be in the minds of many some doubt as to the definition of vegetarianism we will quote the following explanation from the head of the report of the london vegetarian society the aims of the london vegetarian society are to advocate the total disuse of the flesh of animals fish flesh and fowl as food and to promote a more extensive use of pulse grains fruits nuts and other products of the vegetable kingdom thus propagating a principle tending essentially to true civilization to universal humaneness and to the increase of happiness generally we have no intention of writing a treatise on vegetarianism but we consider a few words of explanation necessary years back many persons were under the impression that by vegetarianism was meant simply an abstention from flesh meat but that fish was allowed such however is not the case according to the rules of most of the vegetarian societies of the day on the other hand strictly speaking real vegetarians would not be allowed the use of eggs and milk but it appears that many use these though there are a considerable number of persons who abstain there is no doubt that the vegetable kingdom without either milk or eggs contains every requisite for the support of the human body in speaking on the subject sir henry thompson observes the vegetable kingdom comprehends the cereals legumes roots starches sugar herbs and fruits persons who style themselves vegetarians often consume milk eggs butter and lard which are choice foods from the animal kingdom there are other persons of course who are strictly vegetarian eaters and such alone have any right to the title of vegetarians in the following pages will be found ample recipes for the benefit of parties who take either view in questions of this kind there will always be found conflicting views we have no wish or desire to give opinions but consider it would be more advisable and probably render the book far more useful if we confine ourselves as much as possible to facts the origin of vegetarianism is as old as the history of the world itself and probably from time immemorial there have been sects which have practised vegetarianism 
either as a religious duty or under the belief that they would render the body more capable of performing religious duties in the year one thousand ninety eight or two years prior to the date of henry i there was a strictly vegetarian society formed in connection with the christian church which lived entirely on herbs and roots and the society has lasted to the present day again there have been many sects who not so strict have allowed themselves the use of fish again there are those who adopt a vegetarian course of diet on the ground of health many maintain that diseases like gout and dyspepsia would disappear were vegetarian diets strictly adhered to on the other hand we have physicians who maintain that the great cause of indigestion is not eating enough an american physician some years ago alleged he had discovered the cause his argument being that the more work the stomach had to do the stronger it would become on the same principle that the arm of a blacksmith is more powerful in consequence of hard work of one thing we are certain and that is there will always be rival physicians and rival sects but the present work will simply be a guide to those who require from whatever cause a light form of diet perhaps the greatest benefit vegetarians can do their cause and there are many who think very strongly on the subject is to endeavor to take a dispassionate view rome was not built in a day and if we look back at the past history of this country during the last half century in regard to food we shall see that there have been many natural changes at work waves of thought take place backwards and forwards but still the tide may flow some fifty years ago there was undoubtedly a strong impression with a large number of right-minded people that plenty of meat beer and wine were good for all even for young children the medical profession was very apt to run in flocks and follow some well-known leader at the period to which we refer numbers of anxious mothers would have regarded the advice to bring up their children as vegetarians and teetotalers as positive cruelty this old-fashioned idea has passed away one great motive for adopting a course of vegetarian diet is economy and here we feel that we stand on firm ground without danger of offending sincere opinions which are often wrongly called prejudices to a great extent the majority of the human race are virtually vegetarians from necessity nor do we find feebleness either of mind or body necessarily ensues we believe there are tens of thousands of families who would give vegetarianism a trial were it not for fear persons are too apt to think that bodily strength depends upon the nature of the food we eat in india we have a feeble race living chiefly on rice on the other hand in china for bodily strength few can compare with the coolies for many years in scotland the majority lived on oatmeal while in ireland they lived on potatoes we do not wish to argue anything from these points but to bring them forward for consideration probably strength of body and mind as a general rule depends upon breed and this argument tells two ways it does not follow that vegetarians will be necessarily strong and will cease to be cruel nor does it follow that those who have been accustomed all their lives to eat meat will cease to be strong should they become vegetarians as we have said the great motive that induces many to give vegetarianism a trial is economy and if persons would once get rid of the idea that they risk their health by making a trial much would be done to advance the cause another great reason for persons hesitating to make a trial is the revolution it would create in their households here again we are beset by difficulties and these difficulties can only disappear gradually after long years of patience we believe the progress towards vegetarianism must of necessity be a very slow one no large west end tradesman could possibly insist upon his whole establishment becoming vegetarians because he becomes one himself we believe and hope that the present work will benefit those who are undergoing a slow but gradual change in their mode of living this is easiest in small households where no servants are kept at all where the mistress is both cook and mother it is in such households that the change is possible and very often most desirable in many cases trial will be made gradually the great difficulty to contend with is prejudice 
or rather we may say habit there are many housekeepers who feel that their bill of fare would instantly become extremely limited were they to adopt vegetarian ideas there are few better dinners especially for children than a good basin of soup with plenty of bread yet as a rule there are few housekeepers who would know how to make vegetarian soup at all in our present work we have given a list of sixty-four soups at any rate here is no lack of variety as small housekeepers in this country are not famed for their knowledge of soup making even with gravy beef at their disposal on looking down at this list it will be observed that in many cases cream or at any rate milk is recommended we can well imagine the housekeeper exclaiming i don't call this economy this is one point about which we consider a few words of explanation necessary we will suppose a family of eight who have been accustomed to live in the ordinary way are going to have a vegetarian dinner by way of trial some soup has to be made and one or two vegetables from the garden or the green grocers as the case may be are going to be cooked on a new method and the housekeeper is horrified at the amount of butter she finds recommended for the sauce people must however bear in mind that changes are gradual and that often at first starting a degree of richness or what they would consider extravagance is advisable if they wish to reconcile others to the change in our dinner of eight we would first ask them how much meat would they have allowed ahead at the very lowest computation it could not have been done decently under a quarter of a pound each even if the dish of meat took the economical form of an irish stew and had a joint such as a leg of mutton been placed upon the table it would probably have been considerably more than double supposing however instead of the meat we have three vegetables say haricot beans potatoes and a cabbage with the assistance of some really good butter sauce these vegetables eaten with bread make an agreeable meal which especially in hot weather would probably be a pleasant change supposing for the sake of argument you use a half pound of butter in making the butter sauce this sounds to ordinary cooks very extravagant even supposing butter to be only one shilling per pound suppose however this half a pound of butter is used as a means of going without a leg of mutton that is the chief point to be borne in mind in a variety of recipes to follow the cream butter and eggs are often recommended in what will appear as wholesale quantities but as a set-off against this you have no butcher's bill at all we do not maintain that this apparently unlimited use of butter eggs and occasionally cream is necessary but we believe that there are many families who will be only able to make the change by substituting nice dishes at any rate at first starting to make up for the loss of meat it is only by substituting a pleasant kind of food that many will be induced even to attempt to change gradually the living will become cheaper and cheaper but it is unwise to attempt in a family to do too much at once there are many soups we have given in which cream is recommended for instance artichoke soup bean soup cauliflower soup and celery soup after partaking of a well-made basin of one of these soups followed by one or two vegetables and a fruit pie or stewed fruit there are many persons who would voluntarily remark i don't seem to care for any meat on the other hand were the vegetables served in the old-fashioned way but without any meat there are many who would feel that they were undergoing a species of privation even if they did not say so we refer to a dish of plain boiled potatoes and dry bread or even the ordinary cabbage served in the usual way supposing however a nice little new cabbage is sent to table with plenty of really good white sauce or butter sauce over which has been sprinkled a little bright green parsley while some crisp fried bread surrounds the dish the cabbage is converted into a meal and if we take into account the absence of the meat we still save enormously the advice we would give especially to young housekeepers is persuasion is better than force if you wish to teach a child to swim it is far easier to entice him into shallow water on a hot summer's day than to throw him in against his will in winter time another point which we consider of great importance is appearances as far as possible we should endeavor 
to make the dishes look pretty we are appealing to a very large class throughout the country who at all cost wish to keep up appearances it is an important class and one on which the slow but gradual march of civilization depends we fear that any attempt to improve the extreme poor who live surrounded by dirt and misery would be hopeless unless they still have some lingering feeling of this self-respect for the poor woman who snatches a meal off bread and dripping which she eats without a tablecloth and then repairs to the gin shop to wash it down nothing can be done this class will gradually die out as civilization advances this is seen even in the present day in america fortunately there is plenty of scope in vegetarian cooking not merely for refinement but even elegance do not despise the sprinkle of chopped parsley and red specks of bread crumbs colored with cochineal so often referred to throughout the following pages remember that the cost of these little accessories to comfort is virtually nil we must remember also that one sense works upon another we can please the palate through the eye there is some undoubted connection between these senses if you doubt it suck a lemon in front of a german band and watch the result the sight of meat causes the saliva to run from the mouths of the carnivorous animals at the zoo this is often noticeable in the case of a dog watching people eat and it is an old saying it makes one's mouth water to look at it in the case of endeavoring to induce a change of living in grown-up persons such as husband or children there is perhaps no method we can pursue so efficacious as that of making dishes look pretty a dish of bright red tomatoes reposing on the white bosom of a bed of macaroni relieved here and there by a few specks of green what a difference to a similar dish all mashed up together and in which the macaroni showed signs of dirty smears we have endeavored throughout this book to give chiefly directions about those dishes which will replace meat for instance the vast majority of pies and puddings will remain the same and need no detailed treatment here butter supplies the place of suet or lard and any ordinary cookery book will be found sufficient for the purpose but it is in dealing with soups sauces rice macaroni and vegetables sent to table under new conditions that we hope this book will be found most useful as a rule english women cooks especially when their title to the name depends upon their being the mistress of the house will often find that soups and sauces are a weak point do not despise in cooking little things those who really understand such matters will know how vast is the difference in flavor occasioned by the addition of that pinch of thyme or teaspoonful of savory herbs and yet there are tens of thousands of houses where meat is eaten every day who never had a bottle of thyme at their disposal in their lives as we have said if we are going to make a great saving on meat we can well afford a few trifles so long as they are trifles a sixpenny bottle of thyme will last for months and if we give up our gravy beef or piece of pickled pork or two penny worth of bones as the case may be surely we can afford a little indulgence of this kind a few words on the subject of fritters when will english housekeepers grasp the idea of frying they cannot get beyond a dab of grease or butter in a frying pan the bath of boiling oil seems to be beyond them or at any rate a degree of civilization that is not yet passed beyond the limit of the fried fish shop the oil will do over and over again and in the end is undoubtedly cheaper than the dab of grease or butter thrown away there are hundreds of men who in hot weather would positively prefer a well-cooked vegetable fritter to meat but yet they rarely get it at home fruit fritters are also very economical orange fritters apple fritters etc because the batter helps to make the dish a meal those who have practiced vegetarianism for many years will probably be of opinion that we have not called sufficient attention to the subject of fruit and nuts this is not because we do not believe in their usefulness but because we think that those who are changing their mode of living will be far better enabled to do so without discomfort by making their chief alterations in diet in the directions we have pointed out there is moreover little or no cookery involved in these articles of the wholesomeness of fresh fruit all are agreed and as people become more advanced vegetarians the desire for fruit and nuts 
will follow in due course in future years as the demand increases the supply will increase but this is a question of time lookers-on often see more of the game than the players it is not because the sudden change might not be beneficial but because sudden changes are only likely to be effected in rare instances that we have taken the view we have prejudice is strong and it would be very difficult to persuade persons unless they had been gradually brought to the change to regard nuts in the light of food to suggest a meal off brazil nuts would to many have a tendency to put vegetarianism in a ridiculous light and nothing kills so readily as ridicule in conclusion it will be observed that from time to time we have used the expression if wine be allowed there is no necessary connection between vegetarianism and teetotalism but it would be an affectation to deny the fact that they are generally connected of the numerous arguments brought forward by the advocates of vegetarianism one is that in the opinion of many who speak with authority a vegetarian diet is best adapted to those of whom unfortunately there are many who from time to time have a craving for more stimulant than is beneficial to their health many medical men are of the opinion that large meat eaters require alcoholic stimulant and that they can give up the latter more easily by abstaining from the former this is a question for medical men to decide as it does not properly come into the province of the cook we have repeatedly mentioned the addition of wine and liqueurs but when these are used for flavoring purposes it is not to be regarded in the same light as if taken alone there is a common sense in these matters which should never be overlooked the teetotaler who attended the lord mayor's dinner and refused his glass of punch with his turtle soup would be consistent but to refuse the turtle soup itself on the ground that a little wine probably madeira might have been added would proclaim him to be a faddist it is to be regretted that in the present day so many good causes have been injured by this ostentation of carrying ideas to an extreme practically where wine is used in cookery it is added solely for the peculiar flavor and the alcohol itself is evaporated to be consistent the vast majority of teetotal drinks and possibly even stewed fruit itself would have to be refused on the same ground viz an almost infinitely small trace of alcohol we think it best to explain the reason we have introduced the expression if wine be allowed in each case it is used for flavoring and flavoring purposes only we know that with some persons a very small amount of stimulant creates a desire for more and when this is the case the small quantity should be avoided but in the case of the quantity being so infinitely small that it ceases to have this effect even if not boiled away as it really is no harm can possibly arise where wine is added to soups and sauces and exposed to heat this would be the case on the other hand in the case of tipsy cake and wine added to compote of fruit this would probably not be the case a great distinction should be drawn between such cases it will be found however that in every case we have mentioned the addition is altogether optional or a substitute like lemon juice can be used in its place end of section two section three of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Vegetarian Cookery, Chapter 1, Soups, General Instructions. There are very few persons, unless they have made vegetarian cookery a study, who are aware what a great variety of soups can be made without the use of meat or fish. Ordinary cookery books have the one exception of what is called soup maigre in england it seems to be the impression that the goodness of the soup depends upon the amount of nourishment that can be compressed into a small space it is however a great mistake to think that because we take a large amount of nourishment we are necessarily nourished there is a limit though what that limit is no one can say beyond which soup becomes absolutely injurious a quarter of a pound of Liebig's 
extract of meat dissolved in half a pint of water is obviously an overdose of what is considered nourishment in france as a rule soup is prepared on an altogether different idea it is a light thin broth taken at the commencement of the meal to strengthen the stomach in order to render it capable of receiving more substantial food to follow vegetarian soups are of course to be considered from this latter point of view we think these few preliminary observations necessary as we have to overcome a very strong english prejudice which is too apt to despise everything of which the remark can be made ah but there is very little nourishment in it vegetarian soups as a rule and especially the thin ones must be regarded as a light and pleasant flavoring which with a small piece of white bread enables the most obstinately delicate stomach to commence a repast that experience has found best adapted to its requirements the basis of all soup is stock and in making stock we of course have to depend upon vegetables fruit or some kind of farinaceous food to a certain extent the water in which any kind of vegetable has been boiled may be regarded as stock especially water that has boiled roots such as potatoes or grain such as rice it will not however be necessary to enter into any general description as to the best method of obtaining nutriment in a liquid form from vegetables and grain as directions will be given in each recipe but a few words are necessary on the general subject of flavoring stock in making ordinary soup we are very much dependent for flavor if the soup be good on the meat the vegetables acting only as accessories in making stock for vegetarian soups we are chiefly dependent for flavor on the vegetables themselves and consequently great care must be taken that these flavorings are properly blended the great difficulty in giving directions in cookery books and in understanding them when given is the insuperable one of avoiding vague expressions for instance suppose we read take two onions one carrot one turnip and one head of celery what does this mean it will be found practically that these directions vary considerably according to the neighborhood or part of the country in which we live for instance so much depends upon where we take our head of celery from suppose we bought our head of celery in bond street or the central arcade in covent garden market on the one hand or off a barrow in the mile end road on the other again onions vary so much in size that we cannot draw any hard and fast line between a little pickling onion no bigger than a marble and a spanish onion as big as a baby's head it would be possible to be very precise and say take so many ounces of celery or so many pounds of carrot but practically we cannot turn the kitchen into a chemist's shop cooks whether told to use celery in heads or ounces would act on guesswork just the same what are absolutely essential are two things common sense and experience again practically we must avoid giving too many ingredients novices in the art of cooking are of course unable to distinguish between those vegetables that are absolutely essential and those added to give a slight extra flavor but which make very little difference to the soup whether they are added or not we are often directed to add a few leaves of tarragon or chervil or a handful of sorrel of course in a large kitchen presided over by a francatelli these are easily obtainable but in ordinary private houses and in most parts of the country they are not only unobtainable but have never even been heard of at the green grocer's shop in making soups as a rule the four vegetables essential are onion celery carrot and turnip and we place them in their order of merit in making vegetarian soup it is very important that we should learn how to blend these without making any one flavor too predominant this can only be learned by experience if we have too much onion the soup tastes rank too much celery will make it bitter too much carrot often renders the soup sweet and the turnip overpowers every other flavor again these vegetables vary so much in strength 
that were we to peel and weigh them the result would not be uniform in addition to the fact that not one cook in a thousand would take the trouble to do it perhaps the most dangerous vegetable with which we have to deal is turnip these vary so much in strength that sometimes even one slice of turnip will be found too strong in flavoring soups with these vegetables the first care should be to see that they are thoroughly cleansed in using celery too much of the green part should be avoided if you wish to make first-rate soup in using the onions if they are old and strong the core can be removed in using carrot if you are going to have any soup where vegetables will be cut up and served in the soup you should always peel off the outside red part of the carrot and reserve it for this purpose and only use the inside or yellow part for flavoring purposes if is going to be thrown away or to lose its identity by being rubbed through a wire sieve with other vegetables with regard to turnip we can only add one word of caution not too much we may here mention before leaving the subject of ingredients that leeks and garlic are a substitute for onion and can also be used in conjunction with it as a rule in vegetarian cookery clear soups are rare and of course from an economical point of view they are not to be compared with thick soups some persons in making stock recommend what is termed bran tea half a pint of bran is boiled in about three pints of water and a certain amount of nutriment can be extracted from the bran which also imparts color for the purpose of coloring clear soups however there is nothing in the world to compare with what french cooks call caramel caramel is really burnt sugar there is a considerable art in preparing it as it is necessary that it should impart color and color only when prepared in the rough and ready manner of burning sugar in a spoon as is too often practiced in english kitchens this desideratum is never attained as you are bound to impart sweetness in addition to a burnt flavor the simplest and by far the most economical method of using caramel is to buy it ready-made it is sold by all grocers under the name of parisian essence a small bottle costing about eight pence will last a year and saves an infinite loss of time trouble and temper by far the most economical soups are the thick where all the ingredients can be rubbed through a wire sieve thick soups can be divided into two classes ordinary brown soup and white soup the ordinary brown is the most economical as in white soups milk is essential and if the soup is wished to be very good it is necessary to add a little cream soups owe their thickness to two processes we can thicken the soup by adding flour of various kinds such as ordinary flour corn flour etc and soup can also be thickened by having some of the ingredients of which it is composed rubbed through a sieve this class of soups may be called purees for instance palestine soup is really a puree of jerusalem artichokes ordinary pea soup is a puree of split peas in making our ordinary vegetarian soups of all kinds as a rule all the ingredients should be rubbed through a sieve the economy of this is obvious on the face of it in the case of thickening soup by means of some kinds of flour for richness and flavor there is nothing to equal ordinary flour that has been cooked this is what frenchmen call roux as white and brown roux are the very backbone of vegetarian cookery a few words of explanation may not be out of place on referring to the recipe for making white and brown roux it will be seen that it is simply flour cooked by means of frying it in butter in white roux each grain of flour is cooked till it is done in brown roux each grain of flour is cooked till it is done brown we cannot exaggerate the importance of getting cooks to see the enormous difference between thickening soups or gravy with white or brown roux and simply thickening them with plain butter and flour the taste of the soup in the two cases is altogether different the difference is this suppose you have just been making some pastry some good rich puff paste you have got two pies and as you probably know this pastry is simply butter and flour 
place one pie in the oven and bake it till it is a nice rich brown now taste the pie crust it is probably delicious now taste the piece of the pie that has not been baked at all it is nauseous the difference is one is butter and flour that has been cooked the other is butter and flour that has not been cooked one word of warning in conclusion cooks should always remember the good old saying that it is quite possible to have too much of a good thing they should be particularly warned to bear this in mind in adding herbs such as ordinary mixed flavoring herbs or as they are sometimes called savory herbs and thyme this is also very important if wine is added to soup though as a rule vegetarians rarely use wine in cooking but the same principle applies to the substitute for wine viz lemon juice it is equally important to bear this in mind in using white and brown roux if we make the soup too thick we spoil it and it is necessary to add water to bring it to its proper consistency which of course diminishes the flavor the proper consistency of any soup thickened with roux should be that of ordinary cream beyond this point the cooked flour will overpower almost every other flavor and the great beauty of vegetarian cookery is its simplicity it appeals to a taste that is refined and natural and not to one that has been depraved end of section three section four of castles vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlotte Paris. Castle's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 1. Soups. Recipes. Part 1. Stock. Strictly speaking, in vegetarian cookery, stock is the goodness and flavoring that can be extracted from vegetables, the chief ones being onion, celery, carrot, and turnip. In order to make stock, take these vegetables, cut them up into small pieces after having thoroughly cleansed them, place them in a saucepan with sufficient water to cover them, and let them boil gently for several hours. The liquor, when strained off, may be called stock. It can be flavored with a small quantity of savory herbs, pepper and salt, as well as a little mushroom ketchup. It can be colored with a few drops of Parisian essence or burnt sugar. Its consistency can be improved by the addition of a small quantity of corn flour. Sufficient corn flour must be added not to make it thick, but like very thin gum. In a broader sense, the water in which rice, lentils, beans and potatoes have been boiled may be called stock. Again, the water in which macaroni, vermicelli, spaghetti and all kinds of Italian paste has been boiled may be called stock. The use of liquors of this kind must be left to the common sense of the cook, as, of course, it would only be obtainable when these materials are required for use. Brown and white thickening, or roux. It is of great importance for vegetarians always to have on hand a fairly good stock of white and brown roux, as it is a great saving both of time and money. As roux will keep good for weeks and even months, there is no fear of waste in making a quantity at a time. Take a pound of flour with a spoonful or two over. See that it is thoroughly dry and then sift it. Next, take a pound of butter and squeeze it in a cloth so as as much as possible to extract all the moisture from it. Next, take a stew pan, and an enameled one is best, and melt the butter till it runs to oil. It will now be found that, although the bulk of the butter looks like oil, a certain amount of froth will rise to the top. This must be carefully skimmed off. Continue to expose the butter to a gentle heat till the scum ceases to rise. Now, pour off the oiled butter very gently into a basin till you come to some dregs. These should be thrown away, or at any rate, not used in making the roux. Now mix the pound of dried and sifted flour with the oiled butter, which is what the French cooks call clarified butter. Place it back in the stew pan. Put the stew pan over tolerably good fire, but not too fierce, 
as there is a danger of its burning. With a wooden spoon, keep stirring this mixture and keep scraping the bottom of the stew pan, first in one place and then in another, being specially careful on the edges to prevent its burning. Gradually, the mixture will begin to turn color. As soon as this turn of color is perceptible, take out half and put it in a basin. This is the white roux, namely, flour cooked in butter, but not discolored beyond a very trifling amount. Keep the stew pan on the fire and go on stirring the remainder, which will get gradually darker and darker in color. As soon as the color is that of light chocolate, remove the stew pan from the fire altogether, but still continue scraping and stirring for a few minutes longer, as the animal retains the heat to such an extent that it will sometimes burn after it has been removed from the fire. It is important not to have the mixture too dark, and it will be found by experience that it gets darker after the stew pan has been removed from the fire. When we say light chocolate, we refer to the color of a cake of chocolate that has been broken. The inside is the color, not the outside. It is advisable sometimes to have by you ready a large slice of onion, and if you think it is dark enough, you can throw this in and immediately by this means slacken the heat. Pour the brown roux into a separate basin and put them by for use. In the houses of most vegetarians, more white roux will be used than brown. Consequently, more than half should be removed if this is the case when the roux first commences to turn color. When the brown roux gets cold, it has all the appearance of chocolate. And when you use it, it is best to scrape off the quantity you require with a spoon and not add it to soups or sauces in one lump. Almond soup. Take half a pound of sweet almonds and blanch them. That is, throw them into boiling water till the outside skin can be rubbed off easily with the finger. Then immediately throw the white almonds into cold water, otherwise they will quickly lose their white color like potatoes that have been peeled. Next, slice up an onion and half a small head of celery, and let these simmer gently in a quart of milk. In the meantime, pound the almonds with four hard-boiled yolks of egg, strain off the milk, and add the pounded almonds and egg to the milk gradually, and let it boil over the fire. Add sufficient white roux till the soup becomes of the consistency of cream. Serve some fried or toasted bread with the soup. It is a great improvement to add half a pint of cream, but this makes the soup much more expensive. The soup can be flavored with a little white pepper. Nota bene. The onion and celery that was strained off can be used again for flavoring purposes. Apple soup. This is a German recipe. Take half a dozen good-sized apples, peel them and remove the core, and boil them in a quart of water with two tablespoonfuls of breadcrumbs. Add the juice of a lemon and flavor it with rather less than a quarter of an ounce of powdered cinnamon. Sweeten the soup with lump sugar, previously having rubbed six lumps on the outside of the lemon. Artichoke soup. Take a dozen large Jerusalem artichokes about as big as the fist or more to make up a similar quantity. Peel them and like potatoes, throw them into cold water in order to prevent them turning color. Boil them in as little water as possible, as they contain a good deal of water themselves, till they are tender and become a pulp, taking care that they do not burn, and therefore it is best to rub the saucepan at the bottom with a piece of butter. Now rub them through a wire sieve and add them to a pint of milk in which a couple of bay leaves have been boiled. Add also two lumps of sugar and a little white pepper and salt. Serve the soup with fried or toasted bread. This soup can be made much richer by the addition of either a quarter of a pint of cream or a couple of yolks of eggs. If yolks of eggs are added, beat up the yolks separately and add the soup gradually, very hot but not quite boiling, otherwise the yolks will curdle. Asparagus soup Take a good sized bundle, about 50 large heads of asparagus, and after a thorough cleansing throw them into a saucepan of boiling water that has been salted. When the tops become tender, train up the asparagus, 
and throw it into cold water, as by this means we retain the bright green colour. When cold, cut off all the best part of the green into little pieces, about a half an inch long. Then, put the remainder of the asparagus, the stalk part, into a saucepan, with a few green onions and a few sprigs of parsley, with about a quart of stock or water. Add a teaspoonful of pounded sugar and a very little grated nutmeg. Let this boil till the stalks become quite tender. Then, rub the whole through a wire sieve and thicken the soup with a little white roux and colour it a bright green with some spinach extract. Now add the little pieces cut up and let the whole simmer gently and serve fried or toasted bread with the soup. Nota bene, spinach extract. It is very important in making all green vegetable soups that they should be of a green colour, such as the one above mentioned, green pea soup, etc., and that we get a good colour and this is only to be obtained by means of spinach extract. Spinach extract can be made at home, but it will be found to be far more economical to have a small bottle of green vegetable colouring always in the house. These bottles can be obtained from all grocers at a cost of about 10 pence or 1 shilling each. Such a very small quantity goes such a long way that one bottle would probably last a family of 6 persons 12 months. As we have said, it can be made at home, but the process, though not difficult, is troublesome. It is made as follows. A quantity of spinach has, after being thoroughly washed, to be pounded in a mortar until it becomes a pulp. This pulp is then placed in a very strong, coarse cloth, and the cloth is twisted till the juice of the spinach is squeezed out through the cloth. The amount of force required is very considerable and is almost beyond the power of ordinary women cooks. This juice must now be placed in a small enameled saucepan and must be heated till it becomes thick and pulpy, when it can be put by for use. It will probably be found cheaper to buy spinach extract than to make it, as manual labour cannot compete with machinery. Barley soup. Take two tablespoonfuls of pearl barley and wash it in several waters till the water ceases to be discolored. Put this in a saucepan with about two quarts of water, two onions sliced up, a few potatoes sliced very thin and about a salt spoonful of thyme. Let the whole boil gently for four or five hours till the barley is quite soft and eatable. Thicken the soup very slightly with a little white roux. Season it with pepper and salt. Before serving the soup, add a tablespoonful of chopped blanched parsley. Nota bene. When chopped parsley is added to any soup or sauce, such as parsley and butter, it is very important that the parsley be blanched. To blanch parsley means to throw it for a few seconds into boiling water. By this means, a dull green becomes a bright green. The best method to blanch parsley is to place it in a strainer and dip the strainer for a few seconds in a saucepan of boiling water. By comparing the color of the parsley that has been so treated with some that has not been blanched, cooks will at once see the importance of the operation so far as appearances are concerned. Beetroot soup this soup is better adapted to the German palate than the English, as it contains both vinegar and sugar, which are very characteristic of German cookery. Take two large beetroots and two good-sized onions, and after peeling the beetroots, boil them and mince them finely, adding them, of course, to the water in which they were boiled, or still better, they can be boiled in some sort of stock. Add a very small quantity of corn flour to give a slight consistency to the soup, as well as a little pinch of thyme. Next, add two tablespoonfuls of vinegar, more or less according to taste, a spoonful of brown sugar and a little pepper and salt. Bean soup or puree of red haricot beans. Put a quart of red haricot beans into soak overnight 
and put a little piece of soda in the water to soften it. The next morning, put the beans on to boil in three quarts of water, with some carrot, celery and onion. Or the beans can be boiled in some stock made from these vegetables. After the beans are tender, pound them in a mortar, and then rub the whole through a wire sieve after first removing the carrot, celery and onion. Add a teaspoonful of pounded sugar and about two ounces of butter. Fried or toasted bread should be served with the soup. If the soup is light thin, of course more water can be added. Bean soup or puree of white haricot beans. Proceed exactly as in the above recipe only substituting white haricot beans for red. It is a great improvement to add a little boiling cream, but of course this makes the soup much more expensive. Some cooks add a spoonful of blanched chopped parsley to this puree, and Frenchmen generally flavor this soup with garlic. Bean soup, green. Boil a quart of ordinary broad beans in some stock or water with an onion, carrot and celery. Remove the skins when the beans are tender and rub the beans through a wire sieve. Color the soup with a little spinach extract, vegetable coloring, sold in bottles. Add a little piece of butter, a little powdered sugar, pepper and salt. The amount of stock or water must depend upon whether it is wished to have the puree thick or thin. Some purees are made as thick as bread sauce, while some persons prefer them much thinner. This is purely a matter of taste. Bean soup from French beans. This is an admirable method of using up French beans or scarlet runners when they get too old to be boiled as a vegetable in the ordinary way. Take any quantity of French beans and boil them in some stock or water with an onion, carrot or celery for about an hour, taking care at starting to throw them into boiling water in order to preserve their color. It is also a saving of trouble to chop the beans slightly at starting, that is, take a bunch of beans in the left hand and cut them into pieces, say an eighth of an inch in thickness. Boil them till they are tender, and then rub the whole through a wire sieve. Add a little butter, pepper and salt, and color the soup with spinach extract. Vegetable coloring sold in bottles. Serve toasted or fried bread with the puree, which should be rather thick. Cabbage soup. Take a white cabbage and slice it up, and throw it into some stock or water, with some leeks and slices of turnip. Boil the whole till the vegetables are tender, flavor with pepper and salt. This is sometimes called Cornish broth, though in Cornwall a piece of meat or bones are generally boiled with the vegetables. As no meat, of course, is used, too much water must not be added, but only sufficient liquor must be served to make the vegetables thoroughly moist. Perhaps the consistency can best be described by saying that there should be equal quantities of vegetables and fluid. Carrot soup. If you wish this soup to be of a good color, you must only use the outside or red part of the carrot, in which case a dozen large carrots will be required. If economy is practiced, half this quantity will be sufficient. Take, say, half a dozen carrots, a small head of celery and one onion and throw them into boiling water for a few minutes in order to preserve the color. Then drain them off and place them in a saucepan with a couple of ounces of butter to prevent them sticking and burning and place the saucepan on a very slack fire and let them stew so that the steam can escape but take care they don't burn or get brown. Now add a quart or two quarts of stock or water and boil them till they are tender. Then rub the whole through a wire sieve, add a little butter, pounded sugar, pepper and salt. The amount of liquid added must entirely depend upon the size of the carrots. 
It is better to add too little than too much, but the consistency of the soup should be like ordinary pea soup. It does not do to have the soup watery. If only the outside parts of carrots are used, and this red part is thrown at starting into boiling water to preserve its color, this soup, when made thick, has a very bright and handsome appearance, and is suitable for occasions when a little extra hospitality is exercised. The inside part of the carrot, if not used for making the soup, need not be wasted, but can be used for making stock or served in a dish of mixed vegetables on some other occasion. Cauliflower Soup Take three or four small cauliflowers, or two large ones, soak them in salt and water, and boil them in some water till they are nearly tender. Take them out and break the cauliflower, so that you get two or three dozen little pieces out of the heart of the cauliflower, somewhat resembling miniature bouquets. Put the rest of the cauliflower back into the water in which it was boiled with the exception of the green part of the leaves, with an onion and some of the white part of a head of celery. Let all boil till the water has nearly boiled away. Now rub all this through a wire sieve, onions, celery, cauliflower and all. Add to it sufficient boiling milk to make the whole of the consistency of pea soup. Add a little butter, pepper and salt. Throw in those little pieces of cauliflower that had been reserved a minute or two before serving the soup. It is an improvement to boil two or three bay leaves with the milk, and also a very great improvement indeed to add a little boiling cream. Fried or toasted bread should be served with the soup. End of section 4. Recording by Charlotte Paris. Section 5 of Castle's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Castle's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 1. Part 2. Soups. Recipes. Celery Soup. Take half a dozen heads of celery, or a smaller quantity if the heads of celery are very large. Throw away all the green part and cut up the celery into small pieces, with one onion sliced and place them in a frying pan or better still in an enameled stew pan. And stew them in a little butter, taking great care that the celery does not turn color. Now add sufficient water or stock and let it all boil till the celery becomes quite tender. Let it boil till it becomes a pulp and then rub the whole through a wire sieve. Next, boil separately from 1 to 2 quarts of milk according to the quantity of celery pulp, and boil a couple of bay leaves in the milk. As soon as the milk boils, add it to the celery soup. Flavor the soup with pepper and salt. Serve fried or toasted bread with the soup. It is needless to say that all these white soups are greatly improved both in appearance and flavor by the addition of a little cream. Cheese soup. Light colored and dry cheese is necessary for this somewhat peculiar soup, but the best cheese of all is undoubtedly Gruyère. Grate half a pound of cheese and spread a layer of this at the bottom of the soup tureen. Cover this layer of cheese with some very thin slices of stale crumbs of bread. Then put another layer of cheese and another layer of bread till all the cheese is used up. Next, take about two tablespoonfuls of brown roux. Melt this in a small saucepan and add two tablespoonfuls of chopped onion. Let the onion cook in the melted roux over the fire and then add a quart of water and stir it all up till it boils. Adding pepper and salt and a few drops of Parisian essence, burnt sugar, to give it a dark brown color. Now pour the boiling soup over the contents of the soup tureen and let it stand a few minutes so that the bread has time to soak and serve. Cherry soup like most soups that are either sweet or sour, this is a German recipe. Put a piece of butter the size of a large egg into a saucepan. Let it melt, then mix it with a tablespoonful of flour and stir smoothly till it is slightly browned. Add gradually two pints of water, 
a pound of black cherries, picked and washed, and a few cloves. Let these boil until the fruit is quite tender. Then press the whole through a sieve. After straining, add a little port if wine is allowed. But the soup will be very nice without this addition. Half a teaspoonful of the kernels, blanched and bruised, a tablespoonful of sugar, and a few whole cherries. Let the soup boil again until the cherries are tender, and pour all into a tureen over toasted sippets, sponge cakes or macaroons. Chestnut Soup or Puree of Chestnuts Take four dozen chestnuts and peel them. This will be a very long process if we attempt to take off the skins while they are raw. But in order to save time and trouble, place the chestnuts in a stew pan with a couple of ounces of butter. Place them on a slack fire and occasionally give them a stir. Heat them gradually till the husks come off without any difficulty. Having removed all the husks, add sufficient stock or water to the chestnuts and let them boil gently till they are tender. Then Pound them in a mortar and rub them through a wire sieve. Add a very little brown roux. If the soup is to be brown, add a few drops of Parisian essence, burnt sugar, or a little white roux and a little cream if the soup is to be white. Add also a little pepper and salt, sufficient butter to make the puree taste soft, and a little powdered sugar. Fried and toasted bread should be served with the soup. Cottage Soup Fry two onions, a carrot and a turnip, and a small head of celery cut up into small pieces in a frying pan, with a little butter, till they are slightly browned. Then put them in a saucepan, with about two quarts of water and a tablespoonful of mixed savory herbs. Let this boil till the vegetables are quite tender, and then thicken the soup with two ounces of oatmeal or prepared barley. This must be mixed with cold water and made quite smooth, before it is added to the soup. Wash a quarter of a pound of rice and boil this in the soup and when the rice is quite tender, the soup can be served. Some persons add a little sugar and dried powdered mint can be handed around with the soup like pea soup. Clear soup. Make a very strong stock by cutting up onion, celery, carrot and a little turnip and boiling them in some water. They should boil for two or three hours. Add also a teaspoonful of mixed savory herbs to every quart and color the stock with a few drops of Parisian essence. Strain it off and if it is not bright, clear it with some white of egg in the ordinary way. Take only sufficient corn flour to make the soup less thin or watery, but do not make it thick. A tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup can be added to every quart. Cocoa Nut Soup Break open a good sized cocoa nut and grate sufficient of the white part till it weighs half a pound. Boil this in some stock and after it has boiled for about an hour strain it off. Only a small quantity of stock must be used and the cocoa nut should be pressed and squeezed so as to extract all the goodness. Add a little pepper and salt and about half a grated nutmeg. Next boil separately three pints of milk and add this to the strained soup. Thicken the soup with some ground rice and serve. Of course, a little cream would be a great improvement. Serve with toasted or fried bread. Endive soup or puree. Take half a dozen endives that are white in the center and wash them very thoroughly in salt and water as they are apt to contain insects. Next, throw them into boiling water and let them boil for a quarter of an hour. Then take them out and throw them into cold water. Next, take them out of the cold water and squeeze them in a cloth so as to extract all the moisture. Then cut off the root of each endive, chop up all the white leaves and place them in a stew pan with about two ounces of butter. Add half a grated nutmeg, a brimming teaspoonful of powdered white sugar and a little pepper and salt. Stir them over the fire with a wooden spoon and take care they don't burn or turn color. Next, add sufficient milk to moisten them and let them simmer gently till they are tender. Then rub the whole through a wire sieve. Add a little piece of butter and serve with fried or toasted bread. Fruit soup. Fruit soup can be made from rhubarb, 
vegetable marrow, cucumber, gourd or pumpkin. They may be all mixed with a little cream, milk or butter and form a nice dish that is both healthful and delicate. Green pea soup. C. P. Green pea soup dried. C. P. Hair soup imitation. Take one large carrot, a small head of celery, one good sized onion and half a small turnip. Boil these in a quart of water till they are tender. Rub the whole through a wire sieve and thicken the soup with some brown roux till it is as thick as good cream. Next, add a brimming salt spoonful of aromatic flavoring herbs. These herbs are sold in bottles by all grocers under the name of herbaceous mixture. Flavor the soup with cayenne pepper, a glass of port wine, port wine dregs will do. Dissolve it in a small dessert spoonful of red currant jelly and add the juice of half a lemon. Nota bene. Aromatic flavoring herbs are exceedingly useful in cooking. It is cheaper to buy them ready-made under the name of herbaceous mixture. They can, however, be made at home as follows. Take 2 ounces of white peppercorns, 2 ounces of cloves, 1 ounce of marjoram, 1 ounce of sweet basil and 1 ounce of lemon thyme, 1 ounce of powdered nutmeg, 1 ounce of powdered mace, and half an ounce of dried bay leaves. The herbs must be wrapped up in paper. One or two little paper bags, one inside the other, is best. And dried very slowly in the oven till they are brittle. They must then be pounded in a mortar, mixed with the spices, and the whole sifted through a fine hair sieve, and put by in a stoppered bottle for use. Hodgepodge. Cut up some celery, onion, carrot, turnip and leeks into small pieces and fry them for a few minutes in about 2 ounces of butter in a frying pan, very gently, taking care that they do not in the least degree turn color. Previous to this, wash and boil about a quarter of a pound of pearl barley for 4 or 5 hours. When the barley is tender, or nearly tender, add the contents of the frying pan. Let it all boil till the vegetables are tender, and about half an hour before the soup is sent to table throw in, while the soup is boiling, half a pint of fresh green peas. Those known as marrow fats are best, and about five minutes before sending the soup to table throw in a spoonful, in the proportion of a dessert spoonful to every quart, of chopped blanched parsley that is, parsley that has been thrown into boiling water before this chopped. Color the soup green with a little spinach extract, vegetable coloring sold in bottles by all grocers. The thinness of the soup can be removed by the addition of a small quantity of white roux. Jardinière soup Cut up into thin strips some carrot, turnip and celery. Add a dozen or more small button onions, similar to those used for pickling and also a few hearts of lettuces cut up fine, as well as a few fresh tarragon leaves cut into strips as thin as small string. Simmer these gently in some clear soup, see clear soup, till tender. Add a lump of sugar and serve. Nota bene, the tarragon should not be thrown in till the last minute. Julienne soup this soup is exactly similar to the previous one, the only exception being that all the vegetables are first stewed very gently till they are tender in a little butter. Care should be taken that the vegetables do not turn color. Leek soup. Take half a dozen or more fine large leeks and after trimming off the green part, throw them into boiling water for five minutes, then drain them off and dry them. Cut them into pieces about half an inch long and stew them gently in a little butter till they are tender. Add three pints of milk and let two bay leaves boil in the milk. Flavor with pepper and salt and add a suspicion of grated nutmeg. Thicken the soup with a little white roux and take the crust of a French roll. Cut this up into small pieces or rings. The rings can be made by simply scooping out the crumb and cutting the roll across. 
When the leeks have boiled in the milk till they are quite tender, pour the soup over the crusts placed at the bottom of the soup tureen. Some cooks add blanched parsley. Of course, cream would be a great improvement. Lentil soup. Take a breakfast cupful of green lentils and put them to soak in cold water overnight. In the morning, throw away any floating on the top. Drain the lentils and put them in a stew pan or saucepan with some stock or water. And add two onions, two carrots, a turnip, a bunch of parsley, a small teaspoonful of savory herbs and a small head of celery. If you have no celery, add half a teaspoonful of bruised celery seed. You can also add a crust of stale bread. Let the whole boil and it will be found that occasionally a dark film will rise to the surface. This must be skimmed off. The soup must boil for about four hours or at any rate till the lentils are thoroughly soft. Then, strain the soup through a wire sieve and rub the whole of the contents through the wire sieve with the soup. This requires both time and patience. After the whole has been rubbed through the sieve, the soup must be boiled up, and if made from green lentils, it can be colored green with some spinach extract. Vegetable coloring sold in bottles. If made from Egyptian red lentils, the soup can be colored with a few drops of Parisian essence, burnt sugar. In warming up this soup, after the lentils have been rubbed through a sieve, it should be borne in mind that the lentil powder has a tendency to settle, and consequently the saucepan must be constantly stirred to prevent it burning. In serving the soup at table, the contents of the soup tureen should be stirred with the soup ladle before each help. Lentil puree à la soubise. This is really lentil soup, made as above, rather thick, to which has been added a puree of onions, made as follows. Slice up, say, four large onions, and fry them in a little butter. Then boil them in some of the broth of the soup till they are tender. Rub them through a wire sieve, and add them to the soup. Macaroni soup, clear. Take some macaroni and break it up into pieces about two inches long. Boil them till they are tender in some salted water, drain them off and add them to some clear soup. See clear soup. Macaroni soup thick. Take an onion, carrots, a small head of celery and a very small quantity of turnip. Cut them up and boil them in a very small quantity of water for about an hour. Then rub the whole through a wire sieve, add a quart or more of boiling milk, throw in the macaroni, after breaking it up into pieces two inches long, and let the macaroni simmer in this till it is perfectly tender. The soup should be thickened with a very little white roux. A bay leaf can be boiled in the soup. A small quantity of cream is a great improvement. Fried or toasted bread should be served with it. Milk soup Milk soup, as it is sometimes called in Germany, very much resembles English custard. It is made by putting a quart of milk on the fire and thickening it with two yolks of eggs and a little flour, and sweetening it with sugar. The soup is flavored with either vanilla, lemon, laurel leaves, pounded almonds, cinnamon, chocolate, etc. As a soup, however, it is not suited to the English palate. Mock turtle, imitation. Take an onion, carrot, a small head of celery and some turnip and boil them till they are tender in some stock. The water in which some rice has been boiled is very well suited for the purpose. Add also to every quart a brimming tablespoonful of mixed savory herbs. Rub the whole through a wire sieve Thicken it with brown roux till it is as thick as cream. Add a few drops of Parisian essence, sold in bottles by all grocers, to give it a dark color. Add a wine glassful of cherry or madeira, or if the use of wine be objected to, the juice of a hard lemon. Flavor the soup with a little cayenne pepper and serve some egg coarse meat balls in it, about the size of small marbles. Milligatani soup. 
Take four large onions, cut them up and fry them brown with a little butter in a frying pan, with the carrot cut up into small pieces. Add to this a quart of stock or water, and boil till the vegetables and onions are tender. Then rub the whole through a wire sieve and add a brimming teaspoonful of Captain White's curry paste and a dessert spoonful of curry powder, previously mixed smooth in a little cold water. Thicken the soup with a little brown roux. Some persons would consider this soup too hot. If so, less curry powder can be used or more water added. If you have no curry paste, Cut up a sour apple and add it to the vegetables in the frying pan. If you have no sour apples, a few green gooseberries are a very good substitute. Boiled rice should be served on a separate dish with this soup and should not be boiled in the soup at starting. End of section 5 Section 6 of Castle's Vegetarian Cookery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Castle's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne Chapter 1 Soups Recipes Part 3 Onion Soup Cut up half a dozen onions and throw them for a few minutes into boiling water. This takes off the rankness. Drain off the onions and chop them up and boil them till they are tender in some milk that has been seasoned with pepper and salt and a pinch of savoury herbs. Take a small quantity of celery, carrot and turnip, or carrot and turnip and a little bruised celery seed, and boil till they are tender in a very little water. Rub through a wire sieve and add the pulp to the soup. The soup can be thickened with white roux, ground rice or one or two eggs beaten up. The soup must be added to the eggs gradually or they will curdle. Onion soup, brown. Take an onion, carrot, celery and turnip and let them boil till quite tender in some water or stock. In the meantime, slice up half a dozen large onions and fry them brown in a little butter in a frying pan, taking care that the onions are browned and not burnt black. Add the contents of the frying pan to the vegetables and stock and after it has boiled some time till the onions are tender, rub the whole through a wire sieve, thicken with a little brown roux, adding, of course, pepper and salt to taste. Oxtail soup, imitation. Slice off the outside red part of two or three large carrots and cut them up into small dice, not bigger than a quarter of an inch square. Cut up also into similar size a young turnip and the white hard part of a head of celery. Fry these very gently in a little butter, taking care that the vegetables do not turn color. Make some soup exactly in every respect similar to that described in the imitation mock turtle. Throw in these fried vegetables and let the soup simmer gently by the side of the fire in order for it to throw up its butter, which should be skimmed off. In flavoring the soup, add only half the quantity of wine or lemon juice that you would use were you making mock turtle. Palestine soup. See artichoke soup. Parsnip soup. Prepare half a dozen parsnips and boil them with an onion and half a head of celery in some stock till they are quite tender. Then rub the whole through a wire sieve, boil it up again and serve. Sufficient parsnips must be boiled to make the soup as thick as pea soup, so the quantity of stock must be regulated accordingly. This soup is generally rather sweet, owing to the parsnips, and an extra quantity of salt must be added in consequence, as well as pepper. In Belgium and Germany, this sweetness is corrected by the addition of vinegar. This, of course, is a matter of taste. Pear soup Pare, core and slice six or eight large pears. Put them into a stew pan with a penny roll cut into thin slices, half a dozen cloves and three pints of water. Let them simmer until they are quite tender, then pass them through a coarse sieve and return the puree to the saucepan. 
with two ounces of sugar, the strained juice of a fresh lemon and half a tumblerful of light wine. Let the soup boil five or ten minutes, when it will be ready for serving. Send some sponge cake to table with this dish. Pea soup from split dried peas. Take a pint of split peas and put them in soak overnight in some cold water and throw away those that float as this shows that there is a hole in them which would be mildewy. Take two onions, a carrot, a small head of celery and boil them with the peas in from three pints to two quarts of water till they are quite tender. This will be from four to five hours. When the peas are old and stale, even longer time should be allowed. Then rub the whole through a wire sieve, put the soup back into the saucepan and stir it while you make it hot or it will burn. In ordinary cookery, pea soup is invariably made from some kind of greasy stock, more especially the water in which pickled pork has been boiled. In the present instance, we have no kind of fat to contract the natural dryness of the pea flour. We must therefore add, before sending to table, two or three ounces of butter. It will be found best to dissolve the butter in the saucepan before adding the soup to be warmed up, as it is then much less likely to stick to the bottom of the saucepan and burn. Fried or toasted bread should be served with the soup separately, as well as dried and powdered mint. The general mistake people make is, they do not have sufficient mint. Pea soup from dried green peas. Proceed as in the above recipe in every respect, substituting dried green peas for ordinary yellow split peas. Color the soup green by adding a large handful of spinach before it is rubbed through the wire sieve, or add a small quantity of spinach extract. Vegetable coloring sold by grocers in bottles. Dried mint and fried or toasted bread should be served with the soup as with the other. Pea soup. Green, fresh. Take half a peck of young peas, shell them and throw the peas into cold water. Put all the shells into a quart or more of stock or water. Put in also a handful of spinach if possible, a few sprigs of parsley, a dozen fresh mint leaves and half a dozen small fresh green onions. Boil these for an hour or rather more and then rub the whole through a wire sieve. You can't rub all the shells through, but you will be able to rub a great part through, that which is left in the sieve being only strings. Now put on the soup to boil again, and as soon as it boils, throw in the peas. As soon as the peas are tender, about 20 minutes, the soup is finished and can be sent to table. If the soup is thin, a little white roux can be added to thicken it. If of a bad color, or if you could not get any spinach, add some spinach extract. Vegetable coloring sold by all grocers. Only take care not to add too much and make the soup look like green paint. Potato soup. Potato soup is a very good method of using up the remains of cold boiled potatoes. Slice up a large onion and fry it, without letting it turn color, with a little butter. Add a little water or stock to the frying pan and let the onion boil till it is tender. Boil a quart or more of milk separately with a couple of bay leaves. Rub the onion with the cold potatoes through a wire sieve and add it to the milk. You can moisten the potatoes in the sieve with the milk. When you have rubbed enough to make the soup thick enough, let it boil up and add to every quart a saltspoonful of thyme and a brimming teaspoonful of chopped blanched parsley. This soup should be rather thicker than most thick soups. When new potatoes first come into season, and especially when you have new potatoes from your own garden, it will often be found that mixed with the ordinary ones there are many potatoes no bigger than a toy marble, and which are too small to be boiled and sent to table as an ordinary dish of new potatoes. Reserve all these little dwarf potatoes. Wash them and throw them for 5 or 10 minutes into boiling water. Drain them off and throw them into the potato soup hole. Of course, they must boil in the soup till they are tender. A little cream is a great improvement to the soup. And dried mint can be served with it, but is not absolutely necessary. Pumpkin soup. 
Take half or a quarter of a moderate sized pumpkin, pare it, remove the seeds and cut the pumpkin into thin slices. Put these into a stew pan with as much water or milk as will cover them and boil gently until they are reduced to a pulp. Rub this through a fine sieve. Mix with it a little salt and a piece of butter the size of an egg and stir it over the fire until it boils. Thin it with some boiling milk which has been sweetened and flavored with lemon rind, cinnamon or orange flower water. It should be of the consistency of thick cream. Put toasted bread cut into the size of dice at the bottom of the soup tureen. Moisten the bread dice with a small quantity of liquor, let them soak a little while, then pour the rest of the soup over them and serve very hot. Or whisk two fresh eggs thoroughly in the tureen and pour the soup in over them at the last moment. The liquor ought to have ceased from boiling for a minute or two before it is poured over the eggs. Rhubarb Soup This is a sweet soup, and is simply juice from stewed rhubarb sweetened and flavored with lemon peel and added either to cream or beaten up yolks of eggs and a little white wine. It is rarely met with in this country. Rice Soup Take a quarter of a pound of rice and wash it in several waters till the water ceases to be discolored. Take an onion, the white part of a head of celery and a turnip and cut them up and fry them in a little butter. Add a quart of stock or water and boil these vegetables until they are tender and then rub them through a wire sieve. Boil the rice in this soup till it is tender. Flavor with pepper and salt Add a little milk boiled separately and serve grated parmesan cheese with the soup. Rice Soup à la Royale Take half a pound of rice and wash it thoroughly in several waters till the water ceases to be discolored. Boil this rice in some stock that has been strongly favored with onion, carrots and celery and strained off. When the rice is tender, rub it through a wire sieve then add some boiling milk in which two or three bay leaves have been boiled and half a pint of cream till the soup is a proper consistency. Serve some egg force meat balls with the soup. Sorrel soup. Take some sorrel and wash it very thoroughly. Like spinach, it requires a great deal of cleansing. Drain it off and place the sorrel in a stew pan and keep stirring it with a wooden spoon. When it has dissolved and boiled for two or three minutes, let it drain on a sieve till the water has run off. Next, cut up a large onion and fry it in a little butter, but do not brown the onion. Add a tablespoonful of flour to every two ounces of butter used, also a teaspoonful of sugar, a little grated nutmeg, also a little pepper and salt. Add the sorrel to this, with a small quantity of stock or water, then rub the whole through a wire sieve and serve. In some parts of the continent, vinegar is added, but it is not adapted to English tastes. Sage Soup Take two ounces of sage, and having washed it very thoroughly, put it on to boil in a quart of stock strongly flavored with onion, celery and carrot, but which has been strained off. The sage must boil until it becomes quite transparent and tender. Flavor the soup with a little pepper and salt, a quarter of a nutmeg grated, about half a teaspoonful of powdered sugar and a teaspoonful of lemon juice from a hard lemon. Sea kale soup. This makes a very delicious soup, but it is somewhat rare. Take a bundle of sea kale, the whiter the better, throw it into boiling water and let it boil for a few minutes. Then take it out and drain it. Cut it up into small pieces and place it in a stew pan with about two ounces of butter. Add a little pepper and salt and grated nutmeg. Stir it up until the butter is thoroughly melted, but do not let it turn color in the slightest degree. Add some milk and let it simmer very gently for about half an hour. Rub the whole through a wire sieve and add a small quantity of cream. Serve with toasted or fried bread. Scotch broth. Take two or three ounces of pearl barley, wash it and throw it into boiling water and let it boil for five or ten minutes. 
Then drain it off and throw away the water. This is the only way to get pearl barley perfectly clean. Then put on the barley in some stock or water and let it boil for four hours till it is tender. Then add to it every kind of vegetable that is in season, such as onion, celery, carrot, turnip, peas, French beans cut up into small pieces, hearts of lettuces cut up. Flavor with pepper and salt and serve together. If possible, add leeks to this soup instead of onion, and just before serving the soup, throw in a brimming dessert spoonful of chopped blanched parsley to every quart of soup. A pinch of thyme can also be added. Spinach soup. Wash some young, freshly gathered spinach, cut it up with a lettuce and, if possible, a few leaves of sorrel, and throw them into boiling water. Let them boil for five minutes, drain them off, and throw them into cold water in order to keep their color. Next, take them out of the water and squeeze all the moisture from them. Then melt two ounces of butter in a stew pan and add two tablespoonfuls of flour. When this is thoroughly mixed together and begins to frizzle, add the spinach, lettuce, etc. And stir them round and round in the stew pan till all is well mixed together. Then add sufficient water or vegetable stock to moisten the vegetables. Add also a pinch of thyme and let it boil. When it has boiled for about 20 minutes, add a quart of milk that has been boiled separately, flavor with pepper and salt and serve. Tapioca soup. Clear tapioca soup is made by thickening some ordinary clear soup, see clear soup, with tapioca allowing about two ounces of tapioca to every quart. The tapioca should be put into the soup when it is cold, and it is then far less likely to get lumpy. Tapioca can also be boiled in a little strongly flavored stock that has not been colored, and then add some boiling milk. Tapioca should be allowed to simmer for an hour and a half. Of course, a little cream is a great improvement when the soup is made with milk. Tomato soup this is a very delicate soup, and the endeavor should be to try and retain the flavor of the tomato. Slice up an onion, or better still, two shallots, and fry them in a little butter, to which can be added a broken up dried bay leaf, a salt spoonful of thyme, and a very small quantity of grated nutmeg. Fry these in a little butter till the onion begins to turn color and then add a dozen ripe tomatoes from which the pips have been squeezed. Moisten with a very little stock or water, and let them stew till they are tender, then rub the whole through a wire sieve. The consistency should be that of pea soup. Add a little butter to soften the soup, and flavor with pepper and salt. Turnip soup. Cut up some young turnips into small pieces, and throw them into boiling water. Let them boil for a few minutes, take them out and strain them, and put them into a stew pan with about two ounces of fresh butter, add a little salt and sugar. Let them stew in the butter, taking great care that they don't turn color till they become soft. Then add sufficient boiling water to moisten them, so that when rubbed through a wire sieve, the soup will be of the consistency of pea soup. Serve fried or toasted bread with the soup. Vegetable Marrow Soup Take a large vegetable marrow, peel it, cut it open, remove all the pips, and place it in a stew pan with about 2 ounces of fresh butter. Add a brimming teaspoonful of powdered sugar, a little grated nutmeg, and pepper and salt. Keep turning the pieces of vegetable marrow over in the butter, taking care that they do not at all turn color. After frying these pieces gently for 5 or 10 minutes, Add some boiling milk and let the whole simmer gently till it can be rubbed through a wire sieve. Care must be taken not to get this soup too thin, as the vegetable marrow itself contains a large quantity of water. Season with pepper and salt and serve fried or toasted bread with the soup. Vegetable soup. See jardiniere soup. Vermicelli soup. Take a quarter of a pound of vermicelli and break it up into small pieces. Throw it into boiling water and let it boil for five minutes to get rid of the dirt and flory taste. 
Then throw it immediately into about a quart of clear soup. The vermicelli must be taken from the boiling water and throw into the boiling soup at once. If you were to boil the vermicelli, train it off and put it by to add to the soup. You would find it would stick together in one lump and be spoiled. Vermicelli soup white. The vermicelli must be thrown into white soup instead of clear soup. See white soup. White soup. Just as in ordinary white soup, the secret of success is to have some strongly reduced stock. So in vegetarian white soup, it is essential that we should have a small quantity of liquid strongly impregnated with the flavor of vegetables. For this purpose, place an onion, the white part of a head of celery, and a slice of turnip in a stew pan with a little butter, and fry them till they are tender without becoming brown. Now, add sufficient water to enable you to boil them, and let the water boil away till very little is left. Now, rub this through a wire sieve, and add it to a quart of milk in which a couple of bay leaves have been boiled. Thicken the soup with a little white roux. Add a suspicion of nutmeg, and also, if possible, a little cream. Flavor with pepper and salt. Serve fried or toasted bread with the soup. End of section 6 Section 7 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 2 Sauces Part 1 Sauce Allemande. Take a pint of butter sauce, see butter sauce, and add to it four yolks of eggs. In order to do this, you must beat up the yolks separately in a basin and add the hot butter sauce gradually. Otherwise, the yolks of eggs will curdle and the sauce will be spoilt. In fact, it must be treated exactly like a custard. And in warming up the sauce, it is often a good plan, if you have no bain-marie, to put the sauce in a jug and place the jug in a saucepan of boiling water. The sauce should be flavored with a little essence of mushroom if possible. Essence of mushroom can be made from the trimmings of mushrooms, but mushroom ketchup must not be used on account of the color. Essence of mushroom can be made by placing the trimmings of mushrooms in a saucepan, stewing them gently, and extracting the flavor. The large black mushrooms, however, are not suited. In addition to this essence of mushroom, a little lemon juice, allowing the juice of half a lemon to every pint, should be added to the sauce, as well as a slight suspicion of nutmeg, a pint of sauce requiring about a dozen grates of a nutmeg. A little cream is a great improvement to this sauce, but is not absolutely necessary. The sauce should be perfectly smooth. Should it therefore contain any lumps, which is not unfrequently the case in butter sauce, pass the sauce through a sieve with a wooden spoon and then put it by in a bain-marie, or warm it up in a jug as directed. Almond sauce. This is suitable for puddings. The simplest way of making it is to make, say, half a pint of butter sauce, or cheaper, thicken half a pint of milk with a little corn flour, sweeten it with white sugar, and then add a few drops of essence of almonds. About a dozen drops will be sufficient if the essence is strong, but essence of almonds varies greatly in strength. The sauce can be colored pink with a few drops of cochineal. Almond sauce, clear. Thicken half a pint of water with a little corn flour, sweeten it with white sugar, add a dozen drops of essence of almonds, and a few drops of cochineal to color it pink. The sauce is very suitable to pour over custard puddings made in a basin or cup and turned out onto a dish. It is also very cheap. Apple sauce. Peel, say, a dozen apples. Cut them into quarters and be very careful in removing all the core, as many a child is choked through carelessness in this respect. Stew the apples in a little water till they become a pulp placing with them half a dozen cloves and half a dozen strips of the yellow part only of the outside of the rind of a fresh lemon of the size and thickness of the thumbnail, sweeten with brown sugar, 
that known as puerto rico being the most economical add a small piece of butter before serving arrowroot sauce thicken half a pint of water with about a dessert spoonful of arrowroot and sweeten it with white sugar the sauce can be flavored by rubbing a few lumps of sugar on the outside of a lemon or with a few drops of essence of vanilla or with the addition of a little sherry or spirit the best spirit being rum this sauce can of course be colored pink with cochineal artichoke sauce proceed exactly as if you were making artichoke soup only make the puree thicker by using less liquid a simple artichoke sauce can be made by boiling down a few jerusalem artichokes to a pulp rubbing them through a wire sieve and flavoring with pepper and salt asparagus sauce boil a bundle of asparagus and rub all the green tender part through a wire sieve till it is a thick pulp flavor with a little pepper and salt add a small piece of butter and a little spinach extract vegetable coloring sold in bottles in order to give it a good color bread sauce take some dry crumb of bread and rub through a wire sieve the simplest plan is to turn the wire sieve upside down on a large sheet of paper the bread must be stale and stale pieces can be put by for this purpose next take say a pint of milk and let it boil then throw in the bread crumbs and let them boil in the milk this is the secret of good bread sauce add a dozen peppercorns and place a whole onion in the saucepan containing the bread and milk and place the saucepan beside the fire in order to allow the bread crumbs to swell it will be found that though at starting the bread sauce was quite thin and milky yet after a time it becomes thick take out the onion add a little piece of butter stir it up and serve a little cream is a great improvement but not absolutely necessary this sauce though very simple requires care many persons will probably recollect having met with bread sauce which in appearance resembled a poultice too much to be agreeable either to the palate or the eye butter sauce this is the most important of all the sauces with which we have to deal the great mistake made by the vast majority of women cooks is that they will use milk they thicken a pint of milk with a little butter and flour and then call it melted butter and as a rule send to table enough for twenty persons when only two or three are dining as butter sauce will be served with the majority of vegetables we would call the attention of vegetarians to the fact that as a rule ordinary cookery books take for granted that vegetables will be served with the meat when therefore vegetables are served separately and are intended to be eaten with bread as a course by themselves some alteration must be made in the method of serving them again vegetarians should bear in mind that except in cases where poverty necessitates rigid economy a certain amount of butter may be considered almost a necessity should the meal be wished to be both wholesome and nourishing francatelli who was chef de cuisine to the earl of chesterfield and was also chief cook to the queen and chef at the reform club and afterwards manager of the freemasons tavern in writing on this subject observes butter sauce or as it is more absurdly called melted butter is the foundation of the whole of the following sauces and requires very great care in its preparation though simple it is nevertheless a very useful and agreeable sauce when properly made so far from this being usually the case it is too generally left to assistance to prepare as an insignificant matter the result is therefore seldom satisfactory when a large quantity of butter sauce is required put four ounces of fresh butter into a middle-sized stewpan with some grated nutmeg and mignonette pepper to these add four ounces of sifted flour knead the whole well together and moisten with a pint of cold spring water stir the sauce on the fire till it boils and after having kept it gently boiling for twenty minutes observing that it be not thicker than the consistency of common white sauce proceed to mix in one pound and a half of sweet fresh butter taking care to stir the sauce quickly the whole time of the operation should it appear to turn oily add now and then a spoonful of cold spring water finish with the juice of half a lemon and salt to palate then pass the sauce through a tammy into a large bain-marie for use 
we have quoted the recipe of the late m francatelli in full as we believe it is necessary to refer to some very great authority in order to knock out the prejudice from the minds of many who think that they not only can themselves cook but teach others but who are bound in the chains of prejudice and tradition which too often in the most simple recipes lead them to follow in the footsteps of their grandmothers real butter sauce can be made as follows on a small scale take a claret glass of water and about a small teaspoonful of flour mixed with rather more than the same quantity of butter and mix this in the water over the fire till it is of the consistency of very thin gruel if it is thicker than this add a little more water now take any quantity of butter and gradually dissolve as much as you can in this thin gruel adding say half an ounce at a time till the sauce becomes a rich oily compound after a time if you add too much butter the sauce will curdle and turn oily as described by francatelli of course in everyday life it is not necessary to have the butter sauce so rich still it is simply ridiculous to thicken a pint of milk or a pint of water with a little butter and flour and then call it butter sauce or melted butter suppose we have a large white cabbage like those met with in the west of england and we are going to make a meal off it in conjunction with plenty of bread suppose the cabbage is sufficiently large for six persons surely half a pound of butter is not an excessive quantity to use in making butter sauce for the purpose yet prejudice is such that if we use half a pound of butter for the butter sauce housekeepers consider it extravagant on the other hand if the butter were placed on the table and the six persons helped themselves and ate bread and butter with the cabbage and finished the half pound it would not be considered extravagant of course this is simply prejudice a simple way of making melted butter is as follows take half a pint of cold water put it in a saucepan and add sufficient white roux or butter and flour mixed till it is of the consistency of thin gruel now gradually dissolve in this adding a little piece at a time as much butter as you can afford add a suspicion of nutmeg a little pepper and salt and a few drops of lemon juice from a fresh lemon if you have one in use butter melted or oiled butter melted butter properly speaking is rarely met with in this country but it is a common everyday sauce on the continent it is simply what it says a piece of butter is placed in a little sauce boat and placed in the oven till the butter runs to oil and then sent to table with all kinds of fish with which in our present work we have nothing to do but it is also sent to table with all kinds of vegetables such as french artichokes etc sometimes a spoonful of french capers is added to the oiled butter butter black or beurre noir take two ounces of butter and dissolve it in a frying pan and let it frizzle till the butter turns a brown color then add a tablespoonful of french vinegar a teaspoonful of chopped capers a teaspoonful of harvey sauce and a teaspoonful of mushroom ketchup let it remain on the fire till the acidity of the vinegar is removed by evaporation this is a very delicious sauce and can be served with jerusalem artichokes boiled whole fried eggs etc caper sauce make some butter sauce and to every half pint of sauce add a dessert spoonful of chopped french capers if the sauce is liked sharp add some of the vinegar from the bottle of capers carrot sauce proceed exactly as in carrot soup using less liquid cauliflower sauce proceed exactly as in cauliflower soup using less liquid celery sauce proceed exactly as in celery soup only using less liquid the thicker this sauce is the better cherry sauce take a quarter of a pound of dried cherries and put them into a small stew pan with a dessert spoonful of black currant jelly a small stick of cinnamon with half a dozen cloves and add rather less than half a pint of water and let the whole simmer gently for about ten minutes when you must take out the spices and send the rest to table n b if wine is not objected to in cooking it is a very good plan to add claret instead of water chestnut sauce proceed as in making chestnut soup using as little liquid as possible so as to make the sauce thick cinnamon sauce 
the simplest way of making cinnamon sauce is to sweeten some butter sauce with some white sugar and then add a few drops of essence of cinnamon the sauce can be colored pink with a little cochineal a little wine is an improvement the sauce can also be made by breaking up and boiling a stick of cinnamon in some water and then using the water to make some butter sauce coconut sauce grate the white part of a coconut very finely and boil it till tender in a very small quantity of water add about an equal quantity of white sugar as there was coconut mix in either the yolk of an egg or a tablespoonful of cream a little lemon juice is an improvement cucumber sauce take two or three small cucumbers peel them slice them and place them in a dish with a little salt which has the effect of extracting the water now drain the pieces off and strain them in a cloth to extract as much moisture as possible put them in a frying pan with a little butter fry them very gently till they begin to turn color then nib them through a wire sieve moisten the pulp with a little butter sauce add a little pepper salt and grated nutmeg and vinegar to taste currant sauce red put a couple of tablespoonfuls of red currant jelly into a small stew pan with half a dozen cloves a small stick of cinnamon and the rind of an orange moisten with a little water or still better a little claret strain it off and add the juice of the orange currant sauce black proceed exactly as in the above recipe substituting black currant jelly for red curry sauce take six large onions peel them cut them up into small pieces and fry them in a frying pan in about two ounces of butter as soon as the onions begin to change color take a small carrot and cut it up into little piece and a sour apple when the onions etc are fried a nice brown add about a pint of vegetable stock or water and let the whole simmer till the vegetables are quite tender then add a teaspoonful of captain white's curry paste and a dessert spoonful of curry powder now rub the whole through a wire sieve and take care that all the vegetables go through it is rather troublesome but will repay you as good curry sauce cannot be made without the curry sauce should be sufficiently thick owing to the vegetables being rubbed through the wire sieve should therefore the onions be small less water or stock had better be added curry sauce could be thickened with a little brown roux but it takes away from the flavor of the curry a few bay leaves may be added to the sauce and served up whole in whatever is curried for instance if we have a dish of curried rice half a dozen or more bay leaves could be added to the sauce and served up with the rice there are many varieties of curry in india fresh mangoes take the part of our sour apples some persons add grated coconut to curry and it is well worth a trial although on the p and o boats the indian curry cook mixes the curry fresh every day and uses coconut oil for the purpose in some parts of india it is customary to serve up whole chilies in the curry but this would be better adapted to a stomach suffering from the effects of brandy pawnee than to the simple taste of the vegetarian dutch sauce this is very similar to alaman sauce take half a pint of good butter sauce make it thoroughly hot add two yolks of eggs taking care that they do not curdle a little pepper and salt a suspicion of nutmeg and about a tablespoonful of tarragon vinegar some persons instead of using tarragon vinegar add a little lemon juice say the half of a fresh lemon to this quantity and half a dozen fresh tarragon leaves blanched that is dipped for a few seconds in boiling water and then chopped very fine the tarragon vinegar is much the simplest as it is very difficult to get fresh tarragon leaves unless one has a good garden or lives near covent garden market dutch sauce green proceed exactly as above and color the sauce a bright green with a little spinach extract vegetable coloring sold in bottles by all grocers egg sauce take half a dozen eggs put them in a saucepan with sufficient cold water to cover them put them on the fire and let them boil for ten minutes after the water boils take them out and put them into cold water and let them stand for ten minutes when the shells can be removed then cut up the six hard-boiled eggs into little pieces add sufficient butter sauce to moisten them make the whole hot and serve 
n b inexperienced cooks often think that hard-boiled eggs are bad when they are not owing to their often having a tinge of green color round the outside of the yolk and to their emitting a peculiar smell when the shells are first removed while hot all eggs contain a small quantity of sulfuretted hydrogen fennel sauce blanch and chop up sufficient fennel to color half a pint of butter sauce a bright green add a little pepper salt and lemon juice and serve end of section seven section eight of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a leverbox recording all leverbox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit leverbox.org recording by larry johnson city tennessee cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay Payne. chapter two sauces part two german sweet sauce Take a quarter of a pound of dried cherries, a small salt spoonful of powdered cinnamon, and a few strips of lemon peel, and put them in a small saucepan with about a quarter of a pint of water. Or still better, claret if wine is allowed, and let them simmer on the fire gently for about a half an hour. Then rub the cherries through a wire sieve with the liquor. Of course the lemon peel and cloves will not rub through, and add this to a quarter of a pound of stewed prunes. This is a very popular sauce abroad. Ginger Sauce The simplest way of making ginger sauce is to sweeten half a pint of butter sauce, and then add a few drops of essence of ginger. A richer ginger sauce can be made by taking two or three tablespoonfuls of preserved ginger and two or three tablespoonfuls of the syrup in which they are preserved rubbing this through a wire sieve adding about an equal quantity of butter sauce making the whole hot in a saucepan gooseberry sauce pick and then stew some green gooseberries just moistening the stew pan with a little water to prevent them burning Rub the whole through a hair sieve in order to avoid having any pips in the sauce. Sweeten with a little demerara sugar, as Puerto Rico would be too dark in color. Color the sauce a bright green with a little spinach extract. It is a mistake to add cream to gooseberry sauce, which is distinct altogether from gooseberry fool. In Germany, vinegar is added to this sauce, and it is served with meat. Horseradish sauce. Horseradish sauce is made, properly speaking, by mixing grated horseradish with cream, vinegar, sugar, made mustard, and a little pepper and salt. A very simple method of making this sauce is to substitute tinned Swiss milk for the cream and sugar. It is equally nice, more economical, and possesses this great advantage. A few tins of Swiss milk can always be kept in a store cupboard, whereas there is considerable difficulty, especially in all large towns, in obtaining cream without giving 24-hour notice. And the result, even then, is not always satisfactory. Horseradish sauce is very delicious and its thickness should be entirely dependent upon the amount of grated horseradish. Sticks of horseradish vary so much in size that we will say grade sufficient to fill a teacup. Throw this in the sauce tureen. Mix a dessert spoonful of Swiss milk with a tablespoonful of vinegar and about two tablespoonfuls of milk, and a teaspoonful of made mustard. Add this to the horseradish, and if necessary, sufficient milk to make the whole of the consistency of bread sauce. As the sauce is very hot, it is a rule, it is best not to add any pepper, which can be easily added afterwards, 
by those who like it. Indian Pickle Sauce Chop up two or three tablespoonfuls of Indian pickles. Place them in a frying pan with a quarter of a pint of water. And if the pickles are sour as well as hot, let them simmer some little time so as to get rid of the vinegar by evaporation. Then thicken the whole with some brown roux till the sauce is as thick as pea soup. The vinegar should be got rid of as much as possible. This is a very appetizing dish with boiled rice and Parmesan cheese. Italian Sauce This is an old-fashioned recipe taken from a book written in French and published more than 50 years ago. Put into a saucepan a little parsley, a shallot, some mushrooms, and truffles, chopped very finely, with a piece of butter about the size of a walnut. Let all boil gently for half an hour. Add a spoonful of oil and serve. Maitre d'hôtel sauce. Maitre d'hôtel sauce is simply a lump of butter mixed with some chopped parsley, a little pepper and salt and lemon juice. Hot sauce is often called maitre d'hôtel when chopped blanched parsley and lemon juice is added to a little white sauce. Mango Chutney Sauce Take a couple of tablespoons full of mango chutney. Moisten it with two or three tablespoonfuls of butter sauce. Rub the whole through a wire sieve and serve either hot or cold. Or the chutney can be simply chopped up fine and added to the butter sauce without rubbing through the wire sieve. Mayonnaise Sauce this is the most delicious of all cold sauces. It is composed entirely of raw yolk of egg and oil, flavored with a dash of vinegar. When made properly, it should be the consistency of butter in summertime. Many women cooks labor under the delusion that it requires the addition of cream. Mayonnaise sauce is made as follows. Break an egg and separate the yolk from the white, and place the yolk at the bottom of a large basin. Next take a bottle of oil, which must be cool but bright. If the oil is cloudy, as it often is in cold weather, you cannot make the sauce, nor can you if the oil has been kept in a warm place. Now proceed to let the oil drop, drop by drop, on the yolk of egg, and with a silver fork, or still better, a wooden one, beat the yolk of egg and oil quickly together. Continue to drop the oil, taking care that only a few drops drop at a time, especially at starting, and continue to beat the mixture lightly and quickly. Gradually, the yolk of egg and oil will begin to get thick, first of all like custard. When this is the case, a little more oil may be added at a time, but never more than a teaspoonful. As more oil is added and the beating continues, the sauce gets thicker and thicker, till it is nearly as thick as butter in the summertime. When it arrives at this stage, no more oil should be added. A little tarragon vinegar may be added at the finish, or a little lemon juice. This makes the sauce whiter in color. One yolk of egg will take a teacup full of oil. It is best to add pepper and salt when the salad is mixed. Mayonnaise sauce is by far the best sauce for lettuce salad. It will keep a day, but should be kept in a cool place, and the basin should be covered with a moist cloth. Mayonnaise sauce green. Make some mayonnaise sauce as above and color it with some spinach coloring, vegetable coloring sold in bottles by all grocers. Mint sauce. Take plenty of fresh mint leaves as the secret of good mint sauce is to have plenty of mint. Chop up sufficient mint to fill a teacup 
Put this at the bottom of a sauce tureen. Pour sufficient boiling water on the mint to thoroughly moisten it, and add a tablespoonful of brown sugar, which dissolves best when the water is hot. Press the mint with the tablespoon to extract the flavor. Let it stand till it is quite cold, and then add three or four tablespoons full of malt vinegar. Stir it up, and the sauce is ready. The quantity of vinegar added is purely a matter of taste, but a teaspoon of chopped mint floating in half. A pint of vinegar is no more mint sauce than dipping a mutton chop in a quart of boiling water, which would be soup in ordinary cookery. Mushroom Sauce White Mushroom sauce can be made from fresh mushrooms or tinned mushrooms. When made from fresh, they must be small button mushrooms and not those that are black underneath. They must be peeled cut small and have little lemon juice squeezed over them to prevent them from turning color. Or they had still better be thrown into lemon juice and water. They must now be fried in a frying pan with a small quantity of butter till they are tender and then added to a little thickened milk. Or still better, cream. When made from tin mushrooms, simply chop up the mushrooms reserving the liquor. Then add a little cream and thicken with a little white roux. A little pepper and salt should be added in both cases. Instead of using milk or cream, you can use a small quantity of sauce allemande. Mushroom sauce brown. Proceed exactly as above with regard to the mushrooms, both fresh and tinned. Only instead of adding milk, cream, or allemande sauce, Add a little stock or water, and then thicken the sauce with a little brown roux. Mushroom Sauce Puree Mushroom sauce, both white and brown, is sometimes served as a puree. It is simply either of the above sauces rubbed through a wire sieve. Mustard Sauce Make, say, half a pint of good butter sauce. Add this to a tablespoonful of French mustard and a tablespoonful of English mustard. Stir this into the sauce, make it hot, and serve. Note, French mustard is sold ready-made in jars and is flavored with tarragon, capers, ravigat, etc. Onion sauce. Take a half dozen large onions Peel them and boil them in a little salted water till they are tender. Then take them out and chop them up fine, and put them in a stew pan with a little milk. Thicken the sauce with a little butter and flour, or white roux, and season with pepper and salt. A very nice, mild onion sauce is made by using Spanish onions. Onion sauce brown. Slice up half a dozen good sized onions. Put them in a frying pan and fry them in a little butter till they begin to get brown. But be careful not to burn them. And should there be a few black pieces in the frying pan, remove them. Now chop up the onions, not too finely, and put them in a saucepan with a very little stock or water. Let them simmer until they are tender and then thicken the sauce with a little brown roux and flavor with pepper and salt. Orange Cream Sauce for Puddings Take a large ripe orange and rub a dozen lumps of sugar on the outside of the rind and dissolve these in a small quantity of butter sauce and add the juice of the orange strained. Now add a little cream or half a pint of milk that has been boiled separately, in which case the sauce will want thickening with a little white roux. Rubbing the sugar on the outside of the rind of the orange gives a very strong orange flavor indeed, far more than the juice of almost any number of oranges would produce, so care must be taken not to overdo it. 
This is what the French cooks call zest of orange. Parsley sauce. Blanch and chop up sufficient parsley to make a brimming tablespoonful when chopped. Add this to half a pint of butter sauce with a little pepper, salt, and lemon juice. It is very important to blanch the parsley. Throw it into a little boiling water before chopping. Pineapple sauce. Take a pineapple, peel it, cut it up into little pieces on a dish, taking care not to lose any of the juice. Place it in a saucepan with very little water, just sufficient to cover the pineapple. Let it simmer gently until it is tender. Then add sufficient white sugar to make the liquid almost a syrup. A teaspoonful of corn flour made smooth in a little cold water can be added, but the sauce should be the consistency of syrup and the corn flour does away with the difficulty of making it too sickly. The juice of half a lemon may be added and is perhaps an improvement. Plum sauce. When made from ripe plums, take, say, a pound and place them in a stew pan with a very little water and a quarter of a pound of sugar. Take out the stones and crack them. Throw the kernels into boiling water so that you can rub off the skin and add them to the sauce after you have rubbed the stewed plums through a wire sieve. To make plum sauce from dried French plums, proceed exactly as in making prune sauce. See prune sauce. Poivrade sauce. Take an onion, a very small head of celery, and a carrot, and cut them into little pieces, and put them into a frying pan with a little butter, a salt spoon full of thyme, one or two dried bay leaves, and about a quarter of a grated nutmeg, and two or three sprigs of parsley. Fry these until they turn a light brown color. Then add a little stock or water and two tablespoons of vinegar. Let this boil in the frying pan for about a half an hour till the liquid is reduced in quantity. Thicken it with a little brown roux and rub through a wire sieve. Make it hot and serve. If wine is allowed, the addition of a little Sherry is a great improvement to this sauce. Prune sauce. Take a quarter of a pound of prunes, put them in a stew pan with just sufficient water to cover them, and let them stew. Put in one or two strips of lemon peel to stew with them. Add a teaspoonful of brown sugar, about sufficient powdered cinnamon to cover a shilling and the juice of half a lemon. When the prunes are quite tender, take out the strip of lemon peel and stones. Rub the whole through a wire sieve and serve. Radish sauce. Take a few bunches of radishes and grate them, and mix this grated radish with a little oil, vinegar, pepper, and salt. You can color the sauce red by adding a little beetroot and make the sauce hot by adding a little grated horse radish. This cold sauce is exceedingly nice with cheese. These grated radishes are more digestible than radishes serve whole. Raspberry sauce. This sauce is simply stewed raspberries rubbed through a wire sieve and sweetened. Some red currant juice should be added to give it a color. It is very nice made hot and then added to one or two beaten up eggs and poured over any plain pudding, such as boiled rice, etc. Ratafia sauce. Add a few drops of ratafia to some sweetened arrowroot or some butter sauce. The sauce can be colored pink with a few drops of cochineal. Ravigat sauce. Put a tablespoonful each of Harvey's sauce, tarragon vinegar, and chili vinegar 
into a small saucepan and let it boil until it is reduced to almost one half in quantity in order to get rid of the acidity. Now add about half a pint of butter sauce and throw in a tablespoon of chopped blanched parsley. Robert Sauce Take a couple of onions, cut them up into small pieces, and fry them with about an ounce of butter in a frying pan. Drain off the butter and add a couple of tablespoonfuls of vinegar to the frying pan and let it simmer for 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour so as to get rid of the acidity of the vinegar. Now add a little stock or water, stir it tip, and thicken the sauce with a little brown roux. Add a dessert spoon full of fresh mustard and a little pepper and salt. Sobeys Sauce Sauce Sobeys is simply a white onion sauce rubbed through a wire sieve and a little cream added. It is more delicate than ordinary onion sauce and is often served in France with roast pheasant. It owes its name to a famous French general. Sorrel Sauce Put about a quarter of fresh green sorrel leaves after being thoroughly washed into an enameled saucepan with a little fresh butter let the sorrel stew till it is tender rub this through a wire sieve add a little powdered sugar and a little lemon juice a little cream may be added but is not absolutely essential sweet sauce take a half a pint of butter sauce and sweeten it with a little sugar. It can be flavored by rubbing a little sugar on the outside of a lemon or with vanilla, essence of almonds, or any kind of sweet essence. A little wine, brandy, or still better, rum, is a great improvement. Some persons add cream. Tarragon sauce. Blanch a dozen tarragon leaves Chop them up and stew them in any kind of stew thickened with brown roux. Tartar sauce. Take two or three tablespoonfuls of mayonnaise sauce and add this to a brimming teaspoonful of chopped blanched parsley as well as a piece of onion or shallot about as big as the top of the thumb down to the first joint. Chopped very fine and a brimming teaspoon full of French mustard. Mix the whole well together. A teaspoon of anchovy sauce would be a great improvement were anchovy sauce allowed in vegetarian cookery. Tomato sauce. The great secret of tomato sauce is to taste nothing but the tomato. Take a dozen ripe tomatoes, Cut off the stalks and squeeze out the pips and put them in a stew pan with a little butter. Let them stew until they are tender and then rub the whole through a wire sieve. This, in our opinion, is the best tomato sauce that can be made, the only seasoning being a little pepper and salt. This wholesome and delicious sauce can, however, be spoiled in a variety of ways by the addition of mace, cloves, shallots, onions, thyme, etc. It can also be very unwholesome by the addition of a quantity of vinegar. Truffle sauce. This sauce is very expensive if made from whole fresh truffles, but can be made more cheaply if you can obtain some truffle chips or parings. These must be stewed in a little stock thickened with brown roux, and then rubbed through a wire sieve, a little sherry being a great improvement if wine is allowed. Vanilla sauce. Add some essence of vanilla to some sweetened butter sauce. White sauce. White sauce is sometimes required for vegetables and sometimes for puddings. In the former case of good flavored, uncolored stock must be thickened with white roux, and then have sufficient cream added to it to make the sauce a pure white. When white sauce 
is wanted for puddings, sufficient butter sauce must be sweetened and very slightly flavored with nutmeg or almond, and then an equal quantity of cream added to it to make a pure white. White sauce should not have any strong predominant flavor. End of section 8. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Section 9 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 3. Savory Rice, Macaroni, Oatmeal, Etc. Rice probably all persons will admit that rice is a too much neglected form of food in england when we remember how small a quantity of rice weekly is found sufficient to keep alive millions and millions of our fellow creatures in the east it seems to be a matter of regret that rice as an article of food is not more used by the thousands and thousands of our fellow creatures in the east not in the ordinary acceptation of the term but east of temple bar rice is cheap nourishing easily cooked and equally easily digested yet that monster custom seems to step in and prevent the bulk of the poor availing themselves of this light and nourishing food solely for the reason that as their grandfathers and grandmothers did not eat rice before them they do not see any reason why they should like the irishman who objected to have his feet washed on the same ground of the different kinds of rice, Carolina is the best, the largest, and the most expensive. Patna rice is almost as good. The grains are long, small, and white, and it is the best rice for curry. Madras rice is the cheapest. Rice, pure and simple, is the food most suited for hot climates, and where a natural indolence of disposition results in one's day's work of an ordinary Englishman being divided among twenty people. As we move towards more temperate zones, it will be found the universal custom to qualify it by mixing it with some other substance. Thus, though rice is largely eaten in Italy, it is almost invariably used in conjunction with Parmesan cheese. Rice contains no flesh-forming properties whatever, as it contains no nitrogen, and with all due respect to vegetarians, it will be found that as we recede from the equator, and advance toward the poles our food must of necessity vary with the latitude and whereas we may start on a diet of rice we shall be forced sooner or later to depend upon a diet of pemmican or food of a similar nature rice to boil the best method of boiling rice is at any rate a much disputed point if not an open question there are as many ways almost of boiling rice as dressing a salad and each one thinks his own way the best. We will mention a few of the most simple, and will illustrate it by boiling a small quantity that can be contained in a teacup. Of course, boiling rice is very much simplified if you want some rice water as well as rice itself. Rice water contains a great deal of nourishment, a fact which is well illustrated by the well-known story of the black troops who served in India under Clive who at the siege of arcot told clive when they were short of provisions that the water in which the rice was boiled would be sufficient for them while the more substantial grain could be preserved for the european troops take a teacupful of rice and wash the rice in several waters till the water ceases to be discolored now throw the rice into boiling water say a quart let the rice boil gently till it is tender strain off the rice and reserve the rice water for other purposes the time rice will take to boil treated this way would be probably about twenty minutes but this time would vary slightly with the quality and size of the rice many years ago we watched a black man boiling rice on board a p and o boat the mizapur he proceeded as follows he boiled the rice for about ten minutes or perhaps a minute or two longer strained it off in a sieve and then washed the rice with cold water 
and then put the rice back in the stew pan to once more get hot and swell of course this rice was being boiled for curry and certainly the result was that each grain was beautifully separated from every other grain we do not think however that this method of boiling rice is customary on all the boats of the p and o company of course this method of boiling rice was somewhat wasteful by far the most economical method of boiling rice is as follows and we would recommend it to all who are in the habit of practicing economy on the grounds of either duty or necessity wash thoroughly as before a teacupful of rice and put it in a small stew pan or saucepan with two breakfast cupfuls of water bring this to a boil and let it boil for ten minutes and then remove the saucepan to the side of the fire and let the rice soak and swell for about twenty minutes after a little time you can put a cloth on the top of the saucepan to absorb the steam similar to the way you treat potatoes after having strained off the water in boiling rice we must remember that there are two ways in which rice is served one is as a meal in itself the other as an accompaniment to some other kind of food it will be found in italy and turkey and in the east generally where rice forms so to speak the staff of life that it is not cooked so soft and tender as it is in england where it is generally served with something else in fact each grain of rice may be said to resemble an irish potato inasmuch as it has a heart in it in ireland potatoes as a rule are not cooked so much as they are in most parts of england probably the reason of this is in most cases that experience has taught people that there is more stay in rice and potatoes when served in a state that english people would call underdone there is no doubt that the waste throughout the length and breadth of this prosperous land through overcooking is something appalling another very good method of boiling rice is the american style take a good sized stew pan or saucepan that has a tight fitting lid put a cloth over the saucepan after first pouring in say a pint of water push down the cloth keeping it tight so as to make a well but do not let the cloth reach the water wash the rice as before and put on the lid tight of course with the cloth the lid will fit very tight indeed now put the saucepan on the fire and make the water boil continuously by these means you steam the rice till it is tender and lose none of the nourishment we can always learn from america risotto a la milanese take a teacup full of rice wash it thoroughly and dry it chop up a small onion and put it in the bottom of a small stew pan and fry the onion to a light brown color now add the dry rice and stir this up with the onion and butter till the rice also is fried of a nice light brown color now add two breakfast cupfuls of stock or water and a pinch of powdered saffron about sufficient to cover a three penny piece let the rice boil for ten or eleven minutes move the saucepan to the side of the fire and let it stand for twenty minutes or half an hour till it has absorbed all the stock or water now mix in a couple of tablespoons of grated parmesan cheese flavor with a little pepper and salt and serve the whole very hot rice with cabbage and cheese wash some rice and let it soak in some hot water with the cabbage sliced up for about an hour then strain it off and put the rice and cabbage in a stew pan with some butter a little pepper and salt and about a quarter of a grated nutmeg toss these about in the butter for ten minutes or a quarter of an hour over the fire but do not let them turn color then add a small quantity of water or stock let it stew till it is tender and then serve it very hot with some grated cheese sprinkled over the top n b the end of cheese rind can be utilized with this dish rice with cheese wash some rice and then boil it for ten or eleven minutes in some milk and let it stand till it has soaked up all the milk the proportion generally is as we have said before a teacupful of rice to two breakfast cupfuls of milk but as we shall want the rice rather moist on the present occasion we must allow a little more milk now mix in some grated cheese and a little pepper and salt place the mixture in a pie dish and cover the top with grated cheese and place the pie dish in the oven and bake till the top is nicely browned and then serve 
some cooks add a good spoonful of made mustard to the mixture some persons prefer it and some don't it is therefore best to serve some made mustard with the rice and cheese at table unless the mixture was fairly moist before it was put in the pie dish it would dry up in the oven and become uneatable rice curry boil a teacupful of well washed rice in two breakfast cupfuls of water and let the rice absorb all the water put a cloth in the saucepan and stir up the rice occasionally with a fork till the grains become dry and separate easily the one from the other now mix it up with some curry sauce make the whole hot and send it to the table with a few whole bay leaves mixed in with the rice only sufficient curry sauce should be added to moisten the rice it must not be rice swimming in gravy or you can make a well in the middle of the boiled rice and pour the curry sauce into this rice borders casseroles casseroles or rice borders form a very handsome dish it consists of a large border made of rice the outside of which can be ornamented and the center of which can be filled with a macedoine i e a mixture of fruit or vegetables as you are probably aware grocers have in their shop windows small tins with copper labels on which the word is printed macedoine this tin contains a mixture of cut up cooked vegetables these are very useful to have in the house as a nice dish can be served at a few moments notice mixed fruits are also sold in bottles under the name of macedoine of fruits of course both vegetables and fruit can be prepared at home much cheaper from fresh fruit and vegetables but this requires time and forethought these mixtures are very much improved in appearance when served in a handsomely made rice border and as the border is eaten with the vegetables and fruit there is no want of economy in the recipe suppose we are going to make a rice border take a pound of rice and wash it carefully if we are going to fill it with fruit we must boil it in sweetened milk but if we are going to fill it with vegetables we must boil it in vegetable stock or water add as the case may be sufficient liquid to boil the rice till it is thoroughly tender and soft now place it in a large bowl and with a wooden spoon mash it till it becomes a sort of firm compact paste then take it out and roll it into the shape of a cannonball and having done this flatten it till it becomes of the shape of the cheeses one meets with in holland flat top and bottom with rounded edges you can now ornament the outside by making it resemble a fluted mold of jelly the best way of doing this is to cut a carrot in half and scoop out part of the inside with the cheese scoop so that the width of the part where it is scooped is about the same as the two flat sides make the outside of the rice perfectly smooth with the back of a wooden spoon butter the carrot mold to prevent it sticking and press this gently on the outside of the shape of rice till it resembles the outside of a column in gothic architecture then place it in the oven and let it bake till it is firm and dry then scoop out the center and put it back for a short time if the border is going to be used for a macedoine of vegetables beat up a yolk of egg and paint the outside of the casserole with this and then it will bake a nice golden brown color now take it out of the oven and fill it accordingly it can be served hot or cold or it can be filled with a german salad see macedoine of fruit macedoine of vegetables salad german rice croquettes savory boil a teacupful of rice in some stock or water about two breakfast cupfuls till it is tender and until the rice has absorbed all the water or stock chop up a small onion very fine fry it till tender in a very little butter but do not let it brown add a small teaspoonful of mixed savory herbs a brimming teaspoonful of chopped parsley to the contents of the frying pan for two or three minutes and then add them to the rice mix it well together and let the rice dry in the oven till the mixture is capable of being rolled into balls now take two eggs separate the yolk from the white of one beat up the whole egg and one white thoroughly in a basin but do not beat it to a froth add the rice mixture to this mix it again very thoroughly and then roll it into balls about the size of a small walnut seasoning the mixture with sufficient pepper and salt roll these balls in flour in order to ensure the outside being dry 
and roll them backwards and forwards on the sieve in order to get rid of the superfluous flour make some very fine bread crumbs from some stale bread next beat up the yolk of egg with about a dessert spoonful of warm water dip the rice balls into this and then cover them with the bread crumbs let them stand for an hour or two for the bread crumbs to get dry and then fry them a light golden brown color in a little oil fried parsley can be served with them instead of bread crumbs you can use up broken vermicelli the bottom of a jar of vermicelli can sometimes be utilized this way this has a very pretty appearance the vermicelli browns quickly and the croquettes have the appearance of little balls covered in brown network rice savory there are several ways of serving savory rice the rice can be boiled in some stock strongly flavored with onion and celery and when cooked sufficiently tender one or two eggs can be beaten up with it pepper and salt added and the mixture served with grated cheese rice can also be rendered savory by the addition of chopped mushrooms pepper and salt and a little butter and if a tin of mushrooms is used the liquor in the tin should be added to the boiled rice but in every case the rice should be made to absorb the liquor in which it is boiled eggs can again be added as well as grated parmesan cheese a cheap and quick way of making rice savory is to mix it with a large tablespoonful of chutney make it hot with a little butter and add pepper cayenne if preferred with a little lemon juice rice can also be served as savory by boiling it in any of the sauces that may be termed savory in distinction to those that are sweet given in the chapter entitled sauces rice and eggs boil say half a pound of rice and let it absorb the water in which it is boiled take four hard-boiled eggs separate the yolks from the whites chop the whites very fine and add them to the rice with about a brimming teaspoonful of chopped blanched parsley and sufficient savory herbs to cover a sixpence put this in the saucepan and make it hot with a little butter and flavor with plenty of pepper and salt in the meantime beat the yellow hard-boiled yolks to a yellow powder turn out the rice mixture when thoroughly hot into a vegetable dish and put the yellow powder either in the center or make a ring of the yellow powder round the edge of the rice and serve a little pile of fried parsley in the middle rice and tomato take half a dozen ripe tomatoes squeeze out the pips and put them in a tin in the oven with a little butter to bake baste them occasionally with a little butter in the meantime boil half a pound of rice in a little stock or water only adding sufficient so that the rice can absorb the liquid when this is done and this will take about the same time as the tomatoes take to bake pour all the liquid and butter in the tin on to the rice and stir it well up with some pepper and salt put this on a dish and serve the tomatoes on the rice with the red unbroken side uppermost End of section 9section 10 of castles vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jl baldwin castles vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter 3 part 2 savory rice macaroni oatmeal etc macaroni 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 is a preparation of pure wheat and flour it is chiefly made in Italy, though a good deal is made in Geneva and Switzerland. The best macaroni is made in the neighborhood of Naples. The wheat that grows there ripens quickly under the pure blue sky and hot sun, and consequently the outside of the wheat is browner, while the inside of the wheat is whiter than that grown in England. The wheat is ground and sifted repeatedly. It is generally sifted about five times, and the pure snow-white flour that falls from the last sifting is made into macaroni. It is first mixed with water and made into a sort of dough, the dough being kneaded in the truly orthodox eastern style by being trodden out with the feet. It is then forced by a sort of rough machinery through holes, partially baked during the process, and then hung up to dry. Macaroni contains a great amount of nourishment, and it is only made from the purest and finest flour. It is the staple dish throughout Italy, and in whatever form or way it is cooked, except as a sweet, 
tomatoes and grated parmesan cheese seem bound to accompany it spaghetti spaghetti is a peculiar form of macaroni ordinary macaroni is made in the form of long tubes and when macaroni pudding is served in schools it is often irreverently nicknamed by the boys gas pipes spaghetti is not a tube but simply macaroni made in the shape of ordinary wax tapers which it resembles very much in appearance in Italy, it is often customary to commence dinner with a dish of spaghetti, and should the dinner consist as well of soup, fish, entree, salad, and sweet, the spaghetti would be served before the soup. Take, say, half a pound of spaghetti, wash it in cold water, and throw it instantly into boiling salted water. Boil it till it is tender, about twenty minutes. Drain it, put it into a hot vegetable dish, and mix in two or three tablespoonfuls of grated Parmesan cheese. Toss it about lightly with a couple of forks till the cheese melts and forms what may be called cobwebs on tossing it about. Also add two tablespoonfuls of tomato conserve, sold by all grocers in bottles, and serve immediately. This is very cheap, very satisfying, and very nourishing, and it is to be regretted that this popular dish is not more often used by those who are not vegetarians, who would benefit both in pocket and in health were they to lessen their butcher's bill by at any rate commencing dinner, like the Italians, with a dish of spaghetti. Macaroni, Italian fashion. This is very similar to spaghetti, only ordinary pipe macaroni is used. Take, say, a teacup full of macaroni, wash it, break it up into two-inch pieces, and throw it into boiling water that has been salted. Strain it off, put it in a stew pan for a few minutes, with a little piece of butter and some pepper and salt. Add a tablespoonful of tomato conserve and serve it with some grated Parmesan cheese, served separate in a dish. Some rub the stew pan with a head of garlic. This gives it what may be called a more foreign flavor, but this should not be done unless you know your guests like garlic. Unfortunately, the proper use of garlic is very little understood in this country. Macaroni cheese. Some years back, this was almost the only form in which macaroni was served in this country. Macaroni cheese used to be served at the finish of dinner in a dried-up state, and was perhaps one of the most indigestible dishes which the skill, or want of skill, of our English cooks was able to produce. Wash and then boil a quarter of a pound of macaroni in a little milk, till it is quite tender, then put into a well-buttered oval tin a layer of macaroni, and cover this with a layer of bread crumbs mixed with grated cheese, and add a few little lumps of butter, then put another layer of macaroni and another layer of bread crumbs and cheese. Continue alternate layers till you pile up the dish, taking care to have a layer of dried bread crumbs at the top. Warm some butter, but do not oil it, and pour some of this warm butter over the top of the dish to moisten them. Put the dish in the oven till it is hot through, then take it out and brown the top quickly with a red-hot salamander. If you leave the macaroni cheese in the oven too long, the dish will taste oily, and the cheese gets so hard as to become absolutely indigestible. Any kind of grated cheese will do for this dish, but to the English palate it is best when made from a moist cheese similar to that which would be used in making Welsh rabbit. Macaroni and Eggs Take half a pound of macaroni and throw it into boiling water that has been salted. In the meantime have ready four hard-boiled eggs. When the macaroni is nearly tender, throw the hard-boiled eggs into cold water for a minute in order to enable you to take off the shells without burning your fingers. Cut the eggs in half, take out half the yellow yolk without breaking it, cut the whites of the eggs into rings, and mix these rings with the macaroni on the dish. The macaroni and eggs must be flavored with pepper and salt, and if possible, pour a little white sauce over the whole. If you have no white sauce, add a little cream or a little thickened milk with a little butter dissolved in it. Now sprinkle a little chopped blanched parsley over the whole, and ornament the dish with the eight half yolks. Macaroni a la reine Boil half a pound of pipe macaroni. Meanwhile, warm slowly in a saucepan three-quarters of a pint of cream and slice into it half a pound of Stilton or other white cheese. Add two ounces of good fresh butter, two blades of mace pounded, a good pinch of cayenne, and a little salt. Stir until the cheese is melted and the whole is free from lumps. Then put in the macaroni and move it gently round the pan until mixed and hot, or put the macaroni on a hot dish and pour the sauce over. It may be covered with fried bread crumbs of a pale color and browned in a Dutch oven. Macaroni au gratin. Break up a pound of macaroni in three inch lengths, boil as usual, and drain. Put into a stew pan a quarter of a pound of fresh butter, the macaroni, twelve ounces of parmesan and gruyere cheese mixed, 
and about a quarter of a pint of some good sauce, white sauce. Move the stew pan and its contents over the fire until the macaroni has absorbed the butter, etc. Then turn it out on a dish, which should be garnished with croutons of fried bread. Pile it in the shape of a dome, cover with bread raspings, a little clarified butter run through a colander, and brown very lightly with a salamander. N.B. The above two recipes are taken from Castle's Dictionary of Cookery. Macaroni as an Ornament Macaroni is sometimes used to ornament the outside of puddings, either savory or sweet. Suppose the pudding has to be made in a small round mold or basin. Some pipe macaroni is boiled in water till it is tender, and then cut up into little pieces a quarter of an inch in length. The inside of the mold is first thickly buttered, and then these little quarter-inch tubes are stuck in the butter close together. The pudding, for instance a custard pudding, is then poured into the mold and the mold steamed. When the pudding is turned out, the outside of the pudding has the appearance of a honeycomb, and looks extremely pretty. The process is not difficult, but rather troublesome as it requires time and patience. Macaroni, Timbal of. This is a somewhat expensive dish. You have first to decorate a plain mold with what is called nui paste, which is made by mixing half a pound of flour with five yolks of eggs. The mold is then lined with ordinary short paste, made with half a pound of flour, a quarter of a pound of butter, and one yolk of egg mixed in the ordinary way. When the mold is lined, you have to fill it up with flour and bake it in a moderate oven for about an hour. You then take it out, empty out the flour, and brush it well out with an ordinary brush and dry the mold in a very slack oven. The mold is then filled with some macaroni that has been boiled tender in milk and flavored with vanilla and sugar and parmesan cheese. The macaroni must be so managed that it absorbs the moisture. The mold is filled, made hot, and then turned out. It is customary to shake some powdered sugar over the mold, and then glaze it with a red-hot salamander. N.B. Very few kitchens possess a proper salamander, but if you make the kitchen shovel red-hot, it will be found to answer the same purpose. Macaroni and Scallop Shells Take half a pound of macaroni, wash it, and throw it into boiling water. Take the macaroni out, drain it, and throw it into cold water. Then take it out and cut it into pieces not more than half an inch in length. Take about a quarter of a pound of butter, melt it in a stew pan, and add about a cupful of milk, or still better, cream. Stir it and dredge in enough flour to make it thick, or still better, thicken it with a little white roux. Now add some pepper and salt, about a quarter of a grated nutmeg, two or three spoonfuls of grated Parmesan cheese, Add the cut-up macaroni and stir the whole well up over the fire together and fill the scallop shells with the mixture and throw some grated cheese over the top. Bake the scallops in the oven till the cheese begins to brown then pour a little oiled butter over the top of the cheese. If made with cream, this dish is somewhat rich but forms an admirable meal eaten with plenty of bread. Macaroni noodles. The word noodle is probably derived from French nuit paste. It is made in a similar manner or nearly so. French cooks use only yolk of egg and flour. English cooks use beaten up eggs and sometimes even reserve the yolks for other purposes and make the paste with white of egg. In any case, the yolks, the whole eggs, or the white without the yolks, must be well beaten up and then mixed in with the flour with the fingers till it makes a stiff paste. This paste or dough is then rolled out with a straight rolling pin, not an English one, till it is as thin as a wafer. The board must be well floured or it will stick. A marble slab is best, and if you are at a loss for a rolling pin, try an empty black bottle. It is very important to roll the pastry thin, and it has been well observed that the best test of thinness is to be able to read a book through the paste. When rolled out, let each thin cake dry for five or ten minutes. If you have a box of cutters, you can cut this paste into all sorts of shapes according to the shape of the cutters. Or you can cut each thin cake into pieces about the same size, and then with a sharp dry knife cut the paste into threads. These threads or ornamental shapes can be thrown into boiling clear soup when they will separate of their own accord. Noodle paste is, in fact, homemade Italian paste, or, when cut into threads, homemade vermicelli. It is very nourishing, as it is made with eggs and flour. Macaroni savory. Take half a pound of macaroni and boil it in some slightly salted water, and let it boil and simmer till the macaroni is tender and absorbs all the water in which it is boiled. Now take a dessert spoonful of raw mustard, i.e. mustard in the yellow powder. Mix this gradually with the macaroni and add five or six tablespoonfuls of grated Parmesan cheese and a little cayenne or white pepper according to taste. 
Turn the mixture out onto a dish, sprinkle some more grated Parmesan cheese over the top, bake it in the oven till it is slightly brown, pour a little oiled butter on top, and serve. Macaroni and Chestnuts Bake about twenty chestnuts till they are tender, and then peel them and pound them in a mortar with a little pepper and salt and butter till they are a paste. Next, wash and boil in the ordinary way half a pound of macaroni. Drain off the macaroni and put it in a stew pan with the chestnuts and about a couple of ounces of butter to moisten it, and stir it all together and put an onion in to flavor it as if you were making bread sauce. But the onion must be taken out whole before it is served. If the mixture gets too dry, it can be moistened with a little milk or stock. After it has been stirred together for about a quarter of an hour, turn it out onto a dish, cover it with a little Parmesan cheese, bake in the oven till it is brown, and moisten the top when browned with a little oiled butter. Macaroni and Tomatoes Take half a pound of macaroni, wash it and boil it until it is tender. In the meantime, take half a dozen or more ripe tomatoes, cut off the stalks, squeeze out the pips, and place them in a tin in the oven with a little butter to prevent their sticking. It is as well to baste the tomatoes once or twice with the butter and the juice that will come from them. Put the macaroni, when tender and well drained, off into a vegetable dish, pour the contents of the tin, butter and juice, over the macaroni and add pepper and salt, and toss it lightly together. Now place the whole tomatoes on top of the macaroni round the edge at equal distances. It is a great improvement to the appearance of the dish to sprinkle a little chopped blanched parsley over the macaroni. The tomatoes should be placed with the smooth red, unbroken side uppermost. Macaroni and Cream Boil half a pound of macaroni, cut it up into pieces about two inches long, and put it into a stew pan with two ounces of butter and a quarter of a pound of grated cheese, composed of equal parts of gruyere and parmesan cheese. Moisten this with about three tablespoonfuls of cream. Toss it all lightly together till the cheese makes cobwebs. Add a little pepper and salt, and serve with some fried bread round the edge cut up into ornamental shapes. Carefully made pieces of toast cut into triangles will do instead of the fried bread. Tagliatelle. Take some flour and water, and with the addition of a little salt make a paste which can be rolled out quite thin. Cut this into shapes of the breadth of half a finger. Throw them into boiling water and let them boil a few minutes. Then remove them to cold water, drain them on a sieve, and use them as macaroni. Place at the bottom of a dish some butter and grated cheese, then a layer of tagliatelle seasoned with pepper, another layer of butter and cheese, and then one of tagliatelle, until the whole is used. Pour over it a glass of cream, add a layer of cheese, and finish like macaroni cheese, browning it in the oven. End of section 10. Section 11 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 3 Savory Rice, Macaroni, Oatmeal, etc. Oatmeal Porridge of all dishes used by vegetarians, there are none more wholesome, more nourishing, or more useful as an article of everyday diet for breakfast than oatmeal porridge. When we remember the Scotch, who from both body and brain rank perhaps first amongst civilized nations, almost live on this cheap and agreeable form of food. We should take particular pains in the preparation of a standing dish, which in itself is a strong argument in favor of a vegetarian diet when we look at the results, both mentally and bodily, that have followed its use north of the Tweed. The following excellent recipe for preparation of oatmeal porridge is taken from a book entitled A Year's Cookery by Phyllis Brown, Castle and Company. When they are children in the family, it is a good plan, whatever they may have for breakfast, to let them begin the meal either with oatmeal porridge or bread and milk. Porridge is a wholesome and nourishing and will help to make them strong and hearty. Even grown-up people 
frequently enjoy a small portion of porridge served with treacle and milk. Oatmeal is either coarse, medium, or fine. Individual taste must determine which of these three varieties shall be chosen. Scotch people generally prefer the coarsest kind. The ordinary way of making porridge is the following. Put as much water as is likely to be required in a saucepan with a sprinkling of salt. Let the water boil. Half a pint of water will make a single plateful of porridge. Take a knife. A spurtle is the proper utensil in the right hand and some scotch or coarse oatmeal in the left hand and sprinkle the meal in gradually stirring it briskly all the time. If any lumps form, draw them to the side of the pan and crush them out. When the porridge is sufficiently thick, the degree of thickness must be regulated by individual taste. Draw the pan back a little, put on the lid, let the contents simmer gently until wanted. If it can, have two hours simmering all the better. But in hundreds of families in Scotland and the north of England, it is served when it has boiled for 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour. Less oatmeal is required when it can boil a long time because the simmering swells the oatmeal and so makes it go twice as far. During the boiling, the porridge must be stirred frequently to keep it from sticking to the saucepan and burning. But each time it is done, the lid must be put on again. When it is done enough, it should be poured into the basin or upon a plate and served hot with sugar or treacle and milk or cream. The very best method that can be adopted for making porridge is to soak the coarse scotch oatmeal in water for 12 hours or more. If the porridge is wanted for breakfast, it may be put in a pie dish overnight and left till morning. As soon as the fire is lighted in the morning, it should be placed on it, stirring occasionally, kept covered, and boiling as long as possible, although it may be served when it has boiled for 20 minutes. When thus prepared, it will be almost like a delicate jelly and acceptable to most fastidious palate. The portions of porridge made in this way are a heaped tablespoon of coarse oatmeal to a pint of water. It is scarcely necessary to give directions for making. Bread and milk. For everyone knows how this should be done. It may be said that preparation has a better appearance if the bread is cut very small before boiling milk and is poured on it, and also that the addition of a small pinch of salt takes away the insipidity. Rigid economists sometimes swell the bread with boiling water, then drains this off and pour milk in its place. This, however, is almost a pity for milk is so very good for children and though recklessness is seldom to be recommended a mother might be advised to be reckless with the amount of her milk bill provided almost that the quantity of milk be not wasted and that the children have it milk porridge Take a tablespoon of oatmeal and mix it up in a cup with a little cold milk till it is quite smooth, in a similar way as you would mix ordinary flour and milk in making batter. Next, put a pint of milk on to boil. As soon as it boils, mix in the oatmeal and milk and let it boil about a quarter of an hour, taking care to keep stirring the whole time. The fire should not be too fierce, as the milk is very apt to burn. Flavor this with either salt or sugar. Rice and Barley Porridge 
Take a quarter of a pound of rice and a quarter of a pound of scotch barley and wash them thoroughly. The most perfect way of washing barley and rice is to throw them into boiling water and let them boil five or ten minutes and then strain them off. By this means the dirty outside is dissolved. Next boil the rice and barley gently for three or four hours. Strain them off and boil them up again in a little milk for a short time before they are wanted. It will often be found best to boil the barley for a couple of hours and then add the rice. A little cream is a very great improvement. The porridge can be flavored with pepper and salt, but is very nice with brown sugar, treacle, or jam, and when cold forms an agreeable accompaniment to stewed fruit. Wholemeal Porridge Boil a quart of water and gradually stir in about half a pound of whole meal. Let it boil about a quarter of an hour and serve. Cold milk should accompany this porridge. Lentil Porridge To every quart of water add about six tablespoons of lentil flour. Let the whole boil for about a quarter of an hour and flavor with pepper and salt. Hominy. Take a teacup full of hominy, wash it in several waters, and rub it well between the hands, and throw away the grains that float on the top. The same as you do with split peas. Pour the water off the top, and strain it off, and put it in a basin with a quart of water, and cover the basin over with a cloth. Put it up to soak overnight should it be required for breakfast in the morning. The next day, put it in an enameled stew pan with about a teaspoon of salt and let it simmer gently over the fire. Take care that it does not burn. It is best to butter the bottom of the saucepan or if you have a small plate that will go inside, you will find this a great protection. Let it simmer gently for rather more than an hour. Stir it up well and flavor it with either sugar or salt, and let it be eaten with cold milk poured on the plate, or with a little butter. The hominy should simmer until it absorbs all the water in which it is boiled. As a rule, a good teacup full will absorb a quart. Hominy Fried This is made from the remains of cold boiled hominy. When cold, it will be a firm jelly. Cut the cold hominy into slices. Flour them, egg and bread crumb them, and then plunge them into some smoking hot oil until they are a nice bright golden color. They are very nice eaten with lemon juice and sugar, or can be served with orange marmalade. Frumenti Take a quarter of a pint of wheat, wash it thoroughly, and let it soak for 12 hours or more in the water. Strain it off and boil it in some milk till it is tender, but do not let it get plumpy. As soon as it is tender, add a quart of milk, flavored with a little cinnamon, three ounces of sugar, three ounces of carefully washed grocer's currants, and let it boil for a quarter of an hour. Beat up three egg yolks in a turin and gradually add the mixture. It must not be added to the eggs in a boiling state or else it will curdle. A wine glass full of brandy is a great improvement but is not absolutely necessary. The wheat takes a long time to get tender, probably four hours. Sago porridge Wash the sago in cold water and boil it in some water, allowing about two tablespoons to every pint. Add pepper and salt and let cold milk be served with the porridge. Milk Toast This is a very useful way of using up stale bread. Toast the bread a light brown, and if by chance any part gets black, scrape it off gently. 
Butter the toast slightly. Layer the toast on the bottom of a soup plate and pour some boiling milk over it. Very little butter should be used, and children often prefer a thin layer of marmalade to butter. End of section 11. Section 12 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 4 Eggs, Savory, and Omelets. Eggs, Plain Boiled. There is an old saying that there is reason in the roasting of eggs. This certainly applies equally to the more common process of boiling them. There are few breakfast delicacies more popular than a new laid egg. There are few breakfast indelicacies more revolting than the doubtful egg which makes its appearance from time to time, and which may be classed under the general heading of shoppins. It is a sad and melancholy reflection that these more than doubtful shoppins were all once new laid. It is impossible to draw any hard and fast line to say at what exact period an egg ceases to be fit for boiling. There is an old tradition, the truth of which we do not endorse, that eggs may arrive at a period when, though they are not fit to be boiled, fried, poached, or hard-boiled, they are still good enough for puddings and pastry. There is no doubt that many good puddings are spoilt because cooks imagine they can use up doubtful eggs. When eggs are more than doubtful, they are often brought up by the smaller pastry cooks in cheap and poor neighborhoods of our large towns, such as the East End of London. These eggs are called spot eggs and are sold at thirty and forty a shilling. They utilize them as follows. They hold the egg up in front of a bright gas light, when the small black spot can be clearly seen. This black spot is kept at the lowest point of the egg i.e. the egg is held so that this black spot is at the bottom the upper part of the egg is then broken and poured off the black spot retained the moment the smallest streak proceeds from this black spot the pouring off process is stopped of course the black part is all thrown away the stench from it being almost intolerable containing as it does sulphuretted hydrogen we mention the fact for what it is worth it would be a bold man who tried to lay down any law as to where waste ceases and the use of wrongful material commences. Everything depends upon the circumstances of the case in question. We fear there are many thousands, hundreds of thousands, in this great city of London whose everyday life more or less compares with that of a shipwrecked crew. They fain would fill their belly with the husks that the swine do eat, but no man gives unto them. There is this to be said in favor of vegetarian diet, that were it universal, grinding poverty would be banished from the earth. We must not cry out too soon about using what some men call bad material. Lord Byron, when he was starving after shipwreck, was glad to make a meal off the paws of his favorite dog, which had been thrown away when the carcass had been used on a former occasion. The simplest way of boiling eggs is to place them at starting in boiling water, and boil them from three to three and a half to four minutes, according to whether they are liked very lightly boiled, medium, or well set. The egg saucepan should be small, so that when the eggs are first plunged in it, takes the water off the boil for a few seconds, otherwise the eggs are likely to crack. This applies more particularly to French eggs, which have thin, brittle shells containing an excess of lime probably due to the large quantity of chalk which is the distinguishing feature of the soil in the pas de calais which is the chief neighborhood from which french eggs are imported over a million eggs are imported from france to england every day notwithstanding the fact that thousands are kept awake by the crying of their neighbors fowls there is a strange delusion among londoners that an egg is not good if it is milky this, of course, is never met with in London, for the simple reason that a milky egg means, as a rule, that it has not been laid more than a few hours. 
for this reason eggs literally hot from the nest are not suitable for making puddings or even omelettes eggs that have been kept one or two days will be found to answer better as they possess more binding properties there is an old-fashioned idea that the best way to boil an egg is to place it in the saucepan in cold water to put the saucepan on the fire and as soon as the water boils the egg is done a very little reflection will show that this entirely depends upon the size of the saucepan and the fierceness of the fire if the saucepan were the size of the egg the water would boil before the egg was hot through on the other hand no one could place an egg in the copper on this principle and then light the copper fire eggs are best boiled in the dining room on the fire or in an ornamental egg boiler by this means we get the eggs hot an occurrence almost unknown in large hotels and big establishments eggs to break whenever you break eggs never mind what quantity always break each egg separately into a cup first see that it is good and then throw it in a basin with the rest one bad egg would spoil fifty supposing you have a dozen or two dozen new laid eggs just taken from the nest it is not an uncommon thing to have one that has been overlooked for weeks and which may be a half-hatched mass of putrefaction eggs fried the first point is to have a clean frying pan which is an article of kitchen furniture very rarely indeed met with in this country for frying eggs and for making omelettes it is essential that the frying pan should never be used for other purposes if you think your frying pan is perfectly clean warm it in front of the fire for half a minute put a clean white cloth over the top of the finger and then rub the inside of the frying pan to fry eggs properly very little butter will be required a little olive oil will answer the same purpose if you have too much fat the white of the eggs are apt to develop into big bubbles or blisters another point is you do not want too fierce a fire fry them very slowly some cooks will almost burn the bottom of the egg before the upper part is set as soon as the white is set round the edge you will often find the yolk not set at all surrounded by a rim of semi-transparent albumen when this is the case it is very often a good plan to take the frying pan off the fire we are presuming the stove is a shut-up one and place it in the oven for a minute or so leaving the oven door open by this means the heat of the oven will set the upper part of the eggs and there is no danger of the bottom part being burnt there is a great art in taking fried eggs out of a frying pan and serving them on a dish fried eggs to look nice should have the yolk in the centre surrounded by a ring of white perfectly round rather more than an inch in breadth take an egg slice in the left hand slide it under each egg separately so that the yolk gets well into the middle of the slice now take a knife in the right hand and trim off the superfluous white by this means you will be able to do it neatly the part trimmed away is virtually refuse of course you do not throw away more than is necessary but take care that the white rim around the yolk is of uniform breadth most cooks take the egg out with their right hand and attempt to trim it with the left the result is about as neat as what would happen were you to attempt to write a letter with your left hand in a hurry very often the appearance of fried eggs is improved by sprinkling over them a few specks of chopped parsley in placing fried eggs on toast place the slice over the toast and draw the slice away do not push the egg on you may break it eggs poached the best kitchen implement to use for poaching eggs is a good large frying pan the mistake is to let the water boil it should only just simmer you should avoid having the white of the egg set too hard we should endeavor to have the eggs look as white as possible in order to ensure this put a few drops of vinegar or lemon juice into the water break the eggs separately into a clip and then turn them very gently into the hot water when they are set fairly firm take them out with an egg slice using the left hand as before and trim them with the right it is not necessary in poached eggs to have a clear yolk surrounded with a white uniform ring poached eggs often look best when the yolk reposes in a sort of pillowcase of white 
before putting them on toast or spinach etc be very careful to drain off the water this is particularly important when the water is acid especially with vinegar eggs hard boiled place the eggs in cold water bring the water to boiling point and let them boil for ten minutes if the hard-boiled eggs are wanted hot put them in cold water for half a minute in order that you may remove the shells without burning your fingers if the eggs are required cold it is best not to remove the shells till just before they are wanted but if they have to be served cold similar to what we meet with at railway refreshment rooms let them be served cold whole if you cut a hard-boiled egg the yolk very soon gets discolored and brown round the edge shrivels up and becomes most unappetizing in appearance eggs curried take some hard-boiled eggs cut them in halves remove the half yolks and cut them in rings place all these rings round the edge of the dish and pile the white rings up to make a sort of border pour some thick curry sauce in the middle place the half yolks at equal distances apart on the white round the edge and sprinkle a few specks of green parsley round the edge on the whites this will give the dish a pretty appearance eggs deviled take say half a dozen eggs boil them hard remove the shells while hot cut them in halves scoop out the yolk and cut a tiny piece off the bottom of each white cup so that it will stand upright a la columbus next take all the yolks and put them in a basin and pound them with a little butter till you get a thick squash add some cayenne pepper according to taste a little white pepper a little salt and a few drops of chili vinegar or ordinary vinegar you can also add a little finely chopped parsley say a teaspoonful fill each cup with some of the mixture and as there will be more than enough to fill them owing to the butter bring them to a point like a cone deviled eggs are best served cold in which case they look best placed on a silver or ordinary dish the bottom of which is covered with green parsley the white looks best on a green bed some cooks chop up the little bits of white cut off from the bottom of the cups divide them in two portions and color one half pink by shaking them in a saucer with a few drops of cochineal these white and pink specks are then sprinkled over the parsley n b in an ordinary way deviled eggs require anchovy sauce to be mixed with the yolks but anchovy sauce is not allowed in vegetarian cookery eggs a la bonne femme proceed exactly as in making deviled eggs till you place the yolks in the basin then add to these yolks while hot a little dissolved butter and small pieces of chopped cold boiled carrot turnip celery and beetroot season with white pepper and salt and mix well together add also a suspicion of nutmeg and a little lemon juice fill the cups with this while the mixture is moist as when the butter gets cold the mixture gets firm if you use chopped beetroot as well as other vegetables it is best to fill half the cups with half the mixture before any beetroot is added then add the beetroot and stir the mixture well up and it will turn a bright red now fill the remaining half of the cups and place them on the dish containing the parsley alternately the red contrasts prettily with the light yellowish white of the first half do not color the white specks with cochineal as this is a different shade of red from the beetroot you can chop up the white and sprinkle it over the parsley with a little chopped beetroot as well eggs a la tripe small spanish onions are perhaps best for this dish but ordinary onions can be used cut the onions crossways after peeling them so that they fall in rings and remove the white core two spanish or half a dozen ordinary onions will be sufficient fry these rings of onions in butter till they are tender without browning them take them out of the frying pan and put them aside add a spoonful of flour to the frying pan and make a paste with the butter and then add sufficient milk so that when it is boiled and stirred up it makes a thick sauce add pepper and salt a little lemon juice and a small quantity of grated nutmeg put back the rings of onions into this and let them simmer gently take half a dozen hard-boiled eggs cut the eggs in halves remove the yolks and cut the whites into rings like the onions 
mixing these white egg rings with the onions and sauce make the whole hot and serve on a dish using the hard-boiled half yolks to garnish sprinkle a little chopped parsley over the whole and serve egg forcemeat of or egg balls take three hard-boiled yolks of eggs powder them mix in a raw yolk add a little pepper and salt a small quantity of grated nutmeg about a saltspoonful of finely chopped parsley chopped up with a pinch of savory herbs or a pinch of dust from bottled savory herbs sifted from them may be added instead roll these into balls not bigger than a very small marble flour them and throw them into boiling water till they are set in many parts of the continent hard-boiled yolks of eggs served whole are used as egg balls a much cheaper way of making egg balls is as follows beat up one egg add a teaspoonful of chopped blanched parsley some pepper and salt and a very little grated nutmeg sift a bottle of ordinary mixed savory herbs in a sieve and take about half a saltspoonful of the dust and mix this with the egg this will be found really better than using the herbs themselves now make some very fine bread crumbs from stale bread and mix these with the beaten up egg till you make a sort of soft paste or dough roll this into balls the size of a marble flour them and throw them in boiling water the balls must be small or they will split in boiling eggs au gratin make about half a pint of butter sauce make it hot over the fire and stir in about two ounces of parmesan cheese a quarter of a nutmeg grated some white pepper and the juice of half a lemon make this hot and then add the yolks of four eggs stir it all up and keep stirring very quickly till the mixture begins to thicken when you must instantly remove it from the fire but continue stirring for another minute in the meantime have ready some hard-boiled eggs cut these into slices and make a circle of the bigger slices on a disc then spread a layer of the mixture over the slices of egg and place another layer on this smaller than the one below then another layer of mixture and so on with alternate layers till you pile it up in the shape of a pyramid spread a layer of the remainder of the mixture over the surface and sprinkle some powdered light-colored bread raspings mixed with some grated parmesan cheese over the whole place the dish in the oven to get hot and to slightly brown and then serve some fried bread cut into pretty shapes can be used to ornament the base eggs and spinach make a thick puree of spinach take some hard-boiled eggs cut them in halves while hot after removing the shells and press each half a little way into the puree so that the yellow yolk will be shown surrounded by the white ring be very careful not to smear the edge with the spinach n b sometimes eggs are poached and laid on the spinach whole eggs and turnip tops proceed exactly as above using a puree of turnip tops instead of spinach eggs and asparagus have ready some of the green parts of asparagus boil tender and cut up into little pieces an eighth of an inch long so that they look like peas beat up four eggs very thoroughly with some pepper and salt and mix in the asparagus only do not break the pieces of green melt a couple of ounces of butter in a small stew pan and as soon as it commences to froth pour in the beaten up egg and asparagus stir the mixture quickly over the fire being careful to scrape the bottom of the saucepan as soon as the mixture thickens pour it on some hot toast and serve eggs and celery have ready some stewed celery on toast see celery stewed poach some eggs and place them on the top hard-boiled eggs cut into slices can be added to the celery instead of poached eggs when stewed celery is served as a course by itself the addition of the eggs and plenty of bread make it a wholesome and satisfying meal egg salad see salads egg sandwiches see sandwiches egg sauce see sauces egg toast beat up a couple of eggs melt an ounce of butter in a saucepan and add to it a little pepper and salt as soon as the butter begins to froth add the beaten up egg and stir the mixture very quickly and the moment it begins to thicken pour it over a slice of hot buttered toast eggs a la dauphine take ten hard-boiled eggs 
cut them in halves and remove the yolks and place the yolks in a basin with a piece of new bread about as big as the fist that has been soaked in some milk or better still cream add a teaspoonful of chopped parsley a quarter of a grated nutmeg and two ounces of grated parmesan cheese rub the whole well together and then add two whole eggs well beaten up to the mixture to moisten it next fill all these white cups of eggs with some of this mixture place the eggs well together and spread a thin layer of the mixture over the top then take a smaller number of half eggs filled and place on the top and make a pyramid so that a single half egg is at the top you can place ten half eggs at the bottom in one layer six half eggs on the top of these spreading a thin layer of the mixture then three half eggs one more layer of the mixture and then one half egg at the summit this dish is sometimes ornamented by forcing hard-boiled yolks of eggs through a wire sieve it falls like yellow vermicelli into threads this dish should be placed in the oven to be made quite hot and some kind of white sauce should be poured round the edge eggs and black butter fry some eggs serve them up on a hot dish and pour some black butter round the base see black butter sauce eggs and garlic this is better adapted for an italian than an english palate take half a dozen heads of garlic and fry them in a little butter in order to remove the rankness of flavor take them out and pound them in a mortar with rather more than a tablespoonful of oil heat this on the fire in a stew pan after adding some pepper and salt beat up an egg and stir this in with the oil and garlic till the mixture gets thick arrange some slices of hard-boiled eggs four eggs would be sufficient pour this mixture in the center and serve eggs with mushrooms take half a pint of button mushrooms and if fresh peel them and throw them instantly into water made acid with lemon juice in order that they may not turn a bad color in the meantime slice up a good-sized spanish onion and fry the onion in a little butter as soon as the onion is a little tender chop up and add the mushrooms put all this into a stew pan with a little butter sauce or a little water can be added and then thickened with a little butter and flour let this simmer gently for nearly half an hour add a little made mustard pepper and salt and a dessert spoonful of vinegar before sending to table add half a dozen hard-boiled eggs the whites should be cut into rings and should be only put in the sauce long enough to get hot the yolks should be kept separate but must be warmed up in the sauce eggs and onions cut up a large spanish onion in slices and fry it in some butter till it is a light brown and tender but do not let it burn drain off the butter and put the fried onion on a dish sprinkle some cayenne pepper and a little salt over the onions and squeeze the juice of a whole lemon over it now poach some eggs and serve them on top of the onion eggs and potatoes take the remains of some floury potatoes beat up an egg and mix the potato flour with the egg you can also chop up very finely a small quantity of onion and parsley and season with plenty of pepper and salt the respective quantities of floury potatoes and beaten egg must be so regulated that you can roll the mixture into balls without their having any tendency to break make the balls big enough so that when you press them between the hands you can squeeze the ball into the shape of an ordinary egg or you can mold them into the shape with a tablespoon now flour these imitation eggs in order to dry the surface and then dip them into well beaten up egg and cover them with dried bread crumbs and fry them in a little butter or oil or brown them in the oven occasionally basting them with a little butter eggs and sauce robert take some hard-boiled eggs cut them into quarters and make them hot in some sauce robert see robert sauce and serve with fried or toasted bread in a dish eggs and sorrel make a thick puree of sorrel see sorrel sauce and serve some hard-boiled or poached eggs on the top eggs broiled cut a large slice of crumb of bread off a big loaf toast it lightly put some pieces of butter on it and put it on a dish in front of the fire then break some eggs carefully on to the toast and let them set from the heat of the fire like a joint roasting 
when the side nearest the fire gets set it will be necessary to turn the dish round when the whole has set squeeze the juice of an orange over the eggs and a little grated nutmeg may be added the eggs and toast should be served in the same dish in which they are baked eggs buttered break some eggs into a flat dish then take a little butter and make it hot in a frying pan till it frizzles and begins to turn brown now pour this very hot butter which is hotter than boiling water over the eggs in the dish put the dish in the oven a short time and finish off setting the yolks with a red-hot salamander eggs scrambled scrambled eggs when finished properly should have the appearance of yellow and white streaks distinct in color but yet all joined together in one mass melt a little butter in the frying pan break in some eggs as if for frying of course the whites begin to set before the yolks as soon as the whites are nearly but not quite set stir the whole together till the whole mass sets by this means you will get yellow and white streaks joined together it is very important that you do not let the eggs get brown at the bottom you will therefore require a perfectly clean frying pan and not too fierce a fire eggs in sunshine this is a name given to fried eggs with tomato served on the top you want a dish that will stand the heat consequently take an oval baking tin or enamel dish that you can put on the top of a shut-up stove melt a little butter in this and as soon as it begins to frizzle break some eggs into the dish and let them all set together as soon as they are set pour four or five tablespoonfuls of tomato conserve on the top this is much better than tomato sauce which contains vinegar or you can bake half a dozen ripe tomatoes in a tin in the oven and place these on the top instead of the tomato conserve eggs and cucumber peel and slice up two or three little cucumbers of the size generally sold on a barrow at a penny each put these with two or three ounces of butter in a stew pan and three small onions about the size of the top of the thumb chop very fine fry these and add a dessert spoonful of vinegar when the cucumber is tender and a little time has been allowed for the vinegar to evaporate add six hard-boiled eggs cut into slices make these very hot and serve pepper and salt must be added eggs with cheese take a quarter of a pound of grated cheese the cheese should be dry and white melt this cheese gently in a stew pan over the fire with a little bit of butter about as big as the thumb in order to assist the cheese in melting mix with it a brimming teaspoonful of chopped parsley two or three tiny spring onions chopped very fine and about a quarter of a small grated nutmeg when the cheese is melted add six beaten up eggs and stir the whole together till they are set fried or toasted bread should be served round the edge of the dish little eggs for garnishing this is a nice dish when you require a lot of white of eggs for other purposes such as icing a wedding cake or making light vanilla or almond biscuits take six hard-boiled yolks powder them flavor with a little pepper and salt and mix in three raw yolks mix this well together and roll them into shapes like very small sausages pointed at each end like a foreign cigar flour these on the outside and throw them into boiling water these can be used for garnishing purposes for the vast majority of vegetarian dishes they can be flavored if wished with grated nutmeg chopped parsley and a few savory herbs end of section twelve section thirteen of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter four omelettes it is a strange fact but not the less true that to get a well-made omelette in a private house in this country is the exception and not the rule a few general remarks on making omelettes will we hope not be out of place in writing a book on an exceptional style of cookery in which omelettes should play a most important part first of all we require an omelette pan and for this purpose the cheaper the frying pan the better 
the best omelet pan of all is a copper one tinned inside copper conveys heat quicker than almost any other metal consequently if we use an ordinary frying pan the thinner it is the quicker will heat be conveyed it is very essential that the frying pan be absolutely clean and it will be found almost essential to reserve the omelet pan for omelets only a frying pan that is cooked meat should not be used for the purpose and although in vegetarian cookery a frying pan has not been used in this manner we should still avoid one in which onions or vegetables or even black butter has been made the inside of an omelet pan should always look as if it had only just left the ironmonger's shop the next great question is how much butter should be allowed for say six eggs on this point the greatest authorities differ we will first quote our authorities and then attempt to give an explanation that reconciles the difference a plain omelet may be roughly described as settings of eggs well beaten up by stirring them up in hot butter one of the oldest cookery books we can call to mind is entitled the experienced english housekeeper by elizabeth ruffald the book which was published in seventeen seventy five is dedicated to the honourable lady elizabeth warburton whom the author has formerly served as housekeeper the recipe is entitled to make an amulet the book states put a quarter of a pound of butter into a frying pan break six eggs francatelli also gives four ounces of butter to six eggs on the other hand sawyer the great cook gives two ounces of butter to six eggs so also does the equally great louis eustache oud cook to louis the sixteenth we may add that cassell's dictionary of cookery recommended two ounces of butter to six eggs while cassell's shilling cookery recommends four eggs the probable reason why two such undoubtedly great authorities as sawyer and francatelli should differ is that in making one kind of omelet you would use less butter than in making another francatelli wrote for what may be described as that high-class cooking suited for pall mall clubs where no one better than himself knew how best to raise the jaded appetite of a wealthy epicure sawyer's book was written for the people there are two kinds of omelets one in which the egg is scarcely beaten at all and in which when cooked the egg appears set in long streaks there is also the richer omelet which is sent to table more resembling a light pudding for the former of these omelets two ounces of butter will suffice for six eggs for the latter of these you will require four ounces of butter or else the omelet will be leathery in holland belgium and germany and in country villages in france the omelet is made as a rule with six eggs to two ounces of butter it comes up like eggs that have been set in the higher class restaurants in paris like bignons or the cafe anglaise the omelet is lighter and probably about four ounces of butter would be used to six eggs this probably explains the different directions given in various cookery books for making omelets omelet plain melt four ounces of butter in a frying pan heat up eggs till they froth add a little pepper and salt pour the beaten up eggs into the frying pan as soon as the butter begins to frizzle and with a tablespoon keep scraping the bottom of the frying pan in every part not forgetting the edge gradually the mixture becomes lumpy still go on scraping till about two-thirds or more are lumpy and the rest liquid now slacken the heat slightly by lifting the frying pan from the fire and push the omelet into half the frying pan so that it is in the shape of a semicircle by this time probably it will be nearly set take the frying pan off the fire and hold it in a slanting direction in front of the fire when the omelet is set as it will quickly do slide off the omelet from the frying pan on to a hot dish with an egg slice and serve omelet plain another way put two ounces of butter into a frying pan break six eggs into a basin with a little pepper and salt and beat them very slightly so that the yolks and whites are quite mixed into one but do not beat them more than you can help and do not let the eggs froth as soon as the butter frizzles pour in the beaten eggs scrape the frying pan quickly with a spoon in every part till the mixture gets lumpy now slacken the heat if the fire is fierce and let the mixture set in the frying pan like a pancake as soon as it is nearly set 
with perhaps only a dessert spoonful of liquid left unset turn the omelet over one half onto the other half in the shape of a semicircle and bring the spoonful of unset fluid to join them over the edge slide off the omelet onto a hot dish with an egg slice omelet with fine herb chop up a dessert spoonful of parsley and add a good pinch of powdered savory herbs add these with pepper and salt to the six beaten up eggs in a basin beat up the eggs either slightly or very thoroughly according to whether you use two ounces of butter or four proceed in every respect in making the omelet as directed for plain omelet above omelet with onion proceed exactly as in the above recipe only adding to the chopped parsley a piece of onion or shallot about as big as the top of the thumb down to the first joint also very finely chopped when onion is used in making an omelet a little extra pepper should be added omelet with cheese proceed as if making an ordinary omelet with four ounces of butter add to the six well beaten up eggs about four ounces of grated parmesan cheese a small quantity of cream will be found a great improvement to this omelet a little pepper and salt must of course be added as well potato omelet mix three ounces of a floury potato with six eggs a little pepper and salt and half a pint of milk and make the milk boil and then stand for a couple of minutes before it is mixed with the eggs pour this mixture into three or four ounces of butter and proceed as in making an ordinary omelet potato omelet sweet proceed exactly as above only instead of adding pepper and salt mix in a brimming tablespoonful of finely powdered sugar the juice of a lemon with half a grated nutmeg cheese souffle to make a small cheese souffle in a round cake tin proceed as follows make the tin very hot in the oven put in about an ounce of butter so as to make the tin oily in every part inside the tin must be tilted so that the butter pours round the sides of the tin as well as the bottom take two eggs separate the yolks from the whites and beat the whites to a stiff froth beat up the two yolks very thoroughly with a quarter of a pint of milk add to this two tablespoonfuls of grated parmesan cheese add this mixture to the beaten up whites and mix the whole carefully together now pour this mixture into the hot buttered tin which should be five or six inches deep and bake it in the oven the mixture will rise to five or six times its original depth as soon as it is done run with the souffle from the oven door to the dining room door however quick you may be the souffle will probably sink an inch on the way some cooks wrap hot flannel on the outside of the tin to keep up the heat if you have a folded dinner napkin round the tin for appearance sake as is usually the case fold the napkin before you make the souffle and make the napkin sufficiently big round that it can be dropped over the tin in an instant the napkin should be pinned and be quite half an inch in diameter bigger than the width of the tin this is to save time delay in serving the souffle is fatal omelet souffle sweet in making an omelet souffle sweet you can proceed in exactly the same manner as making a cheese souffle with the exception that you add two tablespoonfuls of powdered sugar instead of two tablespoonfuls of grated cheese the omelet will however require flavoring of some kind the two most delicate being vanilla and orange flower water you can flavor it with lemon by rubbing a few lumps of sugar on the outside of a lemon and then pounding this with the powdered sugar it must be pounded very thoroughly and mixed very carefully or else one part of the omelet will taste stronger of lemon than the other some powdered sugar should be shaken over the top of the souffle just before serving omelet souffle another way when a souffle is made on a larger scale and served up on a flat dish it is best to proceed as follows take six ounces of powdered sugar and mix them with six yolks of eggs and a dessert spoonful of flour and a pinch of salt to this must be added whatever flavoring is used such as vanilla this is all mixed together till it is perfectly smooth next beat the six whites to a very stiff froth mix this in with the batter lightly put two ounces of butter into an omelet pan and as soon as the butter begins to frizzle pour in the mixture as it begins to set round the edges turn it over and heap it up in the middle and then slide the omelet off onto a plated edged baking dish 
which must be well buttered put it in the oven for about a quarter of an hour to let it rise shake some powdered sugar over the top and serve very quickly omelette sweet make an ordinary plain omelette with six eggs and either two or four ounces of butter as directed for making omelette plain instead of adding pepper and salt to the beaten up eggs add one or two tablespoonfuls of finely powdered sugar at the last moment sprinkle a little powdered sugar over the omelette and just glaze the sugar with a red-hot salamander omelette with jam make a plain sweet omelette as directed above adding rather less sugar about half if you make the omelette with two ounces of butter and turn it over put a couple of tablespoonfuls of jam on the omelette and turn the half over the jam it is best to put the jam in the oven for a minute or two to take the chill off if you make the omelette with four ounces of butter you must put the jam by the side of the omelette and let the thin part of the omelette cover it the question what jam is best for sweet omelette is purely a matter of taste most good judges consider that apricot jam is the best and if the sweet omelette itself be flavored with a little essence of vanilla the result is generally considered one of the nicest sweets that can be sent to table strawberry jam especially if some of the strawberries are whole is also very nice the objection to raspberry jam is the pips a most delicious omelette can be made by chopping up some preserved slices of pineapple and placing this in the omelette and making the pineapple syrup hot and pouring it round the base red currant jelly black currant jam and plum jam can all be used one of the cheapest and in the opinion of many the best sweet omelets can be made with six eggs two ounces of butter and three or four tablespoonfuls of orange marmalade in this case it will cost no more to rub a few lumps of sugar on the outside of an orange and pound these with the powdered sugar you use to sweeten the omelet if the marmalade is liquid as it often is one or two tablespoonfuls of the juice can be poured round the edge of the omelet omelet au rum as a rule spirits are not allowed in vegetarian cookery an omelet au rum is simply a sweet omelet plain with plenty of powdered sugar sprinkled over the top with some rum ignited poured over it just before it is sent to table the way to ignite the rum is to fill a large spoon like a gravy spoon and hold a lighted wooden taper not wax it tastes underneath the spoon till the rum lights the dish should be hot it may be a consolation to teetotalers to reflect that the fact of burning the rum causes all the alcohol to evaporate and there is nothing left but the flavor omelette au kirsch proceed as above substituting kirschwasser for rum omelette vegetable a plain omelet can also be served with any puree of vegetables so that we can have asparagus omelet artichoke omelet french bean omelet celery omelet spinach omelet mushroom omelet tomato omelet etc End of section 13。section 14 of Castle's Vegetarian Cookery。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Castle's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 5. Salads and Sandwiches Salads and Sandwiches Probably the most patriotic Englishman will admit that, on the subject of salads, we can learn something from the French. During the last half-century, a great improvement has taken place on this point in this country. Many years ago, it was the fashion to dress an English lettuce, resembling in shape an old umbrella, with a mixture of brown sugar, milk, mustard, and even anchovy and Worcester sauce, and then add a few drops of oil, as if it was some dangerous poison, like prussic acid, not to be tampered with lightly. The old-fashioned lettuces were so hard and crisp that it was difficult to chew them without making a noise somewhat similar to walking on a shingly beach. In modern days, however, we have arrived at a stage of civilization in which, as a rule, we use soft French lettuces instead of the hard gingham-shaped vegetables, which somehow or other our grandfathers ate for supper with a whole lobster, seasoned with about half a pint of vinegar, and then slept none the worse for the performance. 
The first point for consideration, if we wish to have a good salad, is to have the lettuces crisp and dry. Old-fashioned French cookery books direct that the lettuce should never be washed. The stalks should be cut off, the outside leaves removed and thrown away, and the lettuce itself should then be pulled in pieces with the fingers and each piece wiped with a clean cloth. This is not always practicable, but the principle remains the same. You can wash the lettuce leaves without bruising them. You can dry them by shaking them up lightly in a large clean cloth, and you can spread them out and let them get dry an hour or two before they are dressed. Another important point to be borne in mind is that a salad should never be dressed till just before it is wanted to be eaten. If by chance you put by the remains of a dressed salad, it is good for nothing the next morning. Finally, the oil must be pure olive oil of the best quality, and to ensure this, it should bear the name of some well-known firm. A good deal of the oil sold simply as salad oil, bearing no name, is adulterated, sometimes with cottonseed oil. Salad, French lettuce, plain. Clean one or more French lettuces, throw away all the leaves that are decayed or bruised, place these in a salad bowl, and, supposing we have sufficient for two persons, dress the salad as follows. Put a salt spoonful of salt and half a salt spoonful of pepper into a tablespoon. Fill the tablespoon up with oil, stir the pepper and salt up with a fork, and pour it over the lettuce. Now add another tablespoonful of oil, and then toss the lettuce leaves lightly together with a spoon and fork. Allow one tablespoonful of oil to each person. This salad would suffice for two. Be sure and mix the lettuce and oil well together before you add any vinegar. The reason of this is that if you add the vinegar first, it would soak into the lettuce leaves, making one part more acid than another. Having well mixed up the lettuce and oil, add half a tablespoonful of vinegar, mix it once more, and the salad is dressed. In France, they always add to the lettuce before it is dressed two or three finely chopped fresh tarragon leaves. Dried tarragon can be used, but it is not equal to fresh. If you have no tarragon, it is a great improvement to use tarragon vinegar instead of ordinary vinegar. Tarragon vinegar is sold by all grocers at six pence per bottle. It is also often customary to rub the salad bowl with a bead of garlic or rub a piece of crust of bread with garlic and toss this piece of crust up with the salad after it has been dressed. Garlic should never be chopped up, but only used as stated above. A good French salad is also always decorated with one or more hard-boiled eggs, cut into quarters long ways. These are placed on the top of the lettuce. Salad, English, lettuce. The ordinary English salad is made either with French or English lettuces, and is generally dressed as follows. One or two tablespoonfuls of cream or milk a teaspoonful of made mustard, two tablespoonfuls of vinegar, pepper, and salt. There are many people still living in remote parts of the country who prefer this style of dressing. Salad, English, mixed. The old-fashioned English mixed salad generally consisted of English lettuce cut up into strips crossways, to which was added mustard and cress, boiled beetroot, chopped celery, spring onions, radishes, and watercress. It is by no means a bad mixture when dressed with oil, and of course it can be dressed at a l'anglaise. It makes an excellent accompaniment to a huge hunk of cheese, a crusty loaf, a good appetite, and a better digestion. Salad, mayonnaise. This is generally considered the king of salads, and it can be made an exceedingly pretty-looking dish. Take two or more French lettuces, Clean and dry them as directed above, and take the small heart of one lettuce about the size of a small walnut, uncut from the stalk, so that you can stand it upright in the middle of the salad, raised above the surface. Arrange all the softer parts of the leaves on the top of the salad, so as to make as much as possible a smooth surface. Make some mayonnaise sauce, thick enough to be spread like butter, and mass this little mound in all the surface of the middle of the salad. Round it with a thin layer of the sauce so that it looks like the top of a mold of solid custard. Ornament the edge of the salad with hard-boiled eggs cut in quarters and place between the quarter slices of pickled gherkins and stoned olives. 
Take a small teaspoonful of French capers, dry them on a cloth, and sprinkle a few of them about an inch apart on the white surface. Next, chop up very finely about half a teaspoonful of parsley and see that this doesn't stick together in lumps. Place this on the end of a knife and flip the knife so that the little green specks of parsley fall on the white surface. Next, take about half a salt spoonful of finely crumbled bread and shake these in a saucer with one or two drops of cochineal. This will colour them a bright red and they will have all the appearance of lobster corral. Place these red breadcrumbs on the end of a knife and let them fall over the white surface like the parsley. The little red and green specks on the white background make the dish look exceedingly pretty. Before mixing the salad all together, add a tablespoonful of tarragon vinegar or lemon juice. Tomato salad. For making tomato salad, you require red ripe tomatoes. The smoother they are, the better. But the chief points are very ripe and very red. Never use those pink crinkly tomatoes which look something like milk stained with plum juice. If tomatoes are picked unripe and then allowed to ripen afterwards, they become rotten and worthless. Slice up half a dozen or more tomatoes. Sometimes they'll be necessary to remove the core and pips, sometimes not. Add a little oil, a little vinegar, and some pepper and salt. Tomato salad is one of the few that are very nice without any oil at all. Of course, this is a matter of taste. Some persons slice up a few onions and add to the tomatoes. In addition to this, you can add some slices of cold potatoes. In this latter case, heap the potatoes up in the middle of the dish in the shape of a dome, sprinkle some chopped parsley over the potatoes, put a border of sliced onion round the base, and then a border of sliced tomato outside that. This makes the dish look pretty. Many persons rub the dish or salad bowl with a bead of garlic. This is quite sufficient to flavour the salad, but never chop garlic for salads. Egg salad Egg salad consists of an ordinary salad made with French lettuces with an extra quantity of hard-boiled eggs. If you want to make the salad look very pretty on the top, cut up the lettuces and dress them with oil and vinegar in the ordinary way. Make the tops of the lettuces, which should be placed in a round salad bowl, as smooth as you can without pressing them down unnecessarily. Now take six hard-boiled eggs, separate the yolks from the whites, powder the yolks and chop up the whites small. Sprinkle a ring of yellow round the edge of the salad bowl, say an inch in width, then put a ring of white round and place the remainder of yolk in the middle, almost up to the centre. Have the centre about two inches in diameter. We now have a yellow centre surrounded by a broad white rim, as of course there is more white than yellow, and an outside yellow ring which meets the white china bowl. Reserve about a teaspoonful of pieces of finely chopped white and put them in a saucer, with a few drops of cochineal, and shake them. This turns them a bright red. Sprinkle these red specks very sparingly on the white, and take about half a teaspoonful of chopped blanched parsley and sprinkle these green specks on the yellow. This makes the dish look pretty. German salad. German salad is made from cold boiled vegetables chopped up. In Germany, it is made, according to English ideas, from every vegetable you have ever heard of mixed with a number of vegetables you have never heard of. In England, it can be made by chopping up boiled carrot, turnip, cabbage, cauliflower, potato, French beans, Brussels sprouts, or celery, raw onion, raw apple, etc. In fact, in making this vegetable salad, the motto should be, the more the merrier. In addition to this, you'll find that they add what is known as sauerkraut. This latter is not adapted as a rule to English palates. The salad is mixed with oil and vinegar in the ordinary way, the Germans adding much more vinegar than we should care for in this country. The salad is decorated at the finish with boiled beetroot. It is very pretty to cut the beetroot into triangles, the base of the triangle touching the edge of the salad bowl, the point of the triangle pointing inwards. Gut a star out of a good slice of beetroot and place it in the centre of the bowl. Sprinkle a little chopped blanched parsley over the surface of the mixed vegetables. Endive salad. 
Endives come into season long before lettuces and are much used abroad for making salads. The drawback to endive is that it is tough and the simple remedy is to boil it. Take three or four white hot endives, throw them into boiling water slightly salted. When they get tender, take them out and instantly throw them into cold water, by which means you preserve their colour. When quite cold, take them out again, drain them, dry them thoroughly and pull them to pieces with the fingers. Now place them in a salad bowl, keeping the whitest part as much as possible at the top. Place some hard-boiled eggs round the edge and sprinkle a little chopped blanched parsley over the white endive. You can, if you like, put a few spikes of red beetroot between the quarters of eggs. It is a great improvement to rub the salad bowl with a bead of garlic, or you can rub a crust of bread with a bead of garlic and toss this lightly about in the salad when you mix it. Salsify Salad Boiled salsify makes a very delicious salad. Take some white salsify, scrape it, and instantly throw it into vinegar and water, by which means you will keep it a pure white. Then, when you have all ready, throw it into boiling water, slightly salted. Boil it till it is tender. Throw it into cold water, and when cold, take it out, drain it, and dry it. Cut it up into small half-inch pieces, or put it in whole in sticks into a salad bowl. Sprinkle a little chopped blanched parsley over the top. Dress in the ordinary way with oil and white French vinegar, and be sure to use white pepper, not black. If white wine vinegar is objected to, the juice of a hard fresh lemon is equally good, if not better. Potato Salad Potato salad is generally made from the remains of cold boiled potatoes. Of course, potatoes can be boiled on purpose, in which case they should be allowed to get cold in the water in which they were boiled. New potatoes are far better for the purpose than old. Cut the potatoes into slices and place them in a salad bowl with a little finely chopped blanched parsley. You can also add some finely chopped onion or shallot. If you do not add these, you can rub the bowl with a bead of garlic. Sprinkle some more chopped parsley over the top of the salad and ornament the edge of the bowl with some thin slices of pickled gherkins. A few stoned olives can also be added. Dress the salad with oil and vinegar in the ordinary way. Asparagus Salad Cold asparagus makes a most delicious salad. It is needless, perhaps, to say it is made from cold boiled asparagus. The best dressing for asparagus salad is somewhat peculiar and is made as follows. Take, say, an ounce of butter, put it in a saucer, and melt it in the oven till it is like oil. Now mix in a teaspoonful of made mustard, some pepper, salt, and a dessert spoonful of vinegar. Stir it all together, and as it gets cold, it will begin to get thick. Dip all the green part of the asparagus in this, and lay the heads gently without breaking them in a vegetable dish, with the white stalk resting on the edge of the dish, and the green part in the middle. Let the salad get perfectly cold and then serve. Of course, the sauce clings to the asparagus. The asparagus is eaten with the fingers like hot asparagus, a custom now generally recognised. Artichoke salad. This applies to French artichokes, not Jerusalem. In France, artichokes are often served raw for breakfast, on a plate with a little heap of chopped raw onion and another heap of chopped capers or parsley. The Frenchman mixes a little oil or vinegar on his plate, adding the onion, etc., according to his taste. The leaves are pulled off one by one, the white stalk part dipped in this dressing and then eaten by being drawn through the teeth. The artichoke bottom is reserved for the finish as a bon bouche, something like a schoolboy who would eat all the pastry round a jam tart, leaving the centre for the finale. Beetroot Salad in boiling beetroots, be careful not to break them, or else they will bleed and lose their colour. When the beetroot is boiled and cold, peel it and cut it into thin slices. It can be dressed with oil and vinegar, or vinegar only, adding pepper and salt. Some persons dress beetroot with a salad dressing in which cream is used instead of oil, but never use cream and oil. To mix cream and oil is like mixing bacon with butter. Cucumber Salad Peel a cucumber and cut it into slices as thin as possible. We might almost add thinner if possible. 
mix it with a little salt and let it stand, tossing the cucumber about every now and then. By this means you extract all the water from the cucumber. Drain off this water and add plenty of oil to the cucumber and then mix it so that every slice comes in contact with the oil. Now add a little pepper and a very little vinegar and mix it thoroughly. If you add vinegar to cucumber before the oil, some of the slices will taste like sour pickle as the vinegar soaks into the cucumber. Cucumber should be always served very cold and is best placed in an ice chest for an hour before serving. Some people put a piece of ice on the top of the cucumber. French bean salad. Cold boiled French beans make a very nice salad. A little chopped parsley should be mixed with them and the salad bowl can be rubbed with a bead of garlic. Some people soak the beans in vinegar first and then add oil. This would suit a German palate. A better plan is to add the oil first with pepper and salt, mix all well together and then add the vinegar. Bean salad. Cold boiled broad beans make a very nice salad. Rub off the skin so that only the green part is put in the salad bowl. Rub the bowl with garlic, add a little chopped parsley, then oil, pepper and salt, mix well and add vinegar last of all. Haricot bean salad. This can be made from cold boiled dried white haricot beans. Add plenty of chopped parsley, rub the bowl with garlic, mix oil, pepper and salt first, vinegar afterwards. The nicest haricot bean salad is made from the fresh green beans met with abroad. They can be obtained in this country in tins, and a delicious salad can be had at a moment's notice by opening a tin, straining off the liquor, and drying the little green beans, which are very soft and tender, and dressing them with oil and vinegar in the ordinary way. A little chopped parsley or garlic flavoring by rubbing the bowl can be added or not, according to taste. Celery and Beetroot Salad A mixture of celery and beetroot makes a very nice winter salad. The beetroot, of course, is boiled, and the celery generally sliced up thin in a raw state. It is a great improvement to boil the celery till it is nearly tender. By this means you improve the salad, and the celery assists in making vegetarian stock. Watercress Watercress is sometimes mixed with other salad, but when eaten alone requires no dressing, but only a little salt. Dandelion Leaf Salad Considering that the root of the dandelion is so largely used in medicine for making taraxacum, it is to be regretted that the leaves of the plant are not utilised in this country as they are abroad for making salad. These leaves can be obtained in London at a few shops in the French colony of Soho. The leaves are washed, dried, placed in a salad bowl and dressed with oil and vinegar in the ordinary way. Cauliflower Salad The remains of a cold boiled cauliflower makes a very good salad if only the white part be used. It can be mixed with the remains of cold potatoes, some chopped blanched parsley should be sprinkled over the top, and it can be dressed with oil and vinegar in the ordinary way, or it can be served up with a sauce made from oiled butter, similar to that described for dressing cold asparagus. Mustard and Cress This is somewhat similar to watercress. When served alone, it is generally dipped in salt and eaten with bread and butter, but it is very useful to mix with other kinds of salad. Hop Salad In Germany, a very nice salad is made from young hops, which are grown very extensively in America and Germany, as English brewers are well aware. The hops are picked when quite young before they get leafy. They are then boiled till nearly tender. They can be dressed in the English fashion with oil and vinegar, or in the German fashion with vinegar and sugar. Onion salad. Few people are aware of what an excellent salad can be made from the remains of cold boiled Spanish onions. Spanish onions can generally be bought at a penny a pound. They are mild in flavor, very wholesome, and contain a great deal of nourishment. Take a couple of cold boiled Spanish onions, pull them into leaves after they are quite dry, and dress them with a very little oil and vinegar. Italian salad. This is a very delicious salad met with in Italy. It consists of a great variety of boiled vegetables, which are placed in a mold and served in aspic jelly. This latter, however, is not allowed in vegetarian cookery. A very good imitation, however, can be made as follows. 
First, take as many cold vegetables as you can, consisting of new potatoes, sliced and cut up with a cutter into pretty looking shapes. You can also take green peas, asparagus tops, cold boiled cauliflower, French beans, beetroot, etc. These vegetables should be dressed with a little oil, tarragon vinegar, pepper and salt, and can be placed in a mold or plain round basin. This basin can now be filled up with a little water, thickened with corn flour, hot. When it is cold, it can be turned out and sent to table in the shape of a mold. Melon Salad Melon is sometimes served abroad as a salad, and a slice of melon is often sent to table at the commencement of dinner to be eaten with a little salt, cayenne pepper, and sometimes oil and vinegar. Salads Sweet Apples, oranges, currants, pineapple, and bananas are sometimes served as salads with syrup and sugar. They make a very nice mixture or can be served separately. When preserved pineapples and tins are used for the purpose, the syrup in the tin should be used for dressing the salad. Whole ripe strawberries are a great improvement, as also a wine glass full of brandy and a lump of ice. Sandwiches There is an art in cutting sandwiches, a fact which persons in the habit of frequenting railway restaurants will hardly realize. A tinned loaf is best for the purpose if we wish to avoid waste. The great thing is to have the two slices of bread to fit together neatly, and there is no occasion to cut off the crust when made from a well-rasped tin loaf. First cut off the crust from the top of the loaf, which, of course, must be used for some other purpose. The best use for this top slice is to toast it lightly on the crummy side and cut it up into little pieces to be served with soup. Next take the loaf, cut off one thin slice evenly, and let it fall on its back on the board you are using. Now butter very slightly the upper surface. Next butter the top of the loaf, cut another thin slice, and, of course, these two pieces of bread will be perfectly level, and if the two buttered sides be placed together, will fit round the edge exactly. Tomato Sandwiches Cut some very ripe red tomatoes into thin slices and cut them parallel with the core, as otherwise you will get them in rings from which the core will drop out. Sprinkle some thin slices of bread and butter with mustard and cress. Dip the slices of tomato into a dressing made with a little oil, pepper, and salt well mixed up. Put these between the bread and butter and cut them into squares or triangles with a very sharp knife. These sandwiches are very cool and refreshing and make a most agreeable supper after a hot and crowded ballroom. If you wish to have them look pretty, pile them up in the centre of a silver dish and place a few ripe red tomatoes round the base on some bright green parsley. Place the dish in an ice chest for an hour before it is eaten. Mustard and Cress Sandwiches Place well-washed and dried mustard and cress between two slices of bread and butter and trim the edges. It is best to pepper and salt the bread and butter first. Pile up the sandwiches on a silver dish and sprinkle some loose mustard and cress round the base. Egg Sandwiches Cut some hard-boiled eggs into very thin slices. Season them with pepper and salt and place them between two slices of thin bread and butter. Cut the sandwiches into triangles or squares. Pile them up in a silver dish. Place plenty of fresh green parsley around the base of the dish and place some hard-boiled eggs cut in halves on the parsley, which will show what the sandwiches are composed of. Indian Sandwiches These are exactly similar to the above, with the addition that the slices of hard-boiled eggs are seasoned with a little curry powder. If hard-boiled eggs in halves are placed round the base of the dish, each half-egg should be sprinkled with curry powder in order to show what the sandwiches are. Mushroom Sandwiches Take a pint of fresh button mushrooms, peel them, and throw them into lemon juice and water in order to preserve their colour. Or else, take the contents of a tin of mushrooms, chop them up, and stew them in a frying pan very gently with a little butter, pepper, salt, a pinch of thyme, and the juice of a whole lemon to every pint of mushrooms. When tender, rub the mixture through a wise sieve while the butter is warm and the mixture moist. Add a teaspoonful of finely chopped blanched parsley, spread this mixture while still warm on a thin slice of bread, and cover it over with another thin slice of bread, and press the two slices of bread together. When the mixture gets quite cold, the butter will set and the sandwiches get quite firm. The bread need not be buttered, 
as the mixture contains butter enough. Pile these sandwiches up on a silver dish, surround the dish with plenty of fresh parsley, and place a few fresh mushrooms, hoe, stock, and all round them as if they are growing out of the parsley. Cheese Sandwiches Oil a little butter, add some pepper and salt and a spoonful of made mustard and a pinch of cayenne pepper. When this mixture is nearly cold, use it for buttering some thin slices of bread and, before it is quite cold, sprinkle them with some grated parmesan cheese. Put the two slices of bread together and press them and when cold, cut them into squares or triangles. Place plenty of fresh green parsley round the dish and if you are using hard-boiled eggs for other purposes, take the end of the white of egg, which has a little cup in it not much bigger than the top of the finger, and put a little heap of parmesan cheese in each cup. Place a few of these round the base of the dish, on the parsley, in order to show what the sandwiches are composed of. Cream Cheese Sandwiches Chop up some of the white part of a head of celery very fine and pound it in a mortar with a little butter. Season it with some salt. Use this mixture and butter some thin slices of bread. Place a thin slice of cream cheese between these slices. Cut the sandwiches into squares or triangles with a very sharp knife and pile the sandwiches up on a silver dish. Surround the dish with parsley and place a few slices of cream cheese cut round the size of a half penny round the base. Stick a little piece of the yellowish white leaves of the heart of celery in each piece. End of section 14 Recording by Sam W. from www.thisvoiceofmine.com Section 15 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 6, Part 1, Savory Dishes, Mushrooms. In many parts of the country, mushrooms grow so plentifully that their cost may be considered almost nothing. On the other hand, if they have to be bought fresh, at certain seasons of the year they are very expensive, while tinned mushrooms, which can always be depended upon, cannot be regarded in any other light than that of a luxury. When mushrooms can be gathered in the fields like blackberries, they are a great boon to vegetarians. Of course, great care must be taken that only genuine mushrooms are picked, as there have been some terrible instances of poisoning from fungi being gathered by mistake, as many cockney tourists know to their cost. As a rule, in England, all mushrooms bought in markets can be depended upon. In France, where mushrooms are very plentiful, an inspector is appointed in every market, and no mushrooms are allowed to be sold unless they have first received his sanction. This is a wise precaution in the right direction. One important word of warning before leaving the subject Mushrooms should be eaten freshly gathered, and if allowed to get stale, those which were perfectly wholesome when fresh picked become absolutely poisonous. The symptoms are somewhat similar to narcotic poisoning. This particularly applies to the larger and coarser kind that give out black juice. Mushrooms, plain, grilled. The larger kind of mushrooms are best for the purpose. The flat mushrooms should be washed, dried, and peeled. They are then cooked slowly over a clear fire, and a small wire gridiron, like those sold at a penny or two pence each, is better adapted for the purpose than the ordinary gridiron used for grilling steak. The gridiron should be kept high above the fire. The mushrooms should be dipped in oil or oiled butter, and care should be taken that they do not stick to the bars. They should be served very hot, with pepper and salt and a squeeze of lemon juice. Mushrooms Fried when mushrooms are very small, they are more easily fried than grilled. They should be washed, dried, and peeled, placed in the frying pan with a little butter, pepper, and salt, and cooked until tender. They are very nice served on toast, and the butter in which they are cooked can be poured on the toast first, and the mushrooms arranged on the top afterwards. A squeeze of lemon juice is an improvement. Mushrooms au gratin this is a very delicious dish, and it is often served as an entree at first-class dinners. 
They are made from what are known as cup mushrooms. It is best to pick mushrooms as far as possible the same size, the cup being about two inches in diameter. Peel the mushrooms very carefully without breaking them. Cut out the stalks close down with a spoon. Scoop out the inside of the cup so as to make it hollow. Now peel the stalks and chop them up with all the scooped part of the mushroom, with, supposing we are making ten cups, a piece of onion as big as the top of the thumb down to the first joint. To this add a brimming teaspoonful of chopped parsley, or even a little more, a salt spoonful of dried thyme, or half this quantity of fresh thyme. Fry all of this in a frying pan in a little butter. The aroma is delicious. Then add sufficient dried bread crumbs that have been rubbed through a wire sieve to make the whole into a moist paste. Fill each of the cups with this mixture so that the top is as convex as the cup of the mushroom, having first seasoned the mixture with a little pepper, salt, and lemon juice. Shake some fine bread raspings over the top so as to make them a nice golden brown color. Pour a little drop of oil into a baking tin, place the mushrooms in it, and bake them gently in an oven till the cut part of the mushroom becomes soft and tender, but take care they do not cook till they break. Now take them out carefully with an egg slice and place them on a dish. A silver dish is best for the purpose and place some nice crisp fried parsley around the edge. Mushrooms a la Bordelaise This, as the name implies, is a French recipe. It consists of ordinary grilled mushrooms served in a sauce composed of oil or oiled butter, chopped up with parsley and garlic, thickened with the yolk of eggs. Mushrooms a la Provençale This is an Italian recipe. You must first wash, peel, and dry the mushrooms, and then soak them for some time in what is called a marinade, which is another word for pickle of oil mixed with chopped garlic, pepper, and salt. They are then stewed in oil with plenty of chopped parsley over rather a brisk fire. Squeeze a little lemon juice over them and serve them in a dish surrounded with a little fried or toasted bread. Mushroom force meat. The mushrooms after being cleaned should be chopped up and fried in a little butter. Lemon juice should be added before they are chopped in order to preserve their color. One or two hard boiled yolks of eggs can be added to the mixture and the whole rubbed through a wire sieve while hot. When the mixture is hot, it should be moist, but of course when it gets cold, owing to the butter, it will be hard. This mushroom forcemeat can be used for a variety of purposes. Mushroom pie. Wash, dry, and peel some mushrooms, and cut them into slices with an equal quantity of cut up potatoes. Bake these in a pie, having first moistened the potatoes and mushrooms in a little butter. Add pepper and salt and a small pinch of thyme. Cover them with a little water and put some paste over the dish in the ordinary way. It is a great improvement after the pie is baked to pour in some essence of mushrooms made from stewing the stalks and peelings in a little water. A single onion should be put in with them. Mushroom pie cold. Prepare the mushrooms, potatoes, and essence of mushroom as directed above, adding a little chopped parsley. Bake all these in the dish before you cover with paste Add also an extra seasoning of pepper. When the mushrooms and potatoes are perfectly tender, strain off all the juice or gravy and thicken it with corn flour. Put this back in the pie dish and mix all well together and pile it up in the middle of the dish so that the center is raised above the edge. Let this get quite cold, then cover it with puff paste and as soon as the pastry is done, take it out of the oven and let the pie get cold. This can now be cut in slices. Mushroom pudding. Make a mixture of mushrooms, potatoes, etc., exactly similar to that for making a pie. Place this in a basin with only sufficient water to moisten the ingredients. Cover the basin with breadcrumbs soaked in milk and steam the basin in the ordinary way. Tomatoes grilled. What is necessary is a clear fire and a gridiron on which the bars are not too far apart. The disputed point is, should the tomatoes be grilled whole or cut in half? This may be considered a matter of taste, but personally we prefer them grilled whole. Moisten the tomato in a little oil or oiled butter and grill them carefully as they are apt to break. Grilled tomatoes are very nice with plain boiled macaroni or can be served up on boiled rice. Tomatoes baked. Place the tomatoes in a tin with a little butter and occasionally baste them with the butter. When they are tender, they can be served either plain or with boiled macaroni or rice. 
The butter and juice in the tin should be poured over them. Tomatoes fried. Place the tomatoes in a frying pan with a little butter and fry them until they are tender. Pour the contents of the frying pan over them. Serve plain or with macaroni or rice. Tomatoes stewed. Take half a dozen good-sized tomatoes and chop up very finely one onion about the same size as the tomatoes. Moisten the bottom of a stew pan with a little butter and sprinkle the chopped onion over the tomatoes. Add a dessert spoonful of water. Place the lid on the stew pan, which ought to fit tightly. It is best to put a weight on the lid of the stew pan, such as a flat iron. Place the stew pan on the fire and let them steam until they are tender. They are cooked this way in Spain and Portugal and very often chopped garlic is used instead of onion. Tomatoes au gratin. Take a dozen ripe tomatoes, cut off the stalks, and squeeze out thyme juice and pips. Next, take a few mushrooms and make a mixture exactly similar to that which was used to fill the inside of mushrooms au gratin. Fill each tomato with some of this mixture so that it assumes its original shape and tight skin. The top or hole where the stalk was cut out will probably be about the size of a shilling or a halfpenny. Shake some bright colored bread raspings over this spot without letting them fall on the red tomato. In order to do this, cut a round hole the right size in a stiff piece of paper. Place the tomatoes in a stew pan or a baking dish in the oven. Moisten with a little oil. The oil should be about the eighth of an inch deep. Stew or bake the tomatoes till they are tender and then take them out carefully with an egg slice and serve them surrounded with fried parsley. If placed in a silver dish, this has a very pretty appearance. Tomato pie. Slice up an equal number of ripe tomatoes and potatoes. Place them in a pie dish with enough oiled butter to moisten them. Add a brimming teaspoonful of chopped parsley, a pinch of thyme, pepper, and salts, and if possible a few peeled mushrooms, which will be found to be a very great improvement. Cover the pie with paste and bake in the oven. Tomato pie another way. Proceed as in making an ordinary potato pie. Add a small bottle of tomato conserve, cover with paste, and bake in the ordinary way. Potato pie. Peel and slice up some potatoes as thin as possible. At the same time, slice up some onions. If Spanish onions are used, allow equal quantities of potatoes and onions, but if ordinary onions are used, allow only half this quantity. Place a layer of sliced onion and sliced potato alternately. Add some pepper, salt, and sufficient butter to moisten the potato and onion before any water is added. Pour in some water and add a teaspoonful of chopped parsley. Cover the pie with paste and bake in the ordinary way. Potato pie another way. Butter a shallow pie dish rather thickly. Line the edges with a good crust and then fill the pie with mashed potatoes seasoned with pepper, salt, and grated nutmeg. Lay over them some small lumps of butter, hard-boiled eggs, blanched almonds, sliced dates, sliced lemon, and candied peel. Cover the dish with pastry and bake the pie in a well-heated oven for half an hour or more, according to the size of the pie. Pumpkin pie. Peel a ripe pumpkin and chip off the rind or skin. Have it and take out the seed and fluffy part in the center, which throw away. Cut the pumpkin into small thin slices. Fill a pie dish therewith. Add to it half a teaspoonful of allspice and a tablespoonful of sugar with a small quantity of water. Cover with a nice light paste and bake in the ordinary way. Pumpkin pie is greatly improved by being eaten with Devonshire cream and sugar. An equal quantity of apples with the pumpkin will make a still more delicious pie. Pumpkin pudding. Take a large pumpkin, pare it, and remove the seeds. Cut half of it into thin slices and boil these gently in water until they are quite soft. Then rub them through a fine sieve with the back of a wooden spoon. Measure the pulp, and with each pint, put four ounces of butter and a large nutmeg grated. Stir the mixture briskly for a minute or two, then add the third of a pint of hot milk and four well-beaten eggs. Pour the pudding into a buttered dish and bake in a moderate oven for about an hour. Sugar may be added to taste. Potato Cheesecake See Cheesecakes Cheese with fried bread Take some stale bread and cut it into strips about 3 inches long and 1 wide and 1 inch thick. 
Fry the bread in some butter or oil till it is a nice bright golden color. Spread a layer of made mustard over the strips of fried bread, and then cover them with grated parmesan cheese. Pile them up on a dish and place them in the oven. As soon as the cheese begins to melt, serve them very hot. Cheese Savory Take equal quantities of grated Parmesan cheese, butter, and flour. Add a little salt and cayenne pepper. Make these into a paste with some water. Roll out the paste thin till it is about a quarter of an inch thick. Cut it into strips and bake them in the oven till they are a nice brown and serve hot. Cheese souffle. See omelets. Cheese pudding. Mix half a pound of grated Parmesan cheese with four eggs, well beaten up. Mix in also two ounces of butter, which should be first beaten to a cream. Add half a pint of milk and pour the mixture into a well-buttered pie dish. Sprinkle some grated Parmesan cheese over the top and bake in the oven for about half an hour. The pudding will be lighter if two of the whites of eggs are beaten to a stiff froth. The edge of the pie dish can be lined with puff paste. Cheese Ramekins Put half a pound of grated Parmesan cheese in a stew pan with a quarter of a pound of butter and a quarter of a pint of water. Add a little pepper and salt and as much flour as will make the whole into a thick paste. Mix up with the paste as many well beaten up eggs as will make the paste not too liquid to be molded into a shape. The eggs should be beaten till they froth. Now, with a tablespoon, mold this mixture into shapes like a meringue or egg. Place these on a buttered tin and bake them till they are a nice brown color. Cheese stewed. When the remains of cheese have got very dry, it is a good plan to use it up in the shape of stewed cheese. Break up the cheese and put it in a small stew pan with about a quarter of its weight of butter. Add a little milk and let the cheese stew gently till it is dissolved. At the finish and when you have removed it from the fire, add a well beaten up egg. This can be served on toast, or it can be poured onto a dish and pieces of toasted bread stuck in it. Cheese Straws Mix equal quantities of grated Parmesan cheese, grated breadcrumbs that have been rubbed through a wire sieve, butter, and flour. Add a little cayenne and grated nutmeg. Make it into a thick paste, roll it out very thin, cut it into strips, and bake for a few minutes in a fierce oven. Cheese Toasted this is best done in a Dutch oven, so that when one side is toasted, you can turn the oven and toast the back. As soon as the cheese begins to melt, it is done. As it gets cold very quickly, and when cold gets hard, it is best served on hot water plates. Cheese deviled. Chop up some hot pickles, add some cayenne pepper and mustard. Melt some cheese in a stew pan with a little butter, mix in the pickles, and serve on toast. Welsh rarebit. Toast a large slice of bread. In the meantime, melt some cheese in the saucepan with a little butter. When the cheese is melted, it will be found that a good deal of oiled butter floats on the top. Pour this over the dry toast first, and then pour the melted cheese afterwards. Some persons add a teaspoonful of Worcestershire sauce to the cheese, and others a tablespoonful of good old Burton ale over the top. Aioli this dish is almost peculiar to the south of France. Soak some crusts of bread in water, squeeze them dry, and add two cloves of garlic chopped fine, six blanched almonds, also chopped very fine, and a yolk of an egg. Mix up the whole into a smooth paste with a little oil. Pumpkin a la Parmesan Cut a large pumpkin into square pieces and boil them for about a quarter of an hour in salt and water. And take them out, drain them, and put them in a stew pan with a little butter, salt, and grated nutmeg. Fry them, sprinkle them with a little Parmesan cheese, and bake them for a short time in the oven till the cheese begins to melt, and then serve. This is an Italian recipe. Zucchetti Farsis Take some very small gourds or pumpkins, boil them for about a quarter of an hour in salt and water, and then fill them with a force meat made as follows. Take some crumbs of bread and soak it in milk. Squeeze it and add the yolks of two hard-boiled eggs and two raw yolks. Chop up very finely half a dozen blanched almonds and a couple of cloves. Add two ounces of grated Parmesan cheese and a little salt and grated nutmeg. Stew these gourds in butter and serve them with white sauce. Stuffed onions, Italian fashion. Parboil some large onions, 
Stamp out the core after they have been allowed to get quite cold in a little water. Fill the inside with force meat similar to the above. Fry them. Squeeze the juice of a lemon over them with a little pepper. Polenta. Polenta is made from ground Indian corn and is seen in Italian shop windows in the form of a yellow powder. It is made into a paste with boiling water, sprinkled with Parmesan cheese, and baked in the oven. Piroski Cernikis. This dish is met with in Poland and is made by mixing up two pounds of cream cheese, three quarters of a pound of fine bread crumbs that have been rubbed through a wire sieve, six eggs well beaten up, add a little cream or milk, four ounces of washed grocer's currants, and one ounce of sugar, half a grated nutmeg. And when the whole is thoroughly mixed, add as much flour as is necessary to make the whole into a paste that can be rolled into balls. These balls should not be much bigger than a walnut. Flour them and then flatten them into little cakes and fry them a nice brown in some butter. Of course, a smaller quantity can be made by using these ingredients in proportion. Nelesnikis, or Polish pancakes. Take eight eggs and beat them up very thoroughly with about a pint and a half of milk, or still better, cream, two ounces of butter that has been oiled, half a grated nutmeg, and about a dozen lumps of sugar that have been rubbed on the outside of a lemon. Mix in sufficient flour, about three quarters of a pound will be required, to make the whole into a very smooth batter. Melt a little butter in a frying pan, pour it all over the pan, and when it frizzles, pour in some of the batter, and sprinkle over a few currants. When the pancake is fried, shake some powdered sugar over it, roll it up like an ordinary pancake, and serve hot. End of section 15. Section 16 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 6 Savory Dishes Fritters Batter for Savory Fritters Put six ounces of flour into a basin with a pinch of salt, the yolk of one egg, and a quarter of a pint of warm water. Work this round and round with a wooden spoon till it is perfectly smooth and looks like thick cream. About half an hour before the batter is wanted for use, whip the white of one egg to a stiff froth and mix it lightly in. Mushroom Fritters Make some mushroom forcemeat. Let it get quite cold on a dish about a quarter of an inch thick. Cut out some small rounds about the size of a penny piece. They fry better if slightly oval. Have ready some thick batter, sea batter. Have also ready in a saucepan some boiling oil, which should be heated to about 350 degrees. Place a frying basket in the saucepan, flour the rounds of mushroom forcemeat so as to make them perfectly dry on the outside. Dip these pieces into the batter and throw them into the boiling oil. The great heat of the oil will set the batter before the mushroom force meat has time to melt. Directly the batter is a nice light brown color. Lift them out of the boiling oil with the frying basket and throw them onto a cloth to drain. Break off the outside pieces of batter and serve the fritters on a neatly folded napkin on a dish surrounded by fried parsley. The beauty of these fritters is that when they are eaten, the inside is moist, owing, of course, to the heat having melted the forcemeat tomato fritters make some mushroom forcemeat and spread it out as thin as possible take some ripe tomatoes cut them in slices dip the slice in vinegar drain it and pepper it and then wrap this thin slice of tomato in a layer of mushroom forcemeat bring the edges together flour it dip it into batter sea batter and throw it into boiling oil as in making mushroom fritters see mushroom fritters imitation game fritters make some mushroom forcemeat as directed under the heading mushroom forcemeat with the addition of when you fry the mushrooms chop up and fry with them two heads of garlic and add a saltspoonful of aromatic flavoring herbs these are sold in bottles by all grocers under the name of herbaceous mixture then proceed exactly as if you were making mushroom fritters see mushroom fritters 
hominy fritters these are made from remains of cold boiled hominy cut in thin slices which must be dipped in batter and fried in boiling oil cheese fritters pound some dry cheese or take about three ounces of parmesan cheese and mix it with a few bread crumbs a piece of butter a pinch of cayenne pepper and the yolk of an egg till the whole becomes a thick paste roll the mixture into very small balls flatten them flour them dip them into batter and throw them into boiling oil in the ordinary way put them in the oven for five minutes before serving them sage and onion fritters make some ordinary sage and onion stuffing allowing one fresh sage leaf or two dry to each parboiled onion add pepper and salt and dried bread crumbs now moisten the whole with clarified butter till the mixture becomes a moist pulp when it begins to get cold and sets roll it into small balls the size of a very small walnut flatten these and let them get quite cold then flour them dip them into batter and throw them into boiling oil remove them with the frying basket and serve with fried parsley spinach fritters make a little thick puree of spinach add a pinch of savory herbs containing marjoram mix in a little clarified butter and one or two lumps of sugar rubbed on the outside of a lemon as well as a little grated nutmeg roll the mixture into very small ball or else they will break flatten them flour them dip them into batter and throw them into boiling oil and serve immediately fritters sweet in making sweet fritters the same kind of batter will do as we used for making savory fritters though many cooks add a little powdered sugar the same principles hold good the oil must be heated to a temperature of three hundred fifty degrees and a frying basket must be used instead of flouring the substances employed to make them dry before being dipped into the batter which is an essential point in making fritters we must use finely powdered sugar and it will be found a saving of both time and trouble to buy pounded sugar for the purpose it is sold by grocers under the name of castor sugar we cannot make this at home in a pestle and mortar to the same degree of fineness any more than we could grind our own flour we cannot compete with machinery apple fritters peel some apples cut them in slices across the core and stamp out the core it is customary where wine etc is not objected to to soak these rings of apples for several hours in a mixture of brandy grated lemon or orange peel and sugar or better still to rub some lumps of sugar on the outside of a lemon or orange and dissolve this in the brandy of course brandy is not necessary but the custom is worth mentioning the rings of apple can be soaked for some time in syrup flavored this way they must then be made dry by being dipped in powdered sugar then dipped into batter and thrown one at a time into a saucepan containing smoking hot oil in which a wire frying basket has been placed directly the fritters are a nice brown take them out break off the rough pieces shake some finely powdered sugar over them pile them up on a dish and serve apricot fritters these can be made from fresh apricots or tinned ones not too ripe if they break they are not fitted when made from fresh apricots they should be peeled cut in halves the round end removed dipped in powdered sugar then dipped in batter thrown into boiling oil and finished like apple fritters some persons soak the apricots in brandy banana fritters banana fritters can be made from the bananas as sold in this country and it is a mistake to think that when they are black outside they are bad when in this state they are sometimes sold as cheap as six a penny peel the bananas cut them into slices half an inch thick dip them in finely powdered sugar and then into batter and finish as directed in apple fritters some persons soak the slices of banana in maraschino custard fritters take half a pint of cream in which some cinnamon and lemon have been boiled add to this five yolks of eggs a little flour and about three ounces of sugar put this into a pie dish well buttered and steam it till the custard becomes quite set then let it get cold and cut it into slices about half an inch thick and an inch and a half long sprinkle each piece with a little powdered cinnamon and make it quite dry with some powdered sugar then dip each piece into batter throw them one by one into boiling oil and finish as directed for apple fritters 
almond fritters, chocolate fritters, coffee fritters, vanilla fritters, etc. These fritters are made exactly in the same way as custard fritters, only substituting powdered chocolate, pounded almonds, essence of coffee, or essence of vanilla for the powdered cinnamon. Frangipani Fritters Make a frangipani cream by mixing eggs with a little cold potato, butter, sugar, and powdered ratafias, the proportion being a quarter of a pound of butter, four eggs, six ounces of sugar, one cold floury potato, and a quarter of a pound of ratafias. Bake or steam this until it is set and proceed as in custard fritters. Many persons add the flavoring of a little rum. Peach fritters. These are made exactly similar to apricot fritters, bearing in mind that if they are made from tin peaches, only the firm pieces and not pulpy ones must be used for the purpose. Proceed exactly as directed for apricot fritters. If any liqueur is used, noyau is best adapted for the purpose. Potato fritters. Mix up some floury potato with a quarter of a pound of butter, a well-beaten up egg, and three ounces of sugar, some of which has been rubbed on the outside of a lemon. The addition of a little cream is a great improvement. Roll the mixture into small balls and flour them. They are then fried just as they are without being dipped into batter. Pineapple fritters. These can be made from fresh pineapples or tinned. They should be cut into slices like apple fritters if the pineapple is small, but if the pineapple is large, they can be cut into strips three inches long and one wide and a half inch thick. These must be dipped in powdered sugar, then into batter, and finished as directed for apple fritters. If any liqueur is used, maraschino is best adapted to the purpose. Orange fritters. Only first-class oranges are adapted for this purpose. Thick-skinned and woolly oranges are no use. Peel a thin-skinned ripe orange, divide each orange into about six pieces, soak these in a syrup flavored with sugar, rubbed on the outside of an orange, and if liqueur is used, make the syrup with brandy. After they have soaked some time, remove any pips, dip each piece into batter, and proceed as directed for apple fritters. Cream fritters. Rub some lumps of sugar on the outside of an orange, pound them and mix with a little cream. Take some small pieces of stale white cake, such as Madeira cake, or what the French call brioche. Soak these pieces of stale cake, which must be cut small and thin, or they will break in the orange-flavored cream. Dry each piece in some finely powdered sugar, dip it into batter, and proceed as directed for making apple fritters. German fritters. Take some small stale pieces of cake and soak them in a little milk or cream, flavored with essence of vanilla and sweetened with a little sugar. Take them out and let them get a little dry on the outside, then dip them in a well-beaten up egg, cover them with breadcrumbs, and fry a nice golden brown color. Rice and Ginger Fritters Boil a small quantity of rice in milk and add some preserved ginger chopped small, some sugar and one or more eggs sufficient to set the mixture when baked in a pie dish bake till set then cut into slices about two inches long an inch wide and half an inch thick dry these pieces with powdered sugar dip into batter and finish as directed for making apple fritters rice fritters a variety of fritters could be made from a small baked rice pudding flavored with various kinds of essences spices orange marmalade peach marmalade fresh lime marmalade apricot jam etc proceeding exactly as described above end of section 16section 17 of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 7 Vegetables. Substantial Vegetables. Part 1. Vegetables may be roughly divided into two classes those that may be called substantial and which are adapted to form a meal in themselves, and those of a lighter kind which cannot be said to make a sufficient repast unless eaten with bread. Potatoes were first introduced into this country about 400 years ago, tobacco being introduced about the same period. 
and we cannot disguise the fact that there are many who regard the latter as the greater blessing of the two if sir henry thompson is right in stating that tobacco is the great ally of temperance there may be some ground for this opinion potatoes form an important article of food for the body while whatever effect tobacco may have upon the thinking powers of mankind it is almost the only product of the vegetable kingdom that is absolutely uneatable even when placed within reach of those in the last stage of starvation in some parts especially in ireland potatoes form almost the only food of the population just as rice does in hotter climates and when the crop fails famine ensues when potatoes form the only kind of food a very large quantity has to be eaten by a hard-working man in order for him to receive sufficient nourishment to keep his body healthy the amount required being not less than ten pounds per day if on the other hand a certain amount of fat or oil of some kind be mixed with them a far less quantity will suffice hence we find in ireland that wherever it is possible either some kind of oily fish such as herring is taken with them or which is much more to the point with vegetarians a certain quantity of fat is obtained in the shape of milk it must also be remembered that four pounds of raw potatoes contain only one pound of solid food the remaining three pounds being water it is important for those who first commence a vegetarian diet to remember that vegetables like peas areco beans and lentils are far superior to potatoes so far as nourishment is concerned for many are apt to jump to the conclusion that potatoes are the very best substitute for bread and milk so too is oatmeal a scotchman requires a far less quantity of oatmeal to sustain life than an irishman does potatoes hence it is a very important point to remember that if we depend upon potatoes to any great extent for our daily food we should cook them in such a manner as to entail as little waste as possible we will now try and explain as briefly as possible the best method of serving potatoes plain boiled the best method of having potatoes if we wish to study economy is to boil them in their jackets as it is generally admitted that the most nourishing part is that which lies nearest to the skin there are many houses in the country where an inexperienced cook will peel say four pounds of potatoes and throw the peel into the pig tub where the pig gets a better meal than the family when potatoes are boiled in their skins they should be thoroughly washed and scrubbed with a hard brush old potatoes should be put into cold water and when the water boils the time should a good deal depend upon the size of the potatoes when the potatoes are large the chief principle to be borne in mind is do not let them boil too quickly or cook too quickly we must avoid having the outside pulpy while the inside is hard the water which should be slightly salted should more than cover them and if the potatoes are very large directly the water comes to the boil it is a good plan to throw in a little cold water to take it off the boil it is quite impossible to lay down any exact law in regard to boiling potatoes we cannot do more than give general principles which can only be carried out by cooks who possess a little common sense small new potatoes are an extreme in one direction they should be thrown into boiling water and are generally cooked in about ten minutes or a quarter of an hour large old potatoes should be put into cold water and as we have stated the water should not be allowed to boil too soon and it will take very often an hour to boil them properly between these two extremes there is a gradually ascending scale which must be left to the judgment of the cook it is as impossible to lay down any hard and fast line with regard to time in boiling potatoes as it would be to say at what exact point in the thermometer between freezing and eighty degrees in the shade a man should put on his top coat if we may be allowed the expression old new potatoes should be thrown into neither boiling water nor cold water but lukewarm water again in boiling potatoes especially in the case of old ones some little allowance must be made for the time of year in winter they require longer time and we may here mention the fact that it is very important that potatoes 
after they are dug should not be left out of doors and exposed to a hard frost as in this case a chemical change takes place in which the starch is converted into sugar when potatoes are boiled in their jackets sufficiently which fact is generally tested by sticking a steel fork into them they should be strained off and allowed to get dry for a few minutes in the saucepan which should be removed from the fire as at times the potatoes are apt to stick and burn when large potatoes are peeled before they are boiled we should endeavor to send them to table floury and this is often said to be the test of a really good cook after the water has been strained off from the potatoes a dry cloth should be placed under the lid of the saucepan and the lid should only be placed half on i e it should not be fitted down tight it is also as well to give the saucepan now and then a shake but do not overdo the shaking and break them about five or ten minutes is generally sufficient potatoes steamed potatoes can be steamed in their jackets and it is a more economical method than peeling it should be remembered however that steam is hotter than boiling water if plain water is underneath and boils furiously and the steam is well shut in they will cook very quickly but if as is generally the case something else is in the saucepan under the steamer boiling gently this does not apply we refer to the ordinary steamer met with in private houses and not to the ones used in the large hotels and restaurants potatoes baked when potatoes are baked in the oven in their jackets the larger they are the better the oven must not be too fierce and ample time should be allowed baked potatoes require quite two hours this only refers to those baked in their jackets when potatoes are cut up and baked in a tin they require some kind of fat which of course in vegetarian cookery must be either oil or butter potatoes mashed what may be termed high-class mashed potatoes are made by mashing up ordinary boiled potatoes with a little milk previously boiled a little butter and passing the whole through a wire sieve when a little cream butter and salt is added in private houses mashed potatoes are generally made from the remains of cold boiled potatoes or when the cook in boiling the potatoes has made a failure still of course potatoes are boiled often expressly for the purpose of being mashed this is often the case where old potatoes have to be cut into all sorts of shapes and sizes in order to get rid of the black spots as soon as the potatoes are boiled they are generally moistened in the saucepan with a little drop of milk it is undoubtedly an improvement and also entails very little extra trouble to boil the milk first there is a difference in flavor which is very marked between milk that has been boiled and raw milk suppose you have coffee for breakfast add boiling milk to one cup and raw milk to another and then see how great a difference there will be in the flavor of the two a little butter should be added to mashed potatoes but it is not really essential mashed potatoes can be served in the shape of a mold that is they can be shaped in a mold and then browned in the oven if you serve mashed potatoes in an ordinary dish and pile them up in the shape of a dome the dish will look much prettier if you score it round with a fork and then place the dish in a fairly fierce oven the edges will brown but be careful that they don't get burnt black potatoes fried the best lesson if you wish to fry potatoes nicely is to look in at the window of a fried fish shop where every condition is fulfilled that is likely to lead to perfection the bath of oil is deep and smoking hot and in sufficient quantity not to lose greatly in temperature on the introduction of the frying basket containing the potatoes the potatoes must be cut up into small pieces not much bigger in thickness than the little finger these are plunged into the smoking hot oil and as soon as they are slightly browned on the outside they are done they acquire a darker color after they are removed from the oil and the inside will go on cooking for several minutes it would be quite impossible to eat fried potatoes directly they are taken out of the fat as they would burn the mouth terribly it is best to throw the fried potatoes into a cloth for a few seconds potato chips potato chips are ordinary fried potatoes cut up when raw into little pieces about the size and thickness of a lucifer match 
they of course will cook very quickly they should be removed from the oil directly they begin to turn color potato ribbon potato ribbon is simply ordinary fried potatoes in which the raw potato is cut in the shape of a ribbon you take a potato and peel it in the ordinary way you then take this and with not too sharp a knife peel it like an apple making the strip as long as you can like children sometimes do when they throw the apple peel over their shoulders to see what letter it will make you can go on peeling the potato round and round till there is none left these ribbons are thrown into boiling oil and must be removed as soon as they begin to turn color when piled up in a dish they look very pretty and with a little pepper and salt and a squeeze of lemon juice make an excellent meal when eaten with bread potato saute this dish is more frequently met with abroad than in england except in foreign restaurants it is made by taking the remains of ordinary plain boiled potatoes that are not floury these are cut up into small pieces about the size of the thumb no particular shape being necessary they are thrown into a frying pan with a little butter and fried gently till the edges begin to brown they are served with chopped parsley and pepper and salt the butter should be poured over the potatoes and supplies the fatty element which potato lacks potatoes a la maitre d'hotel these are very similar to potato saute the difference being that they are not browned at the edges small kidney potatoes are best for the purpose these must be boiled till tender and the potatoes then cut into slices these must be warmed up with a spoonful or two of white sauce see white sauce to which is added some chopped parsley and a little lemon juice a more common way is to boil the potatoes slice them up while hot and then toss them about in a vegetable dish lightly with a lump of what is called maitre d'hotel butter this is simply a lump of plain cold butter mixed with chopped parsley till it looks like a lump of cold parsley and butter when tossed about squeeze a little lemon juice over the whole and serve potatoes new new potatoes should be washed and the skin if necessary rubbed off with the fingers they should be thrown into boiling water slightly salted and as a rule require from fifteen to five and twenty minutes to boil before they are done during the last few minutes throw in one or two sprigs of fresh mint drain them off and let their dry and then place them in a vegetable dish with a mint and a little piece of butter in which the potatoes should be boiled to give them a shiny appearance outside new potatoes can also be served with a little white sauce to which has been added a little chopped parsley potato balls mash some boiled potatoes with a little butter pepper salt chopped parsley chopped onion or still better shallot and add a few savory herbs mix up one or two or more well-beaten eggs according to the quantity of potato roll the mixture into balls flour them and fry them a nice brown color and serve potato croquettes or cutlets these are very similar to potato balls only they should be smaller and more delicately flavored the potatoes are boiled and mashed and if the croquettes are wished to be very good one or two hard-boiled yolks of eggs should be mixed with them the mixture is slightly flavored with shallot savory herbs or thyme chopped parsley and a little nutmeg one or two fresh well beaten up eggs are now added the mixture then rolled into small balls no bigger than a walnut these are then dipped in well beaten up egg and then bread crumbed the balls are fried a nice golden brown color and served potato cutlets are exactly the same only instead of shaping the mixture into a little ball the ball is flattened into the shape of a small oval cutlet these are then egged bread crumbed and fried but before being sent to table a small piece of green parsley stalk is stuck in one end to represent the bone of the cutlet these little cutlets placed on an ornamental sheet of white paper at the bottom of the silver dish look very pretty a small heap of fried parsley should be placed in the center of the dish potato pie see savory dishes page one hundred twelve potato cheesecake see cheesecakes page one sixty nine potato salads see salads page one hundred one potato border of a very pretty dish can be made by making a border of mashed potatoes hollow in the center in which can be placed various kinds of other vegetables 
such as haricot beans stewed peas etc the mashed potatoes should be mixed with one or two well beaten up eggs and the outside of the border can be molded by hand to make it look smooth and neat a piece of flexible tin flat will be found very useful or even a piece of cardboard if you wish to make the border ornamental you can proceed exactly as directed under the heading rice borders and if it is wished to make the dish particularly handsome it can be painted outside before being placed in the oven with the yolk of egg beaten up with a tiny drop of hot water when this is done the potato border has an appearance similar in color to the rich pastry generally seen outside a pie or vol au vent the inside of the potato border after it has been scooped out can be filled with plain boiled macaroni mixed with parmesan cheese and ornamented with a little chopped parsley on the top and a few small baked red ripe tomatoes again it can be filled with white haricot beans piled up in the shape of a dome with some chopped parsley sprinkled over the top there are perhaps few dishes in vegetarian cookery that can be made to look more elegant potato biscuits m udi's recipe take fifteen fresh eggs break the yolks into one pan and the whites into another beat the yolks with a pound of sugar pounded very fine scrape the peel of a lemon with a lump of sugar dry that and pound it fine also then throw it into the yolks and work the eggs and sugar till they are of a whitish color next whip the whites well and mix them with the yolks now sift half a pound of flour of potatoes through a silk sieve over the eggs and sugar have some paper cases ready which lay on a plafond with some paper underneath fill the cases but not too full glaze the contents with some rather coarse sugar and bake the whole in an oven moderately heated potato bread in making bread a portion of mashed potato is sometimes added to the flour and this addition improves the bread very much for some tastes it also keeps it from getting dry quite so soon at the same time it is not so nutritious as ordinary home-made bread boil the required quantity of potatoes in their skins drain and dry them then peel and weigh them pound them with the rolling pin until they are quite free from lumps and mix with them the flour in the proportion of seven pounds of flour to two and a half pounds of potatoes add the yeast and knead in the ordinary way but make up the bread with milk instead of water when the dough is well risen bake the bread in a gentle oven bake it a little longer than for ordinary bread and when it seems done enough let it stand a little while with the oven door open before taking it out unless these precautions are taken the crust will be hard and brittle while the inside is still moist and doughy this recipe is from cassell's dictionary of cookery potato cake take a dozen good-sized potatoes and bake them in the oven till done then peel and put them into a saucepan with a little salt and grated lemon peel set them upon the stove and put in a piece of fresh butter and stir the whole add a little cream and sugar still continuing to stir them then let them cool a little and add some orange flower water eight yolks of eggs and four only of whites whisked into froth heat up the whole together and mix it with the potato puree butter a mold and sprinkle it with bread crumbs pour in the paste place the pan upon hot cinders with fire upon the lid and let it remain for three quarters of an hour or it may be baked in an oven potato cheese potato cheeses are very highly esteemed in germany they can be made of various qualities but care must be taken that they are not too rich and have not too much heat or they will burst boil the potatoes till they are soft but the skin must not be broken the potatoes must be large and of the best quality when boiled carefully peel them and beat them to a smooth paste in a mortar with a wooden pestle to make the commonest cheese put five pounds of potato paste into a cheese tub with one pound of milk and rennet add a sufficient quantity of salt together with caraways and cumin seed sufficient to impart a good flavor knead all these ingredients well together cover up and allow them to stand three or four days in winter two to three in summer at the end of that time knead them again put the paste into wicker molds and leave the cheeses to drain until they are quite dry when dry and firm lay them on a board 
and leave them to acquire hardness gradually in a place of very moderate warmth should the heat be too great as we have said they will burst when in spite of all precautions such accidents occur the crevices of the burst cheeses are in germany filled with curds and cream mixed some being also put over the whole surface of the cheese which is then dried again as soon as the cheeses are thoroughly dry and hard place them in barrels with green chickweed between each cheese let them stand for about three weeks when they will be fit for use potatoes a la barigoule peel some potatoes and boil them in a little water with some oil pepper salt onions and savory herbs boil them slowly so that they can absorb the liquor when they are done brown them in a stew pan in a little oil and serve them to be eaten with oil and vinegar pepper and salt potatoes broiled potatoes are served this way sometimes in italy they are first boiled in their skins but not too long they are then taken out and peeled cut into thin slices placed on a gridiron and grilled till they are crisp a little oil is poured over them when they are served potatoes a la lyonnaise first boil and then peel and slice some potatoes make some rather thin puree of onion see sauce soubise pour this over the potatoes and serve another way is to first brown the slices of potatoes and then serve them with the onion sauce with the addition of a little vinegar or lemon juice potatoes a la provencal put a small piece of butter into a stew pan or three tablespoonfuls of oil three beads of garlic the peel of a quarter of a lemon and some parsley all chopped up very fine add a little grated nutmeg pepper and salt peel some small potatoes and let them stew till they are tender in this mixture large potatoes can be used for the purpose only they must be cut tip into pieces add the juice of a lemon before serving end of section seventeen section eighteen of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter seven vegetables substantial vegetables part two Erico beans it is very much to be regretted that haricot beans are not more used in this country there are hundreds of thousands of families who at the end of a year would be richer in purse and more healthy in body if they would consent to deviate from the beaten track and try haricot beans not as an accompaniment to a dish of meat but as an article of diet in themselves the immense benefit derived in innumerable cases from a diet of beans is one of the strongest and most practical arguments in favor of vegetarianism meat eaters often boast of the plainness of their food and yet wonder that they suffer in health it is not an uncommon thing for a man to consult his doctor and to tell him i live very simply nothing but plain roast or boiled medical men are all agreed on one point and that is that haricot beans rank almost first among vegetables as a nourishing article of diet in writing on this subject sir henry thompson observes let me recall at the close of these few hints about the haricot the fact that there is no product of the vegetable kingdom so nutritious holding its own in this respect as it well can even against the beef and mutton of the animal kingdom this is a very strong statement coming as it does from so high an authority and vegetarians would do well to hear it in mind when discussing the subject of vegetarianism with those who differ from them sir henry proceeds as follows the arico ranks just above lentils which have been so much praised of late and rightly the arico being to most palates more agreeable by most stomachs too aricots are more easily digested than meat is and consuming weight for weight the eater feels lighter and less oppressed as a rule after the leguminous dish while the comparative cost is very greatly in favor of the latter to boil arico beans proceed as follows we refer of course to the dried white arico beans the best of which are those known as soissons 
the beans should be soaked in cold water overnight and in the morning any that may be found floating on the top of the water should be thrown away suppose the quantity be a quart place these in a saucepan with two quarts of cold water slightly salted as soon as time water comes to the boil move it so that the beans will only simmer gently they must then continue simmering till they are tender this generally takes about three hours and if the water is hard it is advisable to put in a tiny piece of soda this is the simple way of cooking beans usually recommended in cookery books when they are served up with a dish of meat such as a leg of mutton a la breton where the beans are served in some rich brown gravy containing fat in vegetarian cookery of course we must proceed entirely differently and there are various ways in which this nourishing dish can be served as savory and as appetizing and indeed more so than if we had assistance from the slaughterhouse we will now proceed to give a few instances in the first place it will greatly assist the flavor of the beans if we boil with them one or two onions and a dessert spoonful of savory herbs supposing however we have them boiled plain take a large dry crust of bread and rub the outside well over with one or two beads of garlic place this crust of bread with the beans after they have been strained off and toss them lightly about with the crust without breaking the beans remove the crust and moisten the beans while hot with a lump of butter add a brimming dessert spoonful of chopped blanched parsley squeeze the juice of a lemon over the whole and serve instead of butter we can add as they always do in italy two or three tablespoonfuls of pure olive oil those who have conquered the unreasonable english prejudice against the use of oil will probably find this superior to butter if the beans are served in the form of a puree it is always best to boil a few onions with them and rub the onions through the wire sieve with the beans taking care that the quantity of onion is not so large that it destroys and overpowers the delicate and delicious flavor of the beans themselves next we would call attention to the importance of not throwing away the water in which the beans were boiled this water contains far more nourishment than people are aware of and throughout the length and breadth of france where economy is far more understood than in this country it is invariably saved to assist in making some kind of soup and as our soup will of course be vegetarian the advantage gained is simply incalculable flagiolet these are haricot beans in the fresh green state and are rarely met with in this country though they form a standing dish abroad they are exceedingly nice and can be cooked in a little butter like the french cooked green peas they are often flavored with garlic and chopped parsley can be added to them those who are fond of this vegetable in the fresh state can obtain them in tins from any high-class grocer as the leading firms in this country keep them in this form for export peas dried dried peas like dried beans contain a very great amount of nourishment indeed in this respect practically dried beans dried peas and lentils may be considered equal dried peas are met with in two forms the split yellow pea and those that are dried whole green split peas are chiefly used in this country to make pea soup or puree of peas and peas pudding we have already given recipes for the two former and will now describe how to make peas pudding soak a quart of peas in water overnight throwing away those in the morning that are found floating at the top drain them off and tie them up in a pudding cloth taking care to leave plenty of room for the peas to swell put them into cold water and boil them till they are tender this will take from two to three hours when tender take them out untie the cloth and rub them through a colander or better still a wire sieve now mix in a couple of ounces of butter with some pepper and salt flour the cloth well and tie it up again and boil it for another hour when it can be turned out and served peas pudding when eaten alone is improved by mixing in at the same time as the butter a dessert spoonful of dried powdered mint also should you have the remains of any cold potatoes in the house it is a very good way of using them up a few savory herbs can be used instead of mint peas brose dr andrew in writing to the cyclopedia 
of domestic medicine says in the west of scotland especially in glasgow peas brose as it is called is made of the fine flour of the white pea by forming it into a mass merely by the addition of boiling water and a little salt it is a favorite dish with not only the working classes but it is even esteemed by many of the gentry it was introduced into fashion chiefly by the recommendation of dr cleghorn late professor of chemistry in glasgow university the peas brose is eaten with milk or butter and is a sweet nourishing article of diet peculiarly fitted for persons of a costive habit and for children peas dried whole green this is perhaps the best form with which we meet peas dried when the best quality is selected and care taken in their preparation they are quite equal to fresh green peas when they are old indeed many persons prefer them soak the peas overnight throwing away those that float at the top put them into cold water and when they boil let the peas simmer gently till they are tender the time varies much with the quality and the size of the peas old ones requiring nearly three hours others considerably less when the peas are tender throw in some sprigs if possible of fresh mint and after a minute strain them off add pepper salt and about two ounces of butter to a quart of peas though this is not absolutely necessary and nearly a dessert spoonful of white powdered sugar if you wish to have the peas as bright a green as freshly gathered ones after you strain them off you can mix them in a basin before you add the butter with a little piece of green vegetable coloring sold in bottles by all grocers the peas should then be put back in the saucepan for a few minutes to be made hot through and then finish as directed above peas dried green with cream boil the peas as before directed till they are quite tender then strain them off and put them in a stew pan with one ounce of butter to every quart of peas and toss them lightly about with a little pepper salt and grated nutmeg add to each quart of peas a quarter of a pint of cream and a dessert spoonful of powdered sugar surround the dish with fried or toasted bread lentils lentils are comparatively speaking a novel form of food in this country though they have been used abroad for many years and a recipe for cooking them will be found in a well-known work published in paris in eighteen forty six entitled la cuisiniere de la compagne et de la ville ou nouvelle cuisine économique one of the most popular french cookery books ever published and which in that year had reached a circulation of eighty thousand copies recipes for boiled lentils and lentil soup are given in cassell's dictionary of cookery published in eighteen seventy five but it is stated in the introductory remarks that lentils are little used in england except as food for pigeons and adds they are seldom offered for sale since that date lentils have become an exceedingly popular form of food in many households and vegetarians generally regard them as one of the most nourishing forms of food served at the table there are two kinds of lentils the german and egyptian the egyptian are red and much smaller than the german which are green the former kind are generally used on the continent in italy and the south of france while as the name implies the green lentils are more commonly used in eastern europe either kind however can be used for making soup and puree recipes of which have already been given as well as for the recipes in the present chapter lentils boiled the lentils should be placed in soak overnight and those that float should be thrown away suppose we have half a pint of lentils they should be boiled in about a pint and a half of water boil them till they are tender which will take about half an hour then drain them off and put them back in the saucepan for a few minutes with a little piece of butter squeeze over them the juice of half a lemon and serve hot some people make a little thickened sauce with yolks of eggs and a little butter and flour mixed with the water in which they are boiled lentils curried lentils are very nice curried boil the lentils as directed above till they are tender when they are placed in a vegetable dish make deep well in the centre and pour some thick curry sauce into it see curry sauce lentils a la provencale soak the lentils overnight and put them into a stew pan with five or six spoonfuls of oil 
a little butter some slices of onion some chopped parsley and a teaspoonful of mixed savory herbs stew them in this till the lentils are tender and then thicken the sauce with yolks of eggs add a squeeze of lemon juice and serve n b haricot beans can be cooked in a similar manner end of section eighteen section nineteen of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter eight vegetables fresh artichokes french plain boiled put the artichokes to soak in some well salted water upside down as otherwise it is impossible to get rid of the insects that are sometimes hidden in the leaves trim off the ends of the leaves and the stalk and all the hard leaves round the bottom should be pulled off put the artichokes into a saucepan of boiling water sufficiently deep to nearly cover them the tips of the leaves are best left out add a little salt pepper and a spoonful of savory herbs to the water in which they are boiled french cooks generally add a piece of butter boil them till they are tender the time depends upon the size but you can always tell when they are done by pulling out a single leaf if it comes out easily the artichokes are done drain them off and remember in draining them to turn them upside down some kind of sauce is generally served with artichokes separately in a boat such as butter sauce sauce allemande or dutch sauce artichokes broiled parboil the artichokes and take out the part known as the choke in the hollow place a little chopped parsley and light-colored bread raspings soaked in olive oil place the bottoms of the artichokes on a gridiron with narrow bars over a clear fire and serve them as soon as they are thoroughly hot through artichokes fried the bottoms of artichokes after being boiled can be dipped in batter and fried artichokes a la provencale parboil the artichokes and remove the choke and put them in the oven in a tin with a little oil pepper and salt and three or four heads of garlic whole let them bake till they are tender turning them over in the oil occasionally then take out the garlic and serve them with the oil poured over them and add the juice of a lemon artichokes jerusalem boiled plain the artichokes must be first washed and peeled and should be treated like potatoes in this respect they should be thrown into cold water immediately and it is best to add a little vinegar to the water if the artichokes are young throw them into boiling water and they will become tender in about a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes it is very important not to overboil them as they turn a bad color if any doubt exists as to the age of the artichokes they had better be tested with a fork immediately they are tender they should be drained and served old artichokes must be treated like old potatoes i e put originally into cold water and when they come to the boiling point allowed to simmer till tender but these are best mashed when the artichokes have been drained they can of course be served quite plain but they are best sent to table with some kind of sauce poured over them such as allemande sauce dutch sauce white sauce or plain butter sauce they are greatly improved in appearance after a spoonful of sauce has been poured over each artichoke if a little blanched chopped parsley is sprinkled over them and a few red specks made by coloring a pinch of bread crumbs by shaking them with a few drops of cochineal another very nice way of sending artichokes to table is to place all the artichokes together in a vegetable dish and after pouring a little white sauce over each artichoke to place a fresh boiled bright green brussels sprout between each the white and green contrast very prettily jerusalem artichokes fried peel and slice the artichokes very thin throw these slices into smoking hot oil in which a frying basket has been placed as soon as the artichokes are a bright golden brown color lift out the frying basket shake it while you pepper and salt the artichokes and serve very hot they can be eaten with thin brown bread and butter and lemon juice and form a sort of vegetarian white bait 
artichokes mashed these are best made from old artichokes they must be rubbed through a wire sieve and the strings left behind it is best to mash them up with a little butter and a spoonful or two of cream is a very great improvement asparagus boiled cut the asparagus all the same length by bringing the green points together and then trimming the stalks level with a sharp knife throw the asparagus into boiling salted water time from fifteen to twenty five minutes according to thickness serve on dry toast and send butter sauce to table separate in a tureen beans broad plain boiled broad beans if eaten whole should be quite young they should be thrown into boiling water salted they require about twenty minutes to boil before they are tender serve with parsley and butter sauce broad beans mashed when broad beans get old the only way to serve them is to have them mashed boil them and remove the skins then mash them up with a little butter pepper and salt and rub them through a wire sieve make them hot and serve you can if you like boil a few green onions and a pinch of savory herbs with the beans and rub these through the wire sieve as well this dish is very cheap and very nourishing very young beans like very young peas are more nice than economical beans a la poulette boil some young beans till they are tender and put them into a saucepan with a little butter sugar pepper and salt and sufficient flour to prevent the butter cooking oily stew them in this a short time i e till they appear to begin to boil as the water from the beans will mix with the butter and flour and look like thin butter sauce thicken this with one or two yolks of eggs and serve beans a la bourgeoisie place the beans in a saucepan with a piece of butter a small quantity of shallot chopped fine and a teaspoonful of savory herbs toss them about in this a little time and then add a little water sufficient to moisten them so that they can stew add a little sugar and when tender thicken the water with some beaten up egg beans french plain boiled french beans are only good when fresh gathered and the younger they are the better when small they can be boiled whole in which case they only require the tips cut off and the string that runs down the side removed when they are more fully grown they will require in addition to being trimmed in this manner to be cut into thin strips and when very old it will be found best to cut them slanting they must be thrown into boiling salted water and boil till they are tender the time for boiling varies with the age very young ones will not take more than a quarter of an hour and if old ones are not tender in half an hour they had better be made into a puree as soon as the beans are tender drain them off and serve them very hot the chief point to bear in mind if we wish to have our beans nice is they must be eaten directly they are drained from the water in which they are boiled they are spoilt by what is called being kept hot and possess a marvelous facility of getting cold in a very short space of time in vegetarian cookery when beans are eaten without being an accompaniment to meat some form of fat is desirable when the beans are drained we can add either butter or oil when a lump of maitre d'hotel butter is added they form what the french call haricot vert a la maitre d'hotel in this case a slight suspicion of garlic may be added by rubbing the stew pan in which the french beans are tossed together with the maitre d'hotel butter when oil is added a little chopped parsley will be found an improvement as well as pepper salt and a suspicion of nutmeg french beans are very nice flavored with oil and garlic and served in a border of macaroni french bread pudding when french beans are very old they are sometimes made into a pudding as follows they must be trimmed cut up boiled with or without the addition of a few savory herbs they must be then mashed in a basin tied up in a well buttered and then floured cloth and boiled for some time longer the pudding can then be turned out a still better way of making a french bean pudding is to rub the beans through the wire sieve leaving the strings behind flavoring the pudding with a few savory herbs a little sugar pepper and salt and if liked a suspicion of garlic add one or two well beaten up eggs and put the mixture in a round pudding basin and bake it till it sets this can be turned out on the centre of a dish and a few young french beans placed around the base to ornament it in conjunction with some pieces of fried bread cut in pretty shapes 
Broccoli. Trim the outer leaves off a broccoli and cut off the stalk even, so that it will stand upright. Soak the broccoli in salt and water for some time in order to get rid of any insects. Throw the broccoli into boiling water that has been salted and boil it till it is tender, the probable time for young broccoli being about a quarter of an hour. It should be served on a dish with the flour part uppermost and butter sauce, sauce allemande, or Dutch sauce can be served separately or poured over the surface. When several heads of broccoli are served at once, it is important to cut the stalks flat as directed before boiling after they have been thoroughly drained upside down they should be placed on the dish flower part uppermost and placed together as much as possible to look like one large broccoli if sauce is poured over them the sauce should be sufficiently thick to be spread and every part of the flour should be covered half a teaspoonful of chopped blanched parsley may be sprinkled over the top and improves the appearance of the dish n b we would particularly call attention to the importance of draining broccoli and cauliflower very thoroughly especially when any sauce is served with the broccoli when the dish is cut into nothing looks more disagreeable than to see the white sauce running off the broccoli into green water at the bottom of the dish broccoli greens the outside leaves of broccoli should not be thrown away but eaten too often they are trimmed off at the green grocers or at the market and we presume utilized for the purpose of feeding cattle they can be boiled exactly like white cabbages and are equal to them if not superior in flavor to boil them see cabbage white large brussels sprouts these must be first washed in cold water and all the little pieces of decayed leaves trimmed away throw them into boiling salted water the water must be kept boiling the whole time without a lid on the saucepan and if the quantity of water be sufficiently large not to be taken off the boil by the sprouts being thrown in they will be sent to table of a far brighter green color than otherwise in order to ensure this throw in the sprouts a few at a time picking out the big ones to throw in first sprouts as soon as they are tender probable time a quarter of an hour should be drained and served quickly when served as a dish by themselves after being drained off they can be placed in a stew pan with a little butter pepper salt nutmeg and lemon juice they can then be served with toasted or fried bread cabbage plain boiled ordinary young cabbages should be first trimmed by having the outside leaves removed the stalks cut off and then should be cut in halves and allowed to soak some time in salt and water they should be thrown into plenty of boiling water the water should be kept boiling and uncovered as soon as they are tender they should be strained off and served immediately young summer cabbages will not take longer than a quarter of an hour or even less old cabbages take nearly double that time it is impossible to lay down any exact rule with regard to time savoys generally take about half an hour the large white cabbages met with in the west of england take longer and require a different treatment when cabbage is served as a dish by itself it will be found a great improvement to add either butter or oil to moisten the cabbage after it is thoroughly drained off in order to ensure the butter not oiling but adhering to the cabbage it is best after the butter is added and while you mix it with the cabbage to shake the flour dredger two or three times over the vegetable in germany many add vinegar and sugar to the cabbage cabbage large white in the west of england cabbages grow to an immense size owing probably to the moist heat and have been exhibited in agricultural shows over twenty pounds in weight and as big as an eighteen gallon cask these cabbages are best boiled as follows after being cut up and thoroughly washed it will be found that the greater part of the cabbage resembles what in ordinary cabbage would be called stalk and of course the leaves vary very considerably in thickness from the hard stalk end up to the leaf have plenty of boiling water ready salted now cut off the stalk part where it is thickest and throw this in first wait till the water comes to the boil again and let it boil for a few minutes then throw in the next thickest part and again wait till the water reboils and so on reserving the thin leafy part to be thrown in last of all by this means and this only do we get the cabbage boiled uniformly 
had we thrown in all at once one of two things would be inevitable either the stalk would be too hard to be eaten or the leafy part overboiled a large white cabbage takes about an hour to boil tender and a piece of soda should be added to the water when the cabbage is well drained it can be served either plain or moistened and made to look oily by the addition of a piece of butter as the cabbage is very white the dish is very much improved by the addition of a little chopped parsley sprinkled over the top not for the sake of flavor but appearance cabbage and cream ordinary cabbages are sometimes served stewed with a little cream they should be first parboiled then the moisture squeezed from them and then they must be put in a stew pan with a little butter pepper salt and nutmeg and a spoonful of flour should be shaken over the cabbage in order to prevent the butter being too oily when the cabbage is stewed till it is perfectly tender add a few spoonfuls of cream stir up and make the whole thoroughly hot and serve with fried or toasted bread cabbage red red cabbages are chiefly used for pickling they are sometimes served fresh they should be cut across so that the cabbage shreds boil till they are tender the moisture thoroughly extracted and then put into a stew pan with a little butter pepper and salt and a few shakes of flour from the flour dredger after stirring for ten minutes or a quarter of an hour squeeze the juice of a lemon over them and serve carrots boiled when carrots are boiled and served as a course by themselves they ought to be young this dish is constantly met with abroad in early summer but is rarely seen in england except at the tables of vegetarians the carrots should be trimmed thoroughly washed and if necessary slightly scraped and the point at the end which looks like a piece of string should be cut off they should be thrown into fast boiling water salted in order to preserve their color when tender they can be served with some kind of good white sauce or sauce allemande or dutch sauce perhaps this latter sauce is best of all as it looks like rich custard part of the red carrot should show uncovered by any sauce they are best placed in a circle and the thick sauce poured in the centre a very little chopped blanched parsley can be sprinkled on the top of the sauce in making dutch sauce for carrots use lemon juice instead of tarragon vinegar carrots fried fried carrots can be made from full-grown carrots they must be first parboiled and then cut in slices they must then be dipped in well beaten up egg and then covered with fine dry bread crumbs and fried a nice brown in smoking hot oil in a frying basket the slices of carrot should be peppered and salted before being dipped in the egg carrots mashed when carrots are very old they are best mashed boil them for some time then cut them up and rub them through a wire sieve they can be pressed in a basin and made hot by being steamed a little butter pepper and salt should be added to the mixture a very pretty dish can be made by means of mixing mashed carrots with mashed turnips they can be shaped in a basin and with a little ingenuity can be put into red and white stripes the effect is something like the top of a striped tent end of section nineteen section twenty of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 8 Vegetables Fresh, Part 2 Cauliflower Plain Boiled. Cauliflowers can be treated in exactly the same manner as broccoli and there are very few who can tell the difference. See broccoli. Cauliflower au gratin. This is a very nice method of serving cauliflower as a course by itself. The cauliflower or cauliflowers should first be boiled till thoroughly tender, very carefully drained, and then placed upright in a vegetable dish with the flower part uppermost. The whole of the flower part should then be masked, i.e. covered over, with some thick white sauce. Allemande sauce or Dutch sauce will do. This is then sprinkled over with grated Parmesan cheese and the dish put in the oven for the top to brown. As soon as it begins to brown, take it out of the oven and finish off neatly with a salamander, 
a red-hot shovel will do. The same way you finish cheesecakes made from curds. Cauliflower and Tomato Sauce Boil and place the cauliflower or flowers upright in a dish as in the above recipe. Now mask all the flower part very neatly, commencing round the edges first, with some tomato conserve, previously made warm, and serve immediately. This is a very pretty looking dish. Celery Stewed The secret of having good stewed celery is only to cook the white part. Throw the celery into boiling water, with only sufficient water just to cover it. When the celery is tender, use some of the water in which it is stewed to make a sauce to serve it with it, or better still, stew the celery in milk. The sauce looks best when it is thickened with the yolks of eggs. A very nice sauce indeed can be made by first thickening the milk or water in which the celery is stewed with a little white roux, and then adding a quarter of a pint of cream boiled separately. Stewed celery should be served on toast, like asparagus, a little chopped blanched parsley can be sprinkled over the white sauce by way of ornament, and fried bread should be placed round the edge of the dish. Stewed celery can also be served with sauce allemande or Dutch sauce. Endive Endive is generally used as a salad, but is very nice served as a vegetable stewed. White heart endives should be chosen, and several heads will be required for a dish as they shrink very much in cooking. Wash and clean the endives very carefully in salt and water first, as they often contain insects. Boil them in slightly salted water till they are tender, then drain them off and thoroughly extract the moisture. Put them in a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, salt, and nutmeg. Let them stew for some little time. Add the juice of a lemon and serve. It will make the dish much prettier if you reserve one head of endive boiled whole. Place the stewed endive on a dish and sprinkle some chopped blanched parsley over it. Then place the single head of endive upright in the center and place some fried bread round the edge. Leeks Stewed Leeks must be trimmed down to where the green part meets the white on the one side and the root, where the strings are, cut off on the other. They should be thrown into boiling water, boiled until they are tender, and then thoroughly drained. The water in which leeks have been boiled is somewhat rank and bitter, and as the leeks are like tubes, in order to drain them perfectly you must turn them upside down. They can be served on toast and covered with some kind of white sauce, either ordinary white sauce, sauce allemande, or Dutch sauce. Leeks, Welsh Porridge the leeks are stewed and cut in slices, and served in some of the liquor in which they are boiled, with toast cut in strips, something like onion porridge. Boil the leeks for five minutes, drain them off, and throw away the first water, and then stew them gently in some fresh water. In years back, in Wales, French plums were stewed with and added to the porridge. Lettuces Stewed as lettuces shrink very much when boiled, allowance must be made, and several heads used. This is also a very good way of utilizing the large old-fashioned English lettuce, resembling in shape a gingham umbrella. They should be first boiled till tender. The time depends entirely upon the size. Drain them off, and thoroughly extract the moisture. Put them into a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, salt, and nutmeg. Let them stew some little time and add a little vinegar, or, still better, lemon juice. Lettuces Stewed with Peas A border of stewed lettuces can be made as above, and the center filled up with some fresh-boiled young green peas. Onions Plain Boiled When onions are served as a dish by themselves, Spanish onions are far best for the purpose. Ordinary onions, as a rule, are too strong to be eaten except as an accompaniment to some other kind of food. When onions are plain boiled, they are best served on dry toast without any sauce at all. Butter can be added when eaten on the plate if liked. Large Spanish onions will require about three hours to boil tender. Onions Baked Spanish onions can be baked in the oven. They are best placed in saucers with a very little butter to prevent them sticking with which they can also be basted occasionally. Probable time about three hours. 
They should be at a nice brown color at the finish. Onions stewed. Place a large Spanish onion in a saucer at the bottom of the saucepan and put sufficient water in the saucepan to reach the edge of the saucer. Keep the lid of the saucepan on tight and let it steam till tender. A large onion would take about three hours. The water from the onion will prevent the necessity of adding fresh water from time to time. Parsnips Like young carrots, young parsnips are often met with abroad as a course by themselves. They should be trimmed and boiled whole, and served with white sauce. Alamond sauce or Dutch sauce, a little chopped blanched parsley, should be sprinkled over the sauce, and fried bread served round the edge of the dish. Parsnips, fried. Boil some full-grown parsnips till they are tender. Cut them into slices, pepper and salt them, dip them into beaten up egg, and cover them with bread crumbs, and fry these slices in some smoking hot oil till they are a nice brown color. Parsnips mashed. When parsnips are very old, they are best mashed. Boil them for an hour or more, then cut them up and rub them through a wire sieve. The stringy part will have to be left behind. Mix the pulp with a little butter, pepper and salt. Make this hot and serve. A little cream is a great improvement. Parsnip Cake Boil two or three parsnips until they are tender enough to mash. Then press them through a colander with the back of a wooden spoon and carefully remove any fibrous, stringy pieces there may be. Mix a teacupful of the mashed parsnip with a quart of hot milk. Add a teaspoonful of salt, four ounces of fresh butter, half a pint of yeast, and enough flour to make a stiff batter. Put the bowl which contains the mixture in a warm place. Cover it with a cloth and leave it to rise. When it has risen to twice its original size, knead some more flour into it. And let it rise again. Make it into small round cakes a quarter of an inch thick and place these on buttered tins. Let them stand before the fire a few minutes and bake them in a hot oven. They do not taste of the parsnip. Time some hours to rise, about 20 minutes to bake. Peas Green By far the best and nicest way of cooking green peas when served as a course by themselves is to stew them gently in a little butter without any water at all, like they do in France. The peas are first shelled and then placed in a stew pan with a little butter, sufficient to moisten them. As soon as they are tender, which will vary with the size and age of the peas, they can be served just as they are. The flavor of peas cooked this way is so delicious that they are nicest eaten with plain bread. When old peas are cooked this way, it is customary to add a little white powdered sugar. Peas green, plain boiled. Shell the peas and throw them into boiling water, slightly salted. Keep the lid off the saucepan and throw in a few sprigs of fresh green mint five minutes before you drain them off. Young peas will take about 10 to 20 minutes, and full-grown peas rather longer. Serve the peas directly. They are drained as they are spoilt by being kept hot. Peas Stewed When peas late in the season get old and tough, they can be stewed. Boil them for rather more than half an hour, throwing them first of all into boiling water, drain them off, and put them into a stew pan with a little butter, pepper and salt. Young onions and lettuces cut up can be stewed with them, but young green peas are far too nice ever to be spoiled by being cooked in this way. Scotch Kale Scotch Kale, or curly greens as it is sometimes called in some parts of the country, is cooked like ordinary greens. It should be washed very carefully and thrown into fast boiling salted water. The saucepan should remain uncovered as we wish to preserve the dark green color. Young scotch kale will take about 20 minutes to boil before it is tender. When boiled, if served as a course by itself, it should be strained off very thoroughly and warmed in a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, and salt. Sea kale. 
Sea kale possesses a very delicate flavor, and in cooking it, the endeavor should be to preserve this flavor. Throw the sea kale, when washed, into boiling water. In about 20 minutes, if it is young, it will be tender. Serve it on plain dry toast, and keep all the heads one way. Butter sauce, white sauce, Dutch sauce, or sauce allemande can be served with the sea kale, but should be sent to table separate in a boat, as the majority of good judges prefer the sea kale quite plain. Spinach The chief difficulty to contend with in cooking spinach is the preliminary cleansing. The best method of washing spinach is to take two buckets of water, wash it in one, the spinach will float on the top whilst the dirt settles at the bottom. Lift the spinach from one pail, after you have allowed it to settle for a few minutes, into the other pail. One or two rinsings will be sufficient. Spinach should be picked if the stalks are large and thrown into boiling water slightly salted. Boil the spinach till it is tender, which will take about a quarter of an hour, then drain it off and cut it very small in a basin with a knife and fork. Place it back in a saucepan with a little piece of butter to make it thoroughly hot. Put in a vegetable dish and serve. Hard-boiled eggs cut in halves or poached eggs are usually served with spinach. A little cream, nutmeg, and lemon juice can be added. Many cooks rub the spinach through a wire sieve. Vegetable marrow. Vegetable marrows must first be peeled, cut open, the pips removed, and then thrown into boiling water. Small ones should be cut into quarters, and large ones into pieces about as big as the palm of the hand. They take from 15 to 20 minutes to boil before they are tender. They should be served directly. They are cooked and placed on dry toast. Butter sauce or white sauce can be served with them, but is best sent to table separate in a boat, as many persons prefer them plain. Vegetable marrows stuffed. Young vegetable marrows are very nice stuffed. They should be first peeled very slightly and then cut long ways into three zigzag slices. The pips should be removed and the interior filled with either mushroom forcemeat, see mushroom forcemeat, or sage and onion stuffing made with rather an extra quantity of breadcrumbs. The vegetable marrow should be tied up with two separate loops of tape about a quarter of the way from each end, and these two rings of tape tied together with two or three separate pieces of tape to prevent them slipping off at the ends. The force meat or stuffing should be made hot before it is placed in the marrow. The vegetable marrow should now be thrown into boiling water and boiled till it is tender, about 20 minutes to half an hour. Take off the tape carefully and be careful to place the marrow so that one half rests on the other half or else it will slip. NB. If you place the stuffing inside cold, the vegetable marrow will break before the inside gets hot through. Turnips boiled. When turnips are young, they are best boiled whole. Peel them first very thinly and throw them into cold water until they are ready for the saucepan. Throw them into boiling water, slightly salted. They will probably take about 20 minutes to boil. They can be served quite plain or with any kind of white sauce, butter sauce, sauce allemande, or Dutch sauce. In vegetarian cookery, they are perhaps best served with some other kind of vegetable. Turnips mashed. All turnips are best mashed as they are stringy. Boil them till they get fairly tender they will take from half an hour to two hours, according to age. Then rub them through a wire sieve and warm up the pulp with a little milk, or still better, cream and a little butter, and pepper and salt. And B, if the pulp be very moist, let it stand and get rid of the moisture gradually in a frying pan over a very slack fire. Turnips Ornamental a very pretty way of serving young turnips in vegetarian cookery is to cut them in halves and scoop out the center so as to form cups. The part scooped out can be mixed with some carrot cut up into small pieces and some green peas and placed in the middle of a dish in a heap. The half turnips forming cups can be placed round the base of the dish and each cup filled alternately with the red part of the carrot chopped small and piled up and a spoonful of green peas. 
This makes a very pretty dish of mixed vegetables. Turnip Tops Turnip tops, when fresh cut, make very nice and wholesome greens. They should be thrown into boiling water and boiled for about 20 minutes, when they will be tender. They should be then cut up with a knife and fork very finely and served like spinach. If rubbed through a wire sieve and a little spinach extract mixed with them to give them the proper color and served with hard-boiled eggs, there are very few persons who can distinguish the dish from eggs and spinach. Vegetable Curry A border made of all kinds of mixed vegetables is very nice, sent to table with some good thick curry sauce poured in the center. Nettles to boil The best time to gather nettles for eating purposes is in the early spring. They are freely eaten in many parts of the country, as they are considered excellent for purifying the blood. The young light green leaves only should be taken. They must be washed carefully and boiled in two waters, a little salt and a very small piece of soda being put in the last water. When tender, turn them into a colander and press the water from them. Put them into a hot vegetable dish, score them across three or four times, and serve. Send melted butter to table in a tureen. Time, about a quarter of an hour to boil. Salsify Scrape the salsify and throw it into cold water with a little vinegar. Then throw it into boiling water, boil till tender, and serve on toast with white sauce. Time to boil, about one hour. End of section 20「Section 21 of Castle's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Castle's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 9 Preserved Vegetables and Fruits. Vegetables and fruits are preserved in two ways. We can have them preserved both in bottles and tins, but the principle is exactly the same in both cases, the method of preservation being simply that of excluding the air. We will not enter into the subject of how to preserve fruit and vegetables, but will confine ourselves to discussing, as briefly as possible, the best method of using them when they are preserved. Unfortunately, there exists a very unreasonable prejudice on the part of many persons against all kinds of provisions that are preserved in tins. This prejudice is kept alive by stories that occasionally get into print about families being poisoned by using tinned goods. We hear stories also of poisoning resulting from using copper vessels. Housekeepers should endeavor to grasp the idea that the evil is the result of their own ignorance, and that no danger would accrue were they possessed of a little more elementary knowledge of chemistry. If a penny be dipped in vinegar and exposed to the air, and is then licked by a child, a certain amount of ill effect would undoubtedly ensue but it does not follow that we should give up the use of copper money. So, too, if we use tinned goods, and owing to our own carelessness or ignorance, find occasionally that evil results ensue, we should not give up the use of the goods in question, but endeavor to find out the cause why these evil results follow only occasionally. All good cooks know, or ought to know, that if they leave the soup all night in a saucepan, the soup is spoilt. Again, all housekeepers know that although they have a metal tank, they are bound to have a wooden lid on top, there being a law to this effect. The point they forget in using tinned goods is this. So long as the air is excluded from the interior of the tin, no chemical action goes on whatever. When, therefore, they open the tin, if they turn out the contents at once, no harm can ensue. Unfortunately, there are many thousands who will open a tin, take out what they want, and leave the remainder in the tin. Of course, they have only themselves to blame, should evil result. Preserved vegetables are so useful that they are inseparable from civilized cookery. For instance, what would a French cook do were he dependent for his mushrooms upon those fresh grown in the fields? The standard dish at vegetarian restaurants is mushroom pie, and thanks to tinned mushrooms we can obtain this dish all the year round. In most restaurants, peas are on the bill of fare throughout the year. Were we dependent on fresh-grown ones, this popular dish would be confined almost to a few weeks. In the case of preserved goods, tinned fruits are even more valuable than tinned vegetables. Ripe apricots and peaches picked fresh from the tree are expensive luxuries that in this country can only be indulged in by the rich, whereas 
thanks to the art of preserving, we are enabled to enjoy them all the year round. We will run briefly through a few of the chief vegetables and fruits, and give a few hints how best to use them. First of all, asparagus tinned. Place the tin in the saucepan with sufficient cold water to cover it. Bring the water to a boil, and let it boil for five minutes. Take out the tin, and cut it open round the edge, as near to the edge as possible. Otherwise, you will be apt to break the asparagus in turning it out. Drain off the liquor, and serve the asparagus on freshly made hot toast. There is much less waste, as a rule, in tinned asparagus than in that freshly cut. As a rule, you can eat nearly the whole of it. Peas tinned. Put the tin before it is opened into cold water. Bring the water to a boil, and let it boil for five minutes, or longer if the tin is a large one. Cut open the tin at the top, pour out the liquor, and serve the peas with a few sprigs of fresh mint, if it can be obtained, that have been boiled for two or three minutes. Supposing the tin to contain a pint of peas, add, while the peas are thoroughly hot, a brimming saltspoonful of finely powdered sugar, and half a saltspoonful of salt. If the peas are to be eaten by themselves, as is generally the case with vegetarians, add a good-sized piece of butter. French Beans Tinned These can be treated in exactly a similar manner to green peas, only instead of adding mint, add a little chopped blanched parsley. The same quantity of sugar and salt should be added as in the case of peas. After the butter has melted, it is a great improvement, when the beans are eaten as a course by themselves, with bread, if the juice of half a lemon is added. Flagellets tinned. For this delicious vegetable in England we are dependent upon tinned goods, as we cannot recall an instance in which they can be bought freshly gathered. Warm up the beans in the tin by placing the tin in cold water, bringing the water to a boil, and letting it boil for five minutes. Drain off the liquor. Add a saltspoonful of sugar, half a one of salt, and a lump of butter. Instead of butter, you can add to each pint two tablespoonfuls of pure olive oil. Many persons consider it a great improvement to rub the vegetable dish with a bead of garlic. In this case, the beans should be tossed about in the dish for a minute or two. Brussels sprouts tinned. The tin should be made hot before it is opened, the liquor drained off, and the sprouts placed in a dish with a little butter or oil, powdered sugar, salt, pepper, and a slight flavoring of nutmeg. In France, in some parts, a little cream is poured over them. Spinach tinned. Spinach is sold in tins fairly cheap, and quoting from the list of a large retail establishment where prices correspond with those of the civil service stores, a tin of spinach can be obtained for five pence halfpenny. The spinach should be made very hot in the tin, turned out onto a dish, and hard-boiled eggs, hot, cut in halves, added. Some people add also a little vinegar, but unless persons' tastes are known beforehand, that is best added on the plate. Carrots tinned Young carrots can be obtained in tins, and as only young carrots are nice when served as a course by themselves, these will be found a valuable addition to the vegetarian store cupboard. Make the carrots hot in the tin and let the water boil for quite ten minutes after it comes to the boiling point. Drain off the liquor and serve them with some kind of white sauce, exactly as if they were freshly boiled young carrots. Turnips tinned proceed exactly the same as in the case of the carrots. Fond d'artichoc. These consist of the bottom part only of French artichokes. They should be made hot in the tin and served up with some good butter sauce and cut lemon separate, as many prefer the artichokes plain. Macedoines. This, as the word implies, is a mixture of various vegetables, the chief of which are generally chopped up carrot and turnip with young green peas. A very nice dish, which can be served at a very short notice, if you have curry sauce in bottles, is a dish of vegetable curry. The macedoines should be made hot in the tin, the liquor drained off, and the curry sauce made hot should be poured into a well made in the center of the macedoines in the dish. Macedoines are also very useful, as they can be served as a vegetable salad at a moment's notice, as the vegetables are sufficiently cooked without being made hot. Tinned Fruits Tinned fruits are ready for eating directly the tin is opened. All we have to bear in mind is to turn them all out of the tin onto a dish immediately. Do not leave any in the tin to be used at another time. 
Most tinned fruits can be served just as they are in a glass dish, but a great improvement can be made in their appearance at a very small cost, and with a very little extra trouble, if we always have in the house a little preserved angelica and a few dried cherries. As these cost about a shilling or one and four pence per pound, and even a quarter of a pound is sufficient to ornament two or three dozen dishes, the extra expense is almost nil. Apricots Tinned Pile the apricots up with the convex side uppermost, in a glass dish, reserving one cup apricot to go on the top, with the concave side uppermost. Take a few preserved cherries and cut them in halves, and stick half a cherry in all the little holes or spaces where the apricots meet. Cut four little green leaves out of the angelica, about the size of the thumbnail, only a little longer. The size of a filbert would perhaps describe the size better. Put a whole cherry in the apricot cup at the top, and four green leaves of angelica around it. Take the white kernel of the apricot, one or two will always be found in every tin, and cut four white slices out of the middle. Place these round the red cherry, touching the cherry, and resting between the four green leaves of angelica. The top of this dish has now the appearance of a very pretty flower. Peaches Tinned These can be treated in exactly a similar way to the apricots. Peaches and Apricots with Cream Place the fruit in a glass dish with the concave side uppermost, pour the syrup round the fruit, and with a teaspoon remove any syrup that may have settled in the little cups, for such the half-peaches or apricots may be called. Get a small jar of Devonshire clotted cream, take about half a teaspoonful of cream, and place it in the middle of each cup, and place a single preserved cherry on the top of the cream. This dish can be made still prettier by chopping up a little green angelica, like parsley, and sprinkling a few of those little green specks on the white cream. Pineapple Tinned Pineapples are preserved in tins whole, and are very superior in flavoring to those which are sold cheap on barrows, which are more rotten than ripe. They require very little ornamenting, but the top is greatly improved by placing a red cherry in the center, and cutting eight strips of green angelica like spikes, reaching from the cherry to the edge of the pineapple. They should be cut in exact lengths, so as not to overlap. The top of the pineapple looks like a green star with a red center. Pears Tinned Tinned pears are exceedingly nice in flavor, but the drawback to them is their appearance. They look like pale and rather dirty wax, while the syrup with which they are surrounded resembles the water in which potatoes have been overboiled. The prettiest way of sending them to the table is as follows. Take, say, a teacupful of rice, wash it very carefully, boil it, and let it get dry and cold. Take the syrup from the pears and taste it, and if not sweet enough, add some powdered sugar. Put the rice in a glass dish, and make a very small well in the center, and pour all the syrup into this, so that it soaks into the rice at the bottom of the dish, without affecting the appearance of the surface. In the meantime, place the pears themselves on a dish, and let the syrup drain off them and if you can, let them stand for an hour or two to let them dry all the better. Now, with an ordinary brush, paint these waxy-looking pears a bright red with a little cochineal, and place these half-pears on the white rice, slanting with the thick part downwards and the stock-end uppermost. Cut a few sticks of green angelica about an inch and a half long, and of the thickness of the ordinary stalk of a pear, and stick one of these into the stalk-end of each pear. The red pear with the green stalk resting on the snow-white bed of rice looks very pretty. A little chopped angelica can be sprinkled over the white rice, like chopped parsley. Fruits Bottled When apricots and peaches are preserved in bottles, they can be treated exactly in a similar manner to those preserved in tins. It will be found advisable, however, to taste the syrup in the bottle, as it will be often found that it requires the addition of a little more sugar. Ordinary bottled fruits, such as gooseberries, currants, raspberries, rhubarb, damsons, cranberries, etc., can be used for making fruit pies, or they can be set to table simply as stewed fruit. In this case, some whipped cream on the top is a very great improvement. Another very nice way of sending these bottled fruits to the table is to fill a border made with rice, as described in Chapter 3. End of Section 21《Section 22 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 10 Jellies, Vegetarian, and Jams. By vegetarian jelly, we mean jellies made on vegetarian principles. To be consistent, if we cannot use anchovy sauce because it is made from fish, on the same principle, we cannot use either gelatin or isinglass, which, of course, as everybody knows, is made from fishes. For all this, there is no reason why vegetarians should not enjoy jellies quite equal, so far as flavor is concerned, to ordinary jelly. The simplest substitute for gelatin, or what is virtually the same thing, isinglass, is corn flour. Tapioca could be used, but corn flour saves much trouble. Some persons may urge that it is not fair to give the name of jelly to a corn flour pudding. There is, however, a very great difference between a corn flour pudding flavored with orange and what we may call an orange jelly, in which corn flour is only introduced, like gelatin, for the purpose of transforming a liquid into a solid. We also have this advantage in using corn flour. It is much more simple and can be utilized for making a very large variety of jellies, many of which probably will be new even to vegetarians themselves. We all agree on one point. For example, the wholesomeness of freshly picked ripe fruit. We will suppose the season to be autumn and the blackberries ripe on the hedgerows and that the children of the family are nothing loath to gather, say, a couple of quarts. We will now describe how to make a mold of blackberry jelly. Put the blackberries in an enameled saucepan with a little water at the bottom, and let them stew gently till they yield up their juice, or they can be placed in a jar in the oven. They can now be strained through a hair sieve, but still better, they can be squeezed dry in a tamis cloth. This juice should now be sweetened, and it can be made into jelly in two ways, both of which are perfectly lawful in vegetarian cookery. The juice, like red currant juice, can be boiled with a large quantity of white sugar till the jelly sets of its own accord. In this case, we should require one pound of sugar to every pint of juice, and the result would be a blackberry jelly, like red currant jelly, more like a preserve than the jelly we are accustomed to eat at dinner alone for instance no one would care to eat a quantity of red currant jelly like we should ordinary orange or lemon jelly it would be too sickly consequently we will take a pint or a quart of our blackberry juice only and sufficient sugar to make it agreeably sweet without being sickly we will boil this in a saucepan and add a tablespoonful of corn flour mixed with a little cold juice to every pint to make the juice thick this can now be poured into a mold or plain round basin we will suppose the latter when the jelly has got quite cold we can turn it out on to a dish say a silver dish with a piece of white ornamental paper at the bottom we now have to ornament this mold of blackberry jelly and as a rule it will be found that no ornament can surpass natural ones before boiling the blackberries for the purpose of extracting their juice, pick out two or three dozen of the largest and ripest, wash them, and put them by with some of the young green leaves of the blackberry plant itself, which should be picked as nearly as possible of the same size, and, like the blackberries, must be washed. Now place a row of blackberry leaves round the base of the mold, with the stalk of the leaf under the mold, and on each leaf, place a ripe blackberry touching the mold itself take four very small leaves and stick them on the top of the mold in the centre and put the largest and best looking blackberry of all upright in the centre this dish is now pretty looking enough to be served on really great occasions we consider this dish worthy of being called blackberry jelly and not corn flour pudding lemon jelly take six lemons and half a pound of sugar and rub the sugar on the outside of three of the lemons. The lemons must be hard and yellow. The peel should not be shriveled. Now squeeze the juice of all six lemons into a basin. Add the sugar and a pint of water. Of course, the lemon juice must be strained. If wine is allowed, add half a pint of good golden sherry or Madeira. 
bring this to the boil and thicken it with some corn flour in the ordinary way allowing a tablespoonful of corn flour for every pint of fluid pour it into a mold and when it is set turn it out a lemon jelly like this should be turned on to a piece of ornamental paper placed at the bottom of a silver or some other kind of dish the base of the mold should be ornamented with thin slices of lemon cut in half the diameter touching the base of the mold and the semicircular piece of peel outside if a round basin has been used for a mold place a corner of a lemon on the top in the middle surrounded with a few imitation green leaves cut out of angelica this improves the dish in appearance and also shows what the dish is made of orange jelly take six oranges two lemons and half a pound of lump sugar rub the sugar on the outside of three of the oranges squeeze the juice of the six oranges into a basin with the juice of two lemons strain add the sugar and a pint of water the liquid will be of an orange color owing to the rind of the orange rubbed on to the sugar if wine be allowed add half a pint of golden sherry or madeira bring the liquid to boiling point and then thicken it with corn flour and pour it while hot into a mold or plain white basin when cold turn it out on to a piece of ornamental paper placed at the bottom of a dish surround the bottom of the mold with thin slices of orange cut into quarters and the center part pushed under the mold place the small end of an orange on the top of the mold with some little leaves or spikes of green angelica placed round the edge black currant jelly the juice of black currants makes excellent jelly in the ordinary way if we boil a pint of black currant juice with a pound of sugar till it sets but a mold of black currant jelly suitable to be used as a sweet at dinner can be made by adding less sugar and thickening the juice with corn flour allowing about a tablespoonful to every pint and pouring it into a mold or plain round basin the mold can be ornamented as follows and we will suppose a pudding basin to be used for the purpose we will suppose the mold of jelly to have been turned out onto a clean sheet of white paper pick some of the brighter green black currant leaves off the tree and place these round the base of the mold with the stalk of the leaf pushed underneath and the point of the leaf pointing outwards now choose a few very small bunches of black currants wash these and dip them into very weak gum and water and then dip them into white powdered sugar they now look when they are dry as if they were crystallized or covered with hoar frost place one of these little bunches with the stalk stuck into the mold of jelly about an inch from the bottom so that each bunch rests on a green leaf cut a small stick of angelica and stick it into the top of the mold upright and let a bunch of frosted black currants hang over the top if we wish to make the mold of jelly very pretty as a supper dish where there is a good top light we can dip the green leaves into wheat gum and water and then sprinkle over them some powdered glass red currant jelly red currant jelly can be made in exactly a similar manner substituting red currants for black raspberry jelly the raspberries should be picked very ripe and two or three dozen of the best looking ones of the largest and ripest should be reserved for ornamenting if possible also gather some red currants and mix with the raspberries on account of the color which otherwise would be very poor indeed it will be found best to rub the raspberries through a hair sieve as the addition of the pulp very much improves the flavor of the jelly the sieve should be sufficiently fine to prevent the pips of the raspberries passing through it the juice and pulp from the raspberries and currants can now be thickened with corn flour as directed in the recipe for blackberry jelly raspberry leaves should be placed round the base of the jelly and a ripe raspberry placed on each the best looking raspberry can be placed on the top of the mold in the center of two or three raspberry leaves stuck in the jelly apple jam and apple jelly the following recipe is taken from a year's cookery by phyllis brown the best time for making apple jelly is about the middle of november almost all kinds of apples may be used for the purpose though if a clear white jelly is wanted 
colvilles or orange pippins should be chosen if red jelly is preferred very rosy-cheeked apples should be taken and the skin should be boiled with the fruit apple jam is made of the fruit after the juice has been drawn off for jelly economical housekeepers will find that very excellent jelly can be made of apple parings so that where apples in any quantity have been used for pies and tarts the skins can be stewed in sufficient water to cover them and when the liquor is strongly flavored it can be strained and boiled with sugar to a jelly to make apple jelly pare core and slice the apples and put them into a preserving pan with enough water to cover them stir them occasionally and stew gently till the apples have fallen then turn all into a jelly bag and strain away the juice but do not squeeze or press the pulp measure the liquid and allow a pound of sugar to a pint of juice put both juice and sugar back into the preserving pan and if liked add one or two cloves tied in muslin or two or three inches of lemon rind boil gently and skim carefully for about half an hour or till a little of the jelly put upon a plate will set pour it while hot into jars and when cold and stiff cover down in the usual way if yellow jelly is wanted a pinch of saffron tied in muslin should be boiled with the juice to make apple jam weigh the apple pulp after the juice has been drawn from it rub it through a hair sieve and allow one pound of sugar to one pint of pulp and the grated rind of a lemon to three pints of pulp boil all gently together till the jam will set when a little is put on a plate apple jam is sometimes flavored with vanilla instead of lemon dams and jelly dams and jelly can be made in two ways the juice can be boiled with sugar till it gets like red currant jelly or the juice of the damsons can be sweetened with less sugar and thickened with corn flour in order to extract the juice from damsons they should be sliced and placed in a jar or basin and put in the oven they are best left in the oven all night if the mold of jelly is made in a round basin a single whole damson can be placed on the top of the mold and green leaves placed round the base pineapple jelly the syrup from a preserved pine should the pineapple itself be used for mixing with other fruits or for ornamental purposes can be utilized by being made into a mold of jelly and by being thickened with corn flour it will bear the addition of a little water apricot jelly the juice from tinned apricots can be treated like that of pineapple when a mixture of fruits is served in a large bowl the syrup from tinned fruit should not be added but at the same time of course should be used in some other way mulberry jelly mulberries of course would not be bought for the purpose but those who possess a mulberry tree in their garden will do well to utilize what are called windfalls by making mulberry jelly the juice can be extracted by placing the fruit in a jar and putting it in the oven sugar must be added and the juice thickened with corn flour there are few other ways of using unripe mulberries jams homemade jam is not so common now as it was some years back as a rule it does not answer from an economical point of view to buy fruit to make jam on the other hand those who possess a garden will find homemade jam a great saving those who have attempted to sell their fruit probably know this to their cost in making every kind of jam it is essential the fruit should be picked dry it is also a time-honored tradition that the fruit is best picked when basking in the morning sun it is also necessary that the fruit should be free from dust and that all decayed or rotten fruit should be carefully picked out jam is made by boiling the fruit with sugar and it is false economy to get common sugar cheap sugar throws up a quantity of scum years back many persons used brown sugar but in the present day the difference in the price of brown and white sugar is so trifling that the latter should always be used for the purpose the sugar should not be crushed it is best to boil the fruit before adding the sugar the scum should be removed and a wooden spoon used for the purpose a large enamel stew pan can be used but tradition is in favor of a brass preserving pan it will be found best to boil the fruit as rapidly as possible the quantity of sugar varies slightly with the fruit used 
supposing we have a pound of fruit the following list gives what is generally considered about the proper quantity of sugar apricot jam three quarters of a pound blackberry jam half a pound if apple is mixed rather more black currant jam one pound red currant jam one pound damson jam one pound gooseberry jam three quarters of a pound green gauge jam three quarters of a pound plum jam one pound raspberry jam one pound strawberry jam three quarters of a pound carrot jam if you wish the jam to be of a good color only use the outside or red part of the carrots add the rind and the juice of one lemon and one pound of sugar to every pound of pulp a little brandy is a great improvement rhubarb jam to every pound of pulp add three quarters of a pound of sugar and the juice of one lemon and the rind of half a lemon essence of almonds can be substituted for the lemon vegetable marrow jam add three quarters of a pound of sugar to every pound of pulp the jam can be flavored either with ginger or lemon juice end of section twenty two section twenty three of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter eleven creams custards and cheesecakes creams creams may be divided into two classes whipped cream flavored in a variety of ways and the solid molds of cream which when turned out look extremely elegant but which when tasted are somewhat disappointing these latter molds owe their firmness and consistency to the addition of isinglass and as this substance is not allowed in vegetarian cookery we shall be able to dispense with cream served in this form nor are we losers by so doing the ordinary mould of cream is too apt to taste like spongy liver and so far as palate is concerned is incomparably inferior to the more delicate whipped creams just in the same way a good rich custard made with yolks of eggs is spoilt by being turned into a solid custard by the addition of gelatin in order to have good whipped cream the first essential is to obtain pure cream this greatly depends upon the neighbourhood in which we live in country houses away from large towns there is as a rule no trouble whereas in london really good cream can only be obtained with great difficulty there is a well-known old story of the london milkman telling the cook who complained of the quality of the cream to stir it up as the cream settled at the bottom we will not enter into the subject of the adulteration of cream in big cities as probably many of these stories are gross exaggerations though it is said that pig's brains and even horses brains have been used for the purpose of giving the cream a consistency while undoubtedly turmeric has been used to give it a color we will suppose that we have say a quart of really good thick cream all that is necessary is to beat up the cream with a whisk till it becomes a froth this is much more easily done in cold weather than in hot and if the weather be very warm it is best to put the tin or pan containing the cream into ice an hour or two before it is used old french cookery books recommend the addition of a little powdered gum not bigger than a pea and the gum recommended is that known as traganketh others again beat up the white of an egg to a stiff froth and add this to the cream it is a good plan when the cream fails to froth completely to take off the top froth and drain it on a sieve placed upside down the cream that drains through can be added to what is left and re-whipped it is also a good plan to make whipped cream some time before it is wanted and indeed it can be prepared with advantage the day before when the cream is drained we are supposing a quart to have been used it should be mixed with three or four ounces of very finely powdered sugar as well as the particular kind of flavoring that will give the cream its name for instance we can have if liqueurs are allowed maraschino cream this is simply made by mixing a small glass of maraschino with some whipped cream properly sweetened coffee cream 
make a very strong infusion of pure coffee that has been roasted a high color it will be found best to re-roast coffee berries in the oven if you have not got a proper coffee roaster pound the berries in a pestle and mortar or grind them very coarsely then make a strong infusion with a very small quantity of water and strain it till it is quite bright this is mixed with the whipped sweetened cream chocolate cream take about two ounces of the very best chocolate and dissolve it in a little boiling water let it get cold and then mix with the whipped sweetened cream vanilla cream vanilla cream is nicest when a fresh vanilla pod is used for the purpose but a more simple process is to use a little essence of vanilla orange cream rub some lumps of sugar on the outside of an orange and pound this sugar very finely and then mix it with the whipped cream lemon cream proceed exactly as in making orange cream only substituting lemon for orange strawberry cream the juice only of the strawberry should be used this juice should be mixed with the powdered sugar and then used for mixing with the whipped cream it is a mistake in making creams to have too much flavoring the juice of a quarter of a pound of ripe red strawberries would be sufficient for a quart of cream pistachio cream take about half a pound of pistachio kernels throw them for a minute or two into boiling water and then rub off the skins throwing them into cold water like you do in blanching almonds pound these in a mortar with a tablespoonful of orange flower water and mix a little spinach extract to give it a color now mix this with the whipped sweetened cream very thoroughly this bright green cream makes a very elegant dish custards good custard forms perhaps the best cold sweet sauce known it can be made very cheaply and on the other hand it may be made in such a manner as to be very expensive we will first describe how to make the most expensive kind of custard as very often we can gather ideas from a high-class model and carry them out in an inexpensive way the highest class custard is made by only using yolks of eggs instead of whole eggs and we can use cream in addition to milk the great art in making custard is to take care it does not curdle six yolks of eggs half a pint of milk half a pint of cream sweetened would of course form a very expensive custard an ordinary custard can be made as follows take four large or five small eggs beat them up very thoroughly and add them gradually to a pint of sweetened milk that has been boiled separately in order to thicken the custard it is a good plan to put it in a jug and stand the jug in a saucepan of boiling water and stir the custard till it is sufficiently thick custard can be flavored in various ways one of the cheapest and perhaps nicest is to boil one or two bay leaves in the milk custard can also be flavored by the addition of a small quantity of the essence of vanilla if you use a fresh pod vanilla tie it up in a little piece of muslin and have a string to it this can be boiled in the milk till the milk is sufficiently flavored and this pod can be used over and over again of course as it loses its flavor it will have to remain in the milk longer cheap custard a very cheap custard can be made by adding to one pint of boiled milk one well beaten up egg and one good sized teaspoonful of corn flour the milk should be first sweetened and can be flavored very cheaply by rubbing a few lumps of sugar on the outside of a lemon or by having a few bay leaves boiled in it a rich yellow color can be obtained by using a small quantity of yellow vegetable coloring extract which like the green coloring is sold in bottles by all grocers these bottles are very cheap as they last a long time they simply give any kind of pudding a rich coloring without imparting any flavor whatever and in this respect are very superior to saffron apple custard good apple custard can only be made by using apples of a good flavor when apples are in season this dish can be made fairly cheaply but it does not do to use those high-priced imported apples peel and take out the cores of about four pounds of apples and let these simmer till they are quite tender in rather more than a pint of water add about one pound of sugar or rather less if the apples are sweet add a little powdered cinnamon and mix all this with eight eggs well beaten up stir the mixture very carefully in a saucepan or better still in a good-sized jug 
placed in a saucepan till it begins to thicken this custard is best served in glasses and a little cinnamon sugar can be shaken over the top nutmeg may be used instead of cinnamon and by many is thought superior cheesecakes cheesecakes can be sent to table in two forms the one some rich kind of custard or cream placed in little round pieces of pastry or we can have a so-called cheesecake baked in a pie dish the edges only of which are lined with puff paste we can also have cheesecakes very rich and cheesecakes very plain the origin of the name cheesecake is that originally they were made from curds used in making cheese probably most people consider that the cheesecakes made from curds are superior and in the north of england and especially in yorkshire where curds are exposed for sale in the windows at so much a pound very delicious cheesecakes can be made but considerable difficulty will be experienced if we attempt to make homemade curds from london milk curds are made by taking any quantity of milk and letting it nearly boil then throw in a little rennet or a glass of sherry the curds must be well strained cheesecakes from curds take half a pound of curds and press the curds in a napkin to extract the moisture take also six ounces of lump sugar and rub the sugar on the outside of a couple of oranges or lemons dissolve this sugar in two ounces of butter made hot in a tin in the oven mix this with the curds with two ounces of powdered ratafias and a little grated nutmeg about half a nutmeg to this quantity will be required add also six yolks of eggs mix this well together and fill the tartlet cases made from puff paste and bake them in the oven it is often customary to place in the center of each cheesecake a thin strip of candied peel as soon as the cheesecakes are done take them out of the oven and if the mixture be of a bad color finish it off with a salamander but do not let them remain in the oven too long so that the pastry becomes brittle and dried up these cheesecakes can be made on a larger scale than the ordinary ones so familiar to all who have looked into a pastry cook's window suppose we make them of the size of a breakfast saucer a very rich and delicious cheesecake can be made by adding some chopped dry cherries to the mixture sometimes ordinary grocer's currants are added and the ratafias omitted sultana raisins can be used instead of currants and by many are much preferred this mixture can be baked in a shallow pie dish and time edge of the dish lined with puff paste but cheesecakes made from curds are undoubtedly expensive cheesecakes from potatoes exceedingly nice cheesecakes can be made from remains of cold potatoes and can be made very cheap by increasing the quantity of potatoes used take a quarter of a pound of butter four eggs two fresh lemons and a half a pound of lump sugar first of all rub off all the outsides of two lemons on to the sugar oil the butter in a tin in the oven and melt the sugar in it squeeze the juice of the two lemons and take care that the sugar is thoroughly dissolved before you begin to mix all the ingredients together now beat up the eggs very thoroughly and mix the whole in a basin this now forms a very rich mixture indeed a good sized teaspoonful of which would be sufficient for the interior of an ordinary sized cheesecake but a far better plan is to make a large cheesecake or rather cheesecake pudding in a pie dish by adding cold boiled potatoes the plainness or richness of the pudding depends entirely upon the amount of potatoes added the pie dish can be lined with a little puff paste round the edge if preferred or the pudding can be sent to table plain it should be baked in the oven till the top is nicely browned it can be served either hot or cold but in our opinion is nicer cold if the lemons are very fresh and green if the pudding is sent to table hot you will often detect the smell of turpentine if a large quantity of potatoes is added more sugar will be required orange cheesecake proceed exactly as above only substituting two oranges for two lemons almond cheesecakes proceed exactly as above only instead of rubbing the sugar on the outside of lemons add a small quantity of essence of almonds apple cheesecakes apple cheesecakes can be made in a similar manner to apple custard 
the only difference being that the mixture is baked till it sets. End of section 23section twenty four of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter twelve stewed fruits and fruit ices there are few articles of diet more wholesome than fruit in every shape provided it is fresh it is a great mistake however to suppose that fruit when too stale to be eaten as it is is yet good enough for stewing we often hear especially in summer weather of persons being made ill from eating fruit probably in every case the injury results not from eating fruit as fruit but from eating it when it is too stale to be served as an article of food at all there is an immense amount of injury done to this country by the importation of rotten plums more especially from germany and it is to be regretted that more stringent laws are not made to prevent the importation of all kinds of food hurtful to health we will suppose that in every recipe we are about to give the fruit is at any rate fresh we do not say ripe because there are many instances in which fruit not ripe enough to be eaten raw is exceedingly wholesome when stewed properly and sweetened as an instance we may mention green gooseberries and hard green gauges which though quite unedible in their natural state yet make delicious fruit pies or dishes of stewed fruit of all dishes there are few to equal what is called a compote of fruit and there are probably few sweets more popular than compote of fruit a compote of fruit consists of a variety of fresh fruits mixed together in a bowl some may be stewed and some served in their natural state or the whole may be stewed when a large variety of fruits can be obtained and are sent to table in an old-fashioned china family bowl few dishes present a more elegant appearance especially if you happen to possess an old-fashioned punch ladle an old silver bowl with a black whalebone handle care should be taken to keep the fruit from being broken the following fruits will mix very well although of course it is impossible always to obtain every variety we can have strawberries raspberries red white and black currants and cherries as well as peaches nectarines and apricots we can also have stewed apples and stewed pears very much of course will depend upon the time of year those fruits that want stewing should be placed in some hot syrup previously made and only allowed to stew till tender enough to be eaten tinned fruits especially apricots can be mixed with fresh fruits only it is best not to use the syrup in the tin as it will probably overpower the flavor of the other fruits the syrup as far as possible should be bright and not cloudy the fruit in the bowl should be mixed but should not be stirred up we should endeavor as much as possible to keep the colors distinct if strawberries or raspberries form part of the compote the syrup will get red should black currants be present avoid breaking them as they spoil the appearance of the syrup in summer the compote of fruits is much improved by the addition of a lump of ice and a glass of good old brandy should the compote of fruits as is often the case be intended for a garden party where it will have to stand a long time if possible get a small bowl like those in which gold and silver fish are sold in the street for sixpence and fill this with ice and place it in the middle of the larger bowl containing fruit otherwise the melted ice will utterly spoil the juice that runs from the fruit which is sweetened with the syrup and flavored with the brandy if much brandy be added old ladies at garden parties will be found to observe that the juice is the best part of it apples stewed peel and cut out the cores of the apples and stew them gently in some syrup composed of about half a pound of white sugar and rather more than a pint of water a small stick of cinnamon or a few cloves and a strip of lemon peel can be added to the syrup but should be taken out when finished the apples should be stewed till they are tender but must not be broken 
the syrup in which the apples are stewed should of course be served with them this syrup can be colored slightly with a few drops of cochineal but should not be colored more than very slightly the syrup looks a great deal better if it is clear and bright it can be strained and clarified apples are very nice stewed in white french wine such as chablis or grave stewed pears pears known as cooking pears take a long time to stew they should be peeled and the cores removed and then stewed very gently in a syrup composed of half a pound of sugar to about a pint and a half of water add a few cloves to the syrup say two cloves to each pear the pears will probably take from two to three hours to stew before they are tender when tender add a glass of port wine and a little cochineal if the pears are stewed like they are abroad in claret add cinnamon instead of the cloves stewed rhubarb stewed rhubarb is of two kinds when it first comes into season it is small tender and of a bright red color and when stewed makes a very pretty dish the red rhubarb should be cut into little pieces about two inches long very little water will be required as the fruit contains a great deal of water in itself the amount of sugar added depends entirely upon taste the stewed rhubarb should be sent to table unbroken and floating in a bright red juice when rhubarb is old and green it is best served more like a puree or mashed very old rhubarb is often stringy and can with advantage be rubbed through a wire sieve it is no use attempting to color old rhubarb red but you can improve its color by the addition of a very little spinach extract a few strips of lemon peel can be stewed with old rhubarb but should never be added to young red rhubarb gooseberries stewed young green gooseberries stewed strange to say require less sugar than ripe gooseberries it is best to stew the fruit first and add the sugar afterwards the amount of sugar varies very much with the quality of the gooseberries prunes stewed the prunes should be washed before they are stewed they will not take more than half an hour to stew and a strip of lemon peel should be placed in the juice stewed prunes are much improved by the addition of a little port wine plums stewed stewed plums such as black ordinary or green gauges or indeed any kind of stone fruit can be stewed in syrup and have this advantage plums can be used this way which could not be eaten at all if they were raw these fruits are much nicer cold than hot in many cases in stewing stone fruit and this applies particularly to peaches apricots and nectarines the stone should be removed and cracked and the kernels added to the fruit cherries stewed large white heart cherries form a very delicate dish when stewed very little water should be added and the syrup should be kept as white as possible and if necessary strained stew the cherries till they are tender but do not let them break color the syrup with a few drops of cochineal and add a glass of maraschino ices ices are too often regarded as expensive luxuries and show how completely custom rules the majority of our housekeepers there are many houses where the dinner may consist daily of soup fish entrees joint game and wine and yet were we to suggest a course of ices the worthy housekeeper would hesitate on the ground of extravagance it is difficult to argue with persons whose definition of economy is what they have always been accustomed to since they were children and whose definition of extravagance is anything new the fact remains however that there is many a worthy seigneur who sells ices in the streets at a penny each and manages to make a living out of the profit not only for himself but for his signora as well under these circumstances the manufacture of these extravagances is worthy of inquiry ices can be made at home very cheaply with an ice machine which can now be obtained at a comparatively speaking small cost with the machine there is absolutely no trouble and directions will be given with each machine so that any details here which vary with the machine will be useless ices can be made at home without a machine with a little trouble and to explain how to do this it is necessary to explain the theory of ice making which is exceedingly simple we will not allude to machines dependent on freezing powders 
but to those which rely for their cold simply on ice and salt mixed we will suppose we want a lemon ice for example we have made some very strong and sweet lemonade and we want to freeze it it is well known that water will freeze at a certain temperature called freezing point by mixing chopped ice and salt and a very little water together a far greater degree of cold can be immediately produced viz a thermometer would stand at thirty two degrees below freezing point were it to be plunged into this mixture an ice machine is a metal pail placed in another pail much larger than itself the sweet lemonade is placed in the middle pail and chopped ice and salt placed outside it the proportion of ice to salt should be double the weight of the former to the latter it is now obvious that if we have filled two pails the one with the sweet lemonade and the other with the ice and salt very soon our lemonade will be a solid block of ice to prevent this it must be constantly stirred and as the lemonade would of course freeze first against the sides of the pail these sides must be constantly scraped inside the inner pail consequently there is a stirrer which by means of a handle continually scrapes the side of the pail it is obvious that if the stirrer is fixed and the pail itself made to revolve that is the same as if the pail were fixed and the stirrer made to revolve to make lemon water ice therefore place the lemonade in the inner pail surrounded with chopped ice and salt two parts of the former to one of the latter turn the handle and in a few minutes the ice is made now suppose you have not got a machine proceed as follows take an empty clean round coffee tin the larger the better we mention coffee tin as the most probable one to be in the house but any round tin will do get a clean piece of wood the same width as the inside diameter of the tin only it must be a great deal longer we will suppose the tin rather more than a foot deep and five inches in diameter our piece of wood which should be clean and smooth must be nearly five inches wide say a quarter of an inch thick and about two feet long next get a small tub say nine inches deep place the round tin in the middle with the sweet lemonade inside next place the piece of wood upright in the tin so that the wood touches the bottom next surround the tin with chopped ice and salt up to the edge of the tub fill it as high as you can and then cover it round with a blanket i e cover the ice and salt now get someone to hold the wooden board steady take the tin in your two hands and turn it round and round first one way and then another in a very short time you will find the tin to contain lemon water ice the following hints rather than recipes for making ice i e for making the liquid which must be frozen as directed above are given not because they are the best recipes but because cream which is the basis of all first-class ices is often too expensive to be used constantly of course real cream is far superior to any substitute ice cream cheap make a custard see custard with half a pint of milk the yolks of two eggs and a tablespoonful of swiss milk and some sugar as soon as it gets a little thick stir it till it is nearly cold then add some essence of vanilla or almonds or a wine glass full of noyau or any flavoring wished and freeze ices from fresh fruits take half a pound of fresh strawberries or raspberries add half that weight of sugar pound thoroughly rub through a sieve and mix with this thick juice rub through half a pint of the mixture for ice cream see ice cream cheap only of course without any flavoring such as vanilla etc mix thoroughly and freeze n b a few red currants should be mixed with the raspberries should the color be poor brighten it up before freezing with a little cochineal ices from jam mix a quarter of a pound of any jam with half a pint of the mixture made for ice cream see ice cream cheap without any flavoring such as vanilla rub all through a fine sieve and freeze cochineal will give additional color to red jams spinach extract to green jams and a very little turmeric or yellow vegetable coloring to yellow jams a small pinch of turmeric can be boiled in the milk ice lemon water rub six lumps of sugar on the rind of six lemons add this and the juice of six lemons to a pint of fairly sweet syrup 
the amount of sugar is a matter of taste strain and freeze some persons add a few drops of dilute sulfuric acid ice orange water act exactly as in lemon water using oranges instead of lemons and syrup containing less sugar ice water fruit all sorts of water fruit ices can be made by mixing half a pint of juice such as currant juice with twice that quantity of syrup and freezing grated ripe pineapple pounded and bruised ripe cherries and green gages strawberry juice raspberry juice can be mixed with syrup and frozen sometimes a little lemon juice can be added with advantage and in the case of cherry ice and green gauge ice a little noyau added is an improvement end of section twenty four section twenty five of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter thirteen cakes and bread in vegetarian cookery there is no difference as far as cake making is concerned between it and ordinary cookery in making cakes we will confine our attention chiefly to general principles which if once known render cake making of every description comparatively easy work those who wish for detailed recipes for making almost every kind of cake known will find all that they require on a large scale in cassell's dictionary of cookery and also everything necessary on a smaller scale in cassell's shilling cookery which has already reached its hundred thousandth edition cakes may be divided into two classes those that contain fruit and those that do not plum cakes can be made very rich indeed like a wedding cake or so plain that it can scarcely be distinguished from a loaf of bread with a few currants in it again cakes that contain no fruit can at the same time be made exceedingly rich the richness chiefly depending upon the amount of butter and eggs that are used we will first give a few directions with regard to making what may be termed plain cakes for instance cakes that contain no fruit at all perhaps the best model we can give to illustrate the general principles will be that of a pound cake the recipe is a very easy one to recollect as a pound cake means one that is made from a pound of butter a pound of sugar a pound of eggs and a pound of flour there is one addition however which the good plain cook will probably not be up to and which so far as flavor is concerned makes all the difference between francatelli and jemima ann we must rub some of the lumps of sugar on the outsides of either two oranges or two lemons it is also a great improvement to add a small glass of brandy and in every kind of cake we must add a pinch of salt in making cakes it is always necessary to be careful about the butter it is best to put the butter in cold water before it is used and if salt butter it should be washed in several waters to extract the salt the next thing necessary is to beat the butter to a cream to do this it must be worked about in a basin with a wooden spoon the basin should be a strong one and a wooden spoon is far preferable to a metal one you simply beat the butter and spread it against the sides of the basin and knock it about till it loses its consistency you cannot beat the butter to the consistency of ordinary cream but to a state more resembling devonshire clotted cream of course when it is like this it is much more easily mixed with the other ingredients in making a pound cake we should first of all beat the butter to a cream and then add flour sugar and eggs gradually when the whole is thoroughly well mixed together we must bake it in a tin or mold or hoop we need say nothing about tins or molds but will confine ourselves to giving directions how to bake a cake in a hoop for as a rule ordinary english cooks do not understand how to use them one great advantage of using a hoop is that when the cake is baked there is no fear of breaking it in turning it out a very simple hoop can be made with an ordinary slip of tin say six inches wide as the tin will lap over the cake can be made any size round you wish 
it is a good plan to fasten a piece of copper wire round the outside of the tin this can be twisted and when the cake is baked and has got coal can be untwisted and the tin will then open of its own accord the tin must be lined with buttered paper and buttered paper must be placed on a flat piece of tin at the bottom when an amateur hoop is used like we have described care must be taken that the cake does not come out at the bottom the cake especially when it is made with beaten up eggs like sponge cake will rise and unless precautions are taken the tin will rise with it and the unset portion of the cake break loose round the edge at the bottom to prevent this the tin must be kept down with a weight at the top in a proper hoop made for the purpose there are appliances for fastening the hoop together itself and also for keeping it in its place but if we use a strip of tin we must place something across the tin on the top and then put on a heavy weight when this is done you must remember to allow room for the cake to rise a pound cake such as we have described can be made into a rich fruit cake by adding stoned raisins currants chopped candied peel sultana raisins or better still dried cherries in making ordinary cakes when currants are used they should be first washed and then dried if you use damp currants the cake will probably be heavy with regard to the flour it is cheapest in the end to use the best quality and the flour should be dried and sifted if you weigh the flour remember to dry and sift it before you weigh it and not after in using sugar get the best loaf this should also be pounded and sifted in using eggs of course each egg should be broken separately very often it is necessary to separate the yolks from the whites this requires some little skill you are less likely to break the yolk when you crack the egg boldly put the yolk from one half egg shell into the other half spilling as much of the white as you can you will soon get the yolk separate next remember before mixing the eggs to remove the thread or string from them when the whites are beaten separately you must whisk them till they become a solid froth no liquid should remain at the bottom of the basin the yolk should not be broken till they are wanted lemon peel is often used in making cakes and in chopping it a little powdered sugar is a great assistance in preventing the peel sticking together remember only to use the yellow part not the white the white part gives the cake a bitter flavor sometimes milk or cream is used in cake making if swiss milk is used as a substitute remember that less sugar will be required when pounded almonds are used for cakes the almonds must be blanched by being thrown first into boiling water and then into cold water in pounding them add a little rose water or orange flower water or the white of an egg to prevent the almonds getting oily nearly all plain cakes where only a few eggs are used will be made lighter by the addition of a little baking powder a very good baking powder is made by mixing an ounce of tartaric acid with an ounce and a half of bicarbonate of soda and an ounce and a half of arrowroot the baking powder should be kept very dry a very nice way of making homemade cakes is to use some dough which can be procured from the bakers suppose you have a quartern of dough put it in a basin cover it over with a cloth and put it in front of the fire to rise then spread it on a floured pastry board slice it up and work in half a pound of fresh butter half a pound of moist sugar six eggs a teaspoonful of salt and half an ounce of caraway seeds when all the ingredients are thoroughly mixed place them in two or more well buttered tins or hoops and let them stand in front of the fire a little while before they are placed in the oven cakes can be flavored with a variety of spices such as cinnamon mace nutmeg or powdered coriander seeds these last are always used to give a special flavor to hot cross buns bread homemade bread is not so much used now as it was years back most housekeepers have found by experience that it is a waste both of time and money there are very few houses among the middle classes which possess an oven capable of competing with any chance of success with a baker's oven there are however many vegetarians who believe in what is called wholemeal bread a good deal of the wholemeal bread sold 
as such has been found to be adulterated with substances very unwholesome to ordinary stomachs we may mention sawdust as one of the ingredients used for the purpose again if you attempt to make wholemeal bread into loaves you will find great difficulty in baking the loaves this whole meal is a very slow conductor of heat and the result will probably be that the outside of the loaf will be very hard while the inside will be too underdone to be eaten consequently should you wish to have homemade wholemeal bread it is far best to bake it in the form of a tea cake or flat cake we cannot do better in conclusion than quote what sir henry thompson says on this subject the following recipe he says will be found successful probably after a trial or two in producing excellent light friable and most palatable bread to two pounds of coarsely ground or crushed whole meal add half a pound of fine flour and a sufficient quantity of baking powder and salt when these are well mixed rub in two ounces of butter and make into dough with half milk and water or with all milk if preferred make rapidly into flat cakes like tea cakes and bake without delay in a quick oven leaving them afterwards to finish thoroughly at a lower temperature the butter and milk supply fatty matters in which the wheat is somewhat deficient all the saline and mineral matters of the husk are retained and thus a more nutritive form of bread cannot be made moreover it retains the natural flavor of the wheat in place of the insipidity which is characteristic of fine flour although it is indisputable that bread produced from the latter especially in paris and vienna is unrivaled for delicacy texture and color wholemeal may be bought but mills are now cheaply made for home use and wheat may be ground to any degree of coarseness desired end of section twenty five